What's up guys? It's yo boy Omnisensei. Welcome to Star Wars. Reborn as Anakin Skywalker. Part 8. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Remember to check out the original story. Link in the description. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. Report to all battle stations. A flurry of movement was happening as the people on board the battleship along with other battleships within a formation that allowed for a stable and defensive position. Report to all battle stations. Prepare for combat. Negotiations have failed. Aggressive negotiations will commence once the huts are captured. A voice called over the intercom allowing for everyone to know of exactly what was happening. Everyone was being prepared. All were getting prepared as they were now alerted to the breakdown of communication between their emperor and the hut cartel's leadership. A massive battle was about to begin, and the conflict that would start and end would be something everyone within the galaxy would take note of. So, you are telling us that you have started a war we rejoin Anakin along with his loved ones, families and friends within his throne room. The current asker of this question was Isla, who seemed to be both happy and now at Anakin, having told them of what was happening, frustrated at the same time. Well, if you put it that way, then I guess Anakin said as he was to face the gauntlet that was a bunch of peace-loving girls. That held peace-loving ideals. You guess. Padme asked as she was probably the one with the fiercest of positions when it came to maintaining peace and all of that. Well, I have done it for a good reason, right? Anakin didn't make any excuses for himself, but did want to point out to them that it was for a good cause. I agree with Arnie. Unsurprisingly it was Ahsoka, the least brainwashed by the Jedi, and with more aggressive ideals, compared to the rest of the girls. Of course you agree with him. Barris rolled her eyes at Ahsoka's declaration while the rest were all seated discussing what was happening. Anakin himself wanted to go and join the synths on the battlefield even when he was not needed. He liked the idea of leading his troops. Anakin, you can't seriously believe that this is the right choice. You have just created chaos by doing this within the galaxy at large that is. We all already know about how the people of the Emperor would react. Padme said, they would be all for it. Isla finished for Padme. Then there is the fact that because they are all for it, they wouldn't see the downsides of such a decision. It is already bad enough that I agreed to supporting you in giving the Galactic Republic some aid through droids but this. Padme seemed conflicted as while she was peace-loving, and it was ingrained into her through her culture and religion from Naboo, she had spent enough time as a leader and senator to know that sometimes aggressive negotiations were the only option sometimes. When people say that violence isn't the answer, sometimes you may not use enough violence. Or this was at least the way she had heard of this joke from Anakin, as he wasn't really serious at the time. I think that this is a good decision. Surprisingly it was Shark that would also come up to support Anakin's declaration. What do you mean by that? Isla asked. Did you not hear of Arnie's reasoning? Freedom and liberty to those who are under the control of the huts or anyone else that may seek harbor within the hut cartel space. Isn't that a good thing? Shark didn't see too many problems other than the potential death of people. But she wasn't exactly an untainted by blood person. Neither was the others within this room other than Ahsoka. She was probably the only one within here that hasn't had any blood spilled on her hands before. That may be a good reason, but to do so now. At a time that the galaxy is already in great turmoil. This could upset things especially with how the civil war going on between the Separatists and the Republic. Padme had already seen the long-term effects and problems of the now New Hut Emperor War. While the galaxy was in turmoil because of the civil war between the Separatists and Republic, the people, in the thousands, millions and billions, were seeking refuge with a place that was under harmony and peace. That place being the Emperor. And no doubt the people would support Anakin. But the cost to that is a reduced amount of growth when it comes to population. It was dangerous if their numbers stopped growing at the exponential rate that they were, given that they were trying to build up and keep up with the growth through building new homes, and opening up more places for businesses to be created. The numbers would drop if the Emperor goes to war, which would mean that all of that money spent would be wasted. Padme was defiantly a smart woman, but her intelligence had been increased by the Super Serum. This allowed her an even greater range and perspective to see the world through new eyes. Eyes that were capable of seeing things in a new light, simply because her mind was better, faster and stronger than before. Even with this change however, her ideals, the core of her being wouldn't change because of that. I think I think that Anakin is right here. Barris said, give that she was the second most quiet because Shmai was also in the room as well. There would be others, like officials and all of that, but Anakin had decided to separate the two. While having a politically involved family was something that is inevitable, Anakin would rather separate work and play. Simply because emotions could get in the way of making proper decisions, just as it was now for Padme. So we have three against and two for. Isla looked at Barris, Ahsoka and Shark, while the only person now left out was Shmai. She hadn't said anything, 
but had instead allowed Anakin and his lovers, excluding Ahsoka, to talk it out. Well, there was also one other person that wasn't present, because she couldn't care less whether or not Anakin declared war on someone or not, and this person was Xana. She could have at least come and displayed some support, Anakin thought to himself. The girls and Xana had all been properly introduced, but there seemed to be some level of conflict between Xana and the rest of the girls. Anakin put this down to the girls still being attached to the Jedi ideals, even when they didn't follow them. They were probably still uncomfortable being around someone like Xana. She radiated dark side energy. It would seem that you are the last mother, Anakin said as Shmai was just sitting there with a smile on her face. She wasn't the tiebreaker in the vote, but she definitely still had value in the discussion. Arnie has done it before. Gone to war that is, Shmai said, and everyone here were both surprised and trying to remember just when Anakin had gone to war. He did so with his people, the people of Tatooine just after he had become a Jedi. Does no one remember that? This definitely got them thinking, as from what they remembered, it wasn't Anakin that went to war, but instead it was the infamous and now vanished Vader. Did he really? I had thought that he had only taken you off of Tatrine when that had happened. Barris asked as she was wondering just where this idea had come from. Everyone knows, or at least they believed that Anakin was not on Tatrine, and instead had only peacefully taken Shmai off planet. Anakin knew what Shmai was about to say and he thought it was about time that they found out about his now-dead persona. Arnie is Vader. Or at least he was Vader. That was until he had officially been recognized as the Emperor. This was quite the shocking news as everyone was surprised, but the person that had the biggest reaction was Ahsoka. No one else may know it, but she knew of the possible dark and many terribly great things he could accomplish. She had seen it happen, and it pulled at her heartstrings every time she remembered Anakin like that. Broken mask, glowing, glaring, hatred-filled yellow eyes. No why, while the other half of his face was obscured, that didn't matter. She knew that, that was Anakin through and through. Her other, older, alternate self didn't want to believe so, and was also heartbroken at such a sight. Is this true, Arnie? Ilo asked Anakin as he sat there, awaiting their gazes to fall upon him. It is. Anakin confirmed, and they didn't know how to react given that Vader was said to be a monster. Or within the scriptures passed on from the Emperor, Vader was meant to be some other version of Anakin that focused on judgment. It would seem that the living droids, that were now sent along with the rest of the Emperor's people, were actually in on the idea as well. They may not know explicitly that Anakin was Vader, but subconsciously they believe this fact to be true. Now before any of you ask any more questions, I just want to make it clear that this was no vote, and it was most certainly only meant to inform all of you of my decision. It has already begun, and I hope that you all are not upset at my decision. Anakin said, everyone was okay with it other than Padme and Isla. Whatever you say Sky Guy, but I think we need to talk some more later about you being Vader. Ahsoka gave him a look that would leave no room for argument and he knew that she knew about that other him. So it would be best to address this problem with her, and alone at that. Ahsoka walked off, going somewhere else, while dragging the dumbfounded Barris along, and Shike just decided that she would go with Shmai, her now mother-in-law, and get to know her a bit better. She had not had enough time to acquaint herself with Shmai, because she was busy doing other things. Specifically adult things with Anakin to concern herself with being social. But she knew that sooner or later she would have to interact with her. I guess that just leaves the three of us. Anakin stood up as he went over to both Isla and Padme. You two aren't mad now, are you? I don't know. What can you sense through the diet? Padme asked, having gotten more and more used to applying and using the diet to communicate with Anakin, and using it to increase her power even more so than she had before. I am glad then. What Anakin sensed from Padme wasn't anger, but instead some frustration, because she wanted to know more about him instead of anger at the situation. She was actually a lot more forgiving to Anakin even when she was outright saying that she was against his choice. Since you know now, I would appreciate it if you would talk with all of us before you decide to do something like this. Padme said as she went up to Anakin, hugged him and then proceeded to kiss him on the check, and then onto his lips full of passion. She wouldn't stop loving him just because of this, and she doubted she would ever stop loving him like this. It may seem strange, but she was totally willing to give her life for his. It would seem, however, that you have to deal with your soon-to-be babies. Mother Padme winked away, giving him a display that he appreciated trying to seduce him, but he needed to pay attention to Isla now. It was her that was the most upset with how things were going, so Dash Anakin said only to be interrupted by Isla, whom was glaring a bit at him. There was a mixture of emotions he felt from her, and he could attribute a few to her wild hormones due to pregnancy. So, Isla said as she walked up to him, not afraid of her small swollen belly being knocked up against him, she embraced him and gave him a kiss on the lips as well. It was filled with just as much passion as Padme's was and then some. Really, she had gotten hornier due to the pregnancy, and it seemed to be something Anakin both appreciated and didn't. He was able to have a lot of fun times, even more frequent because of Isla's increased sexual sensitivity, and because of this, he was able to feel good as well. The diet is all about both ways, not one. After her passionate embrace, Isla let him go and started to speak again. You know, I didn't at first worry about how having a child may could affect things, because the war between the Republic and the Separatists had nothing to do with us. But, it would seem that it doesn't matter anyway. I wanted to start a family during peace, 
where we wouldn't have to worry about this or that, and now that you have started this war, I fear for the worse. Isla looked into his eyes and he gazed into hers, sensing her mixed emotions yet again. You know I want the best for us. You fall for myself for the rest of the girls. And what is probably most important, is that I want the best for our children as well. Anakin scooped her up in his arms. You don't have to worry, everything will be fine. You say that now, but you do have a bad history when it comes to things turning out just fine. Isla was referring to most of what he did, as they usually didn't have small explosions. But instead things finish with some extra flair that was extra dangerous as well. When have I ever been wrong? Like literally, when has Anakin been wrong in his decision making process? While it may seem like a bad move, Anakin believes that by taking care of the Hut Cartel now, while the child can still be protected, then it would be best if they are taken care of. While he may worry about Palpatine, or Dooku, or even the future threats, what matters the most now is that his soon to be first child is safe from the revenge of the Huts. Taking them down a notch would at least ensure they wouldn't try anything funny as some sort of revenge. You know I love you, right? Isla said with a trembling voice because she was scared. Scared for her future, the future of Anakin and their child. Also the rest of their family, Ahsoka, Barris, Shark, Padme, all of them and more. I love you. Anakin replied as he gently gave her a kiss. A kiss that didn't speak of passion, but of a type of feeling that would imply love. Pure romantic type. Forgive Anakin for doing this but sometimes you have to be cheesy when it comes to things like this. There really is no other way around it. Space. The great expanse of nothingness. We are not talking about space where it is the boundless three-dimensional extent in which objects and events have relative position and direction. Instead, we are talking about space, an almost perfect vacuum, nearly void of matter, and with extremely low pressure. In space, sound doesn't carry because there aren't molecules close enough together to transmit sound between them. Not quite empty, bits of gas, dust and other matter floats around emptier areas of the universe, while more crowded regions can host planets, stars and galaxies. Right. Let the war begin then. Grievous said as he started to direct everyone within the starship he was within. The Hut's blockade was also fully in action, and both sides started to fire at each other trying to destroy and or harm the other side in an attempt to get one or the other to retreat. If one was able to hear anything within space, they would most likely hear sounds that were synthesized because of the shots fired. Laser-like sounds and electrical-based sounds, everything would sound strangely futuristic, while at the same time epic. From the Emperor and Control ship, the pilot droids within their smaller vessels were deployed, heading towards to engage in combat with the Hut's pilot fighters. The the Emperor and Control ship was slowly making its way forward, while multiple other ships that weren't as small as the pilot droid ships, but instead large enough to hold a few of the synths were also deployed. Their mission was to go in deep and get the Hut Cartel's leading families under their control. Flashing lights, large structures of metal floating out in the vast nothingness. A war had begun and there would most certainly be some casualties, but for what side? It would most definitely be the Huts, whom don't have access to the advanced droids of the Emperor. Their pilots were real people, real living intelligent beings. While they also had access to some ships of their own, that would enable them to continue their blockade. Unfortunately for the Huts, they had decided to stay within their prime world, Now Hutter, and as a result, they would probably be captured. Their families and children taken in by the Emperor and since, Starfighters and various other starships went to battle, as they were putting their lives on the line for the ideals of either side. Well, the Huts armies were putting their lives on the line, but of course they had some droid starfighters of their own as well. They may not be as advanced like those from the Emperor, but they would do to act as cannon fodder, just like the Emperor was using their droid starfighters to act as cannon fodder as well. The difference being that the Emperor was winning out on the front line easily. They were winning so easily that the other ships containing the synths were already making their way past the blockade point, meaning that they were well on their way to capturing the hut leaders, potentially even their family, maybe even their extended families as well. Report. Grievous said as a command, waiting for the people carrying out the logistics of the situation to give him the information he wanted. General, the droid starfighters have reached behind enemy lines and have started to attack their main control ships. One of the logistics people said, Good. This is good. Grievous nodded his head as this was too easy, something that would usually not sit right with him or anyone else. But Anakin had done so much to improve the Emperor. There was no way that they would be losing an equal fight. General, I think that our men are fast approaching their home grounds but we need to speed up our approach and get around the blockade to provide them with ample backup. Then what are you waiting for? Let's destroy their fleet already and get to capturing those heathens. Grievous exclaimed as he gestured to everyone within the room to get back to work, and to do so hard. Back within space the hut fleet was losing control over their space, and because of the Emperor and Droid Starfighter being able to push them back, there would be many problems in trying to escape. They were panicking and because of their rather small size, due to splitting off their fleets at different points throughout the hut cartel space, they were limited here. The huts believed that they would be able to stop an attack, but they were wrong to underestimate the Emperor and their power. They should have figured out by now that the Emperor was something greater than they could handle, what with their current decadence getting to their heads. Their arrogance and decadence would be their fall, just as Anakin had planned. He wouldn't be letting them off easy, and while he may not actually murder their families or children, because there is no telling if they could be redeemed until they are, Anakin would be making use of them to further his own cause. The freedom and liberty of the slaves and better quality of life for those within the Hut Cartel space. Moving ever closer and closer while the battle was still continuing, 
The Emperor and Control ship had finally gotten close enough to the Hut Control ship, as their offensive and defensive capabilities had been taken down. The Emperor and Droid Starfighter had infiltrated and the battle droid carrier ships were being deployed to start the takeover of the Hut Control ship. Now this point of contention is under the control of the Emperor. And under the control of Anakin. General, we have finally taken control of the Heathen's control ship. Everyone within have come under our control and have been captured, and so has the control come under our control. A soldier reported to Grievous. And their droids. Grievous asked as he wanted to slowly build their armada dependent on their enemy's resources. Anakin had done so before by taking the resources of the Long Done for Trade Federation, their droids, ships and now even more so their resources as they were dissolved and assimilated into the Emperor's control. Grievous was looking to do the same here, but instead of just taking their stuff and then leaving, he wanted to turn the enemy's forces against them. It was ingenious, but it wasn't exactly something that he had come up with himself. It was Anakin that had suggested that he do something like this instead of spending and using many resources for the war. By taking over the Hut Cartel's armies, whether they be the ships or droids, they wouldn't have to waste their own resources in going after the Huts. Having taken over this choke point, what the Emperor would be doing is using the Hut's control ship as a front, faking that they had somehow overtaken and beaten the Emperor, which would give them an in with the Hut's intelligence. In doing so they would be able to go into hut space and possibly have them surrounded before they even knew. Most of the stuff happening could be considered the boring part as both sides sent their disposable units instead of trying their hardest. This would also be a mistake for the huts in combination with their splitting of their armies to the various choke points of their space. They simply didn't have the same sustainability as the Emperor and even with their semi-developed economy. This is what happens when someone tries to create something that was doomed to fail from the start. Now that the Emperor was heading in deeper, the huts were none the better in knowing. There was some reports from of their choke points, but that was until their reports had stip coming in about the situation at hand, and they were worried for a bit. Thankfully it was only a few hours later did a message be sent in again after their insistence and impatience of waiting. Someone would have to answer to them once this war was over. What they were receiving however was that there was absolutely no other presence from within or outside of their spatial borders of the Emperor. And this was both worrying and a bit scary, because the Emperor wouldn't just give up, not after what their Emperor had done and shown them. It was simply inconceivable, and they were dumb to think that the Emperor just retreat after losing a small exchange. But they had sent messages to that choke point in particular, and tell them to be prepared for any more intrusion. Of course they replied that because the battle was over, they were heading back in direct contrast to their orders, which was something unprecedented. No one had ever dared to be defiant against their masters, their lords the Hut Cartel, and the several clans within before. It was ridiculous and also at the same time incredibly suspicious but they would be allowed passage into the Hut's homeworld and capital. This meant two things. It was either that the Emperor and Grievous would be able to get an unharmed and no problems, or it would mean that the Hut had somehow found out about what they were doing. They didn't, but it was something to be cautious about all the way there as Grievous directed the armies towards Nalhutta. Anakin was receiving reports on the situation as well, and was attacking Commander from the rear. He wasn't on the front lines. But that was no reason for him to not be involved, especially when his information or wisdom could provide them, the army with the winning path. It also helped that the army was able to feel safe in knowing that their leader, the God Emperor was on board with them in spirit, helping them from behind. It may not be what they wanted where he joined in at the front, but that was normal give that Anakin was kind of forced to stay behind. He needed to compromise somewhere with the girls, and that compromise was Anakin not actually participating in the war himself. They would not allow him to leave and join in, so he would take the compromise of them not complaining about him taking massive actions behind their back without their knowledge and stay behind. Especially for Isla who was immensely insecure about the future due to being pregnant right now, as it was messing with her hormones making her emotional. Now that Anakin could at least have some control and direction with what was happening, he knew that using Shatterpoint could be the reason for life or death. Choosing wrongly could result in this plan going wrong, as Anakin had decided to only send minimal forces. This was so that if by chance someone or something tried to take advantage of the Emperor's current state, they would be stopped by the standing armies within the Emperor's borders. Whether this be within the Arcanist sector itself or otherwise be within other areas the Emperor was expanding within. Be that from Dathomir to Naboo and their sectors, Anakin wanted to make sure Dot they were secured. Anakin took it from the standpoint that having a strong defense was the best defense. But of course, he would also put on display his best defense being the best defense as well. It only made sense that he would try to make sure that it was as balanced as possible. So people would be unable to exploit the Emperor's weaknesses, whatever they may be. The Huts now were moving slowly and slowly, getting reports constantly at the same time to constantly both reassure and worry themselves. They didn't have the best military, especially when it came to their commanders or general people that hadn't really been in a war of this scale before. So no one knew what to expect. Well the Huts and their commanders believed that everything would play out similarly to what had happened to the Trade Federation. But instead of being the Federation, they believed themselves to be on the winning side. How wrong they were. We are approaching them now sir. A Solida supplied as he told Grievous as he overlooked the windows allowing everyone from within to see the capital of the Hut Cartel. Now Hutter, a hot swampy planet located on the outer rims and was the homeworld of the Hut species, now turned into the capital of a sprawling criminal empire. That wasn't an empire anymore. 
but simply a republic that wasn't really a republic. It was a cesspool of corruption, maybe even more so than the actual Galactic Republic, that was now under the control of Darth Sidious, otherwise known as Sheev Palpatine. This planet was a home for criminal activities and elements within the galaxy, given that it is located far from galactic authorities. Now that the Emperor had been formed however, they have been on the very precise of change for a few years now, and as the Emperor grew the Hut's trade weakened as well on Malhutta, due to a crisis known as the Drenger Crisis. The planet had been befallen by numerous bogs and greasy rain. It certainly wasn't a place that Grievous would like to stay, but it was the perfect climate for the species known as the Hearts. Despite it being the capital however, most of everything happened on the moon of Nar Shadda, and because of this, Grievous and their borrowed forces would focus on locking that first and now Hutter second. Simply because the leaders came first, their families, the entirety of them came second to the leaders, as Anakin could make due with just the Hutt Kajidics move, move, move. A voice commanded across the absolute chaos that was taking place on the world of Nal Hutter. The world was under siege, or at least it was supposedly under siege, as the Huts didn't really operate here, but instead operated mainly on the moon of Nar Shadda. Wailing and cries were off in the distance as people were starting to raid the various spaceports of the planet. The Emperor was trying to take full advantage of their surprise attack, which would net them the ability to keep people from escaping, or more specifically to keep the Huts from escaping their clutches, their families, and whoever else they find down here. Knowing that those raised within Kajidic families are prone to becoming cruel, sadistic and torturous beings, Anakin wouldn't put it past them in having structures built in the swampy planet of Nal Hutter. Who knows what just was going on down here, along with the rest of those left below, and those that they may have disposed of. An example of their potential was Jab someone that had long ago been taken care of. But there were still some people that was dealing with the after effects of Jabba's rule. Maybe they are not suffering anymore when it comes to their physical well-being, but they were still suffering when it came to their mean well-being. Mental health is just as important to Anakin, just as physical health was. What is the point of creating something that would enable his people to not be affected by disease, when they would still suffer with their minds? So obviously within the Emperor, there were jobs that were for many various positions, whether that be a normal doctor with various specializations or otherwise becoming something else. There were all kinds of things to deal with stuff like that, and Anakin promoted this concept. Get going. Blood must be spilled for the god emperor to feel satiated. A large man that looked to be around 2.5 meters tall, called out to the others, as they were going around collecting anything of value, along with seeking out and freeing enslaved peoples. They had access to Mekaderu, so obviously they were able to take care of this problem. Other large men, just like the one that had called out responded, for the god emperor, for the god emperor. It was truly a terrifying takeover, and the inhabitants of Nal Hutter would only cower in fear at the fearsome sight. The scents were designed off of what Anakin was going to be at some point, and while Anakin thought the height was fine for him, it would seem once he completed himself fully, he would take on his true form, a might height of 1.9 meters. Okay, maybe it wasn't as imposing as what his synth marines were, but it was more than enough as it would seem that something didn't want him to be all that tall. It was probably the work of the Force, it was because of some other reason whatever it is, Anakin would be coming to love his new height even when in comparison to his synths as they were meant for combat. He was as well, but his form was both limited and unlimited, as while it didn't look like he had as much power within him compared to his synth marines, he had in fact a lot more. Multiple Nal Hutter spaceports were being ravaged as the synth marines, and battle droids of both the Emperor and the ones taken over by them from the huts were deployed on the planet. People were being rescued everywhere, whether they be humanoid species or otherwise other creatures that were brought here to suffer along with the rest of them. Soon enough, Nal Hutter would be liberated of all slaves, but there was a slight problem. That problem being that any family members of the leaders found were not close relatives, but only distantly related. But this was still something good either way. Damn. These heathens dare hide from us. The same 2.5 meter tall man said as he was easily able to bend some metal bars blocking his way. His armor reflecting the enemy droids blaster shots. While his men fan out and continue to search deep within the swamps of Nal Hutter. It was very likely that they were trying to hide in the terrain. Somewhere that they would obviously not have any information about. It wasn't exactly a place that the huts like to share their secrets about even when they have their pride. Does anyone see anything? He called out as they were trudging through the thick bog. That was both obscuring their perception and hindering their movement. Well he called out again as there was no answer but he was soon enough answered by a few shout and grunts of both pain and surprise. Not panic as they were trained for situations like this, but they were able to still feel fear. Anakin wouldn't get rid of their emotions, especially since it was their emotions that would allow them to use the Force the same way he does. To its fullest capabilities because the dark side is one half and heavily relies on one's emotions, while the light side needs them to have some temperance so that they could channel those emotions in a positive way. The better and stronger they were, the stronger Anakin would look and be within the galaxy. Running over, the large man is surprised at the sight before him, and so is the rest of his men. It was a gigantic beast that had been released by the huts as some form of last-ditch effort to get rid of them. It's a dragon snake. Men, get into positions. Of course this person was a leader, so he readily got his soldiers in position as they started to face off against this beast. In fact, there was something strange about this dragon snake in particular, because it was much larger than the average range it was supposed to be. At most, the dragon snake would only be around 2.5 to 3 times the size of the synth marines. It was in fact twice that size at a whopping 12 meters. Something that was extremely abnormal, and it had strange coloring as well. 
White scales and red eyes, meaning that it had probably been bred as a pet of some kind. The huts did seem to love their pets. Sir, there are more of them. A soldier pointed out as there was in fact an entire family of some kind, and they all looked starved, just ready to swallow them all up and digest them slowly and painfully. Damn it. All right, get into Delta formations and prepare to hold off the beasts through the use of the force. The captain called out, and they all complied, while the captain held the largest of the dragon snakes back, as it was also the closest to getting to the soldiers. The swampy bog didn't help matters. But they were all able to easily get into their positions, and they all started to use the force to create a force field around themselves, while at the same time helping their captain out by using telekinesis to buy him enough time to get into this force field. Good job, now to deal with these beasts. I have a very good feeling that we have been going in the correct direction. The captain was correct in assuming so because these creatures were only to be released on the conditions those that release had set up. They were nearing one of the many hideouts that was designed to keep the Hut family safe from Han, in the off chance that they were to be invaded. They could have always come to join in on the fight themselves, and that would have certainly made it harder for the synths to continue. But that would put them at the mercy of the Emperor, something that was extremely hard for them to do considering everyone at this point within the Hut Cartel knew of what Anakin was capable of doing. And if their Emperor was able to kill one of their own from so far away, then that only meant his people may have similar capabilities. It was definitely a good scare tactic used by Anakin. Ugh, this wasn't a cry of pain, but of resolve and pure anger being pumped into the captain's veins as he was starting to go berserk and decided to pull out his own specialized melee weapon. I will kill you beasts. In the name of the God Emperor, he charged out now full of energy, both through his plants and through the force, he was empowered. Strong enough to pull off maneuvers that would be considered impossible to the common folk. But here a sound was heard, and the dropping of a massive dragon snake's head landed on the ground. The other soldiers were doing their own jobs as well, as they all started to generate a bunded field that kept the other beasts out. However, things were starting to heat up as they were also starting to generate a large amount of electricity or lightning, and it absolutely encompassed the area, going after any and all foes within the area, while going around their captain outside of the field. They had good enough control to pull something like this up, and their coordination was perfect because they had trained together. Not only that, but they were all kind of connected to each other through sharing the same sky seed that originated from Anakin. Back with Grievous as he had to lead the charge on Nar Shadda, and their plan to go undercover worked out perfectly. Of course their surprise didn't last too long as they had all seemingly already gotten into defensive positions. But this didn't matter for even if they called for backup. There was no way they were going to escape now. They wouldn't have enough time, especially now that they had boarded the moon of Nar Shadda. Nar Shadda was the largest moon of Nal Hutta, more commonly known as the Vertical City, the Smuggler's Moon, Little Coruscant, or derisively as Little Slugland, and in shorthand slang as Nash. Nar Shadda was similar to Coruscant, in that its surface was entirely overgrown with city sprawl for millennia. But unlike Coruscant, which was only relatively run down and dangerous on the lower and under levels of the world city, Nar Shadda was filthy, polluted, and infested with crime everywhere. Nevertheless, Nar Shadda remained the most important financial and trading center of hut space. Nar Shadda was tidally locked to Nal Hutta, which resulted in the fact that only one side of the moon always faced the parent planet while the other side was faced towards the empty space. Ancient refueling spires and loading docks reached out from the native soil, and some built in the upper atmosphere. In between these ports, massive vertical cities grew. The urban areas on Nar Shadda were known as vertical cities, since new layers of housing and entertainment buildings were built on top of older layers, like Coruscant and Taras. While much of Coruscant was filled with gleaming apartments and well-maintained skywalks, the entire moon that was Nar Shadda was dominated by decaying urban landscape and congested polluted cities. The moon was protected by planetary shields. Anything illegal elsewhere could be bought and sold on Nar Shadda, and many young smugglers, pirates and criminals started their careers on the smugglers' moon. Various sections of Nar Shadda were controlled by the Hearts and other criminal organizations. Despite the criminal activities on the smugglers' moon, it was known that many of the galaxy's most advanced technologies were actually developed on Nar Shadda. Corporations that wanted to avoid regulations that prohibited testing often developed such dangerous and even valuable technology within the lower levels of the city of the moon. Get to work. Grievous called out as he landed with some droids and synths coming under his command and control. He didn't want to stay on the control ship for the entirety of the battle, and wanted to start getting to work on working himself out. The few times he had battled against Anakin within the context of a spa was few, but every single time he lost. Given this, he had to prove himself in combat some other way, and the only way he knew how was to get involved and start fighting himself within a setting just like this. Never have I been to a place so alive with the Force, yet so dead to it. The contrast is like a blade. Anakin's voice came from one of the droids that was with Grievous. Can you feel it? Anakin asked Grievous while taking control of a droid. Well, I can feel something. That is for sure. Grievous couldn't really tell what Anakin was talking about. But that didn't mean his counsel wasn't unneeded here. And if he said there was something wrong in the Force when here, then that only meant there was. His title as the Chosen One has got to mean something. Grievous started to give out orders, but could see that it wouldn't really be all that hard to try and differentiate the rich from the poor. In fact, it was totally easy to see where and which direction they should be going in. They didn't have to worry about any of them escaping, and Anakin had confirmed that all of those that he had sensed within the meeting he had were all still on the moon. 
Ah, the beautiful stench and decay of desperate living, Grievous said as he gazed at the people that were desperate enough to stay here and try to make it rich despite the living conditions. Of course not everyone would be here of their own free will, but Grievous and Anakin couldn't save everyone right now. It was better to give them the key, and then leave as it was best to allow someone to free themselves if give the chance. Sometimes, one would need to apply some forceful approaches to some otherwise broken people, as they wouldn't make the decision themselves, and would instead stay. Yes, these people are not what I would call good. Anakin said as he gazed at everyone, and even when he wanted to help, it was probably best to take care of the leaders first. My god emperor in general, is synth marine rolled up to both of them, Anakin and droid form and grievous. I have discovered a massive amount of enslaved peoples in that direction, while the leaders are in lockdown within another building. Good soldier. Go now and rescue those in need. Anakin called out, and his synthesize came out formed the droid towards the synth. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to prove myself. The synth then turned around and left straight away. Anakin expected this to happen, given that he had been well adapted to the way his people viewed him by now. It wasn't worth it anymore to try and change their minds, and instead he would sometimes both play into what they believed him to be, and sometimes act outside of that box. Are we going then? Grievous asked, waiting for Anakin to give the order. Yes. Let's get us some slugs, Anakin stated, and use the force to enhance the droid's body, and go off in the direction the soldier had reported. Hey, wait for me. Grievous was left in the dust, but he would still be able to catch up. The Star Cluster Casino was a dome casino located the Moon Narshada. After the signing of the Treaty of Coruscant, it was the location of a meeting of underworld business beings, who gathered to discuss how the new treaty forced on the Republic by the Sith Empire would affect them and their enterprises. When it was made known that one attendee, Natu, had been sharing information with the Republic, he was executed by Noc Drayan, who proceeded to introduce Lord Darth Angrel, who had come with a proposition for them. Another attendee, the Ambassador, was apprehended by Republic war droid M1-4X during his stay at the casino for espionage against the Republic. The Ambassador was later turned over to Sis agents. It also just so happened to be the place of which the Hut leadership was convening and had decided to accept Anakin's message from. This place was quite high off of the ground and one would need to use a vehicle of some kind to get up to it. There was no lower entrance because this casino came up off of the ground and had no supports for it to stay within the air. It was floating, flying above everything else, while everything that was below its level were either places that didn't matter or places with which those that were separate stayed beneath. On the off chance that someone somehow lost their wealth and it ended up below. Such a dangerous game they played with so very little gains, but lots of risk. Grievous, along with Anakin that has taken control of the droid, were going towards the casino as they were told that the slug leaders were there. The huts weren't exactly a good species when it comes to anything involving movement, so of course Grievous and Anakin had already moved in their direction before they would go on some chase. Anakin didn't want to have a repeat of what had happened on Coruscant when he had to chase that bounty hunter only to have her die by the hands of another bounty hunter, Jango Fett. Even thought it was said that all of the hut cartels were most likely within this high-rise, floating building above it all. It did not in fact have all of the huts Anakin and Grievous were looking for. This moon may be somewhat of a marvel, and to Anakin, he could also see the unique opportunity to study this planet and its strange state within the Force. He wasn't here for that right now. Just as he wouldn't be helping out those that were either desperate here intentionally or not. The huts came first, then he would need to focus on purging this place of criminal organizations. In fact, the huts didn't even originate from Nal Hutter, and they had turned the planet into what it was after taking control of it. When the huts left their homeworld of Val, they displaced the Avosi, native to Nalhutta, to Narshada 15,000 years ago, and immediately destroyed the remaining Avosi agriculture. Anakin could see and sense the many beings here, and there was a lot a lot a lot of people here that were poor and dying. He had also seen that previous native species to what is now called Nalhutta, and could say that they were in a state that could only be considered worse for wear. Eventually the moon was annexed by the huts, who started to force the Avosi into slave labor, completely changing the moon's unknown original natural terrain by building spaceports and docking bays across its surface with some stretching out into orbit. Although the moon's urbanized construction had just started, it quickly began to prosper along with Nalhutta. It would take 500 years after the huts had taken over Nalhutta and then annexing Narshada, before the moon would be completely urbanized and the Avosi were finally free, since their work was complete. However, most had died off during the construction and the few that remained took refuge in the Undercity. Unfortunately, the Avosi began to mutate into unwholesome savages due to various technologies practiced in the moon's Undercity. That is right, those creatures that Anakin sense were abominations of what they were before. Here another interesting piece of information and that is the Republic had used this place along, long time ago, for 11,000 years. Had the Nar Shadda been known as a place that used to rival Coruscant when it came to trade, it rivaled the galactic capital Coruscant as an important center of interstellar trade and continued to grow. Unfortunate for the huts and those that were in control at the time, but around 4,000 years prior to now, or exactly 11,000 years since their settlement on Nal Hutter and Nar Shadda, the trade lanes shifted, Nar Shadda and its planet became obsolete and were eventually abandoned by the Republic. Nar Shadda became a criminal haven and gained a reputation of being the center of illegal operations in the galaxy, earning the moniker, the Smuggler's Moon. Now distant from most galactic trade centers, 
the moon was allowed to run its own affairs with little outside interference. Sections of the urbanized moon's vertical city included the Juro sector and the Corellian sector, which contained three bars popular with bounty hunters, the burning deck, the slag pit, and the meltdown cafe, as well as another corner tavern called the Orange Lady. We are nearly there, Anakin said to Grievous who was just behind him as Anakin needed to slow down for the old man to keep up. You know that I am getting on in my years, right? Grievous asked, wanting to know whether or not Anakin had been doing this on purpose. I don't know what you are talking about. His robotic, synthesized version of his voice came from the droid in reply. This led to Grievous almost doing a double take as it wasn't normal for Anakin to not know about something, especially when he should be able to figure out what he was talking about. Oh, of course you don't, Grievous responded. How much further do we have to go exactly? You will arrive at your destination in calculating. Anakin was starting to get into a joking mood and decided to humor himself instead of focusing on the despair this place oozed, and the distinct weirdness within the force calling out to him. You will arrive at your destination in 12 minutes, Anakin said in a way that was reminiscent of his previous life's navigation devices. Why are you saying it like that? Grievous was weirded out and for some reason he felt annoyed at the way Anakin was saying that. Emperor, he questioned, but Anakin had gone quiet and wouldn't reply, until, take a right in the next 100 meters, and then continue. You will reach your destination in 11 minutes, Anakin said and would continue to be this annoying until they reached the building they both wanted to go towards. Within the casino, the Hut cartel leaders, otherwise known as the Kajidics, were discussing how things were going. This is ridiculous, the slave boy wouldn't dar dash. Would you shut up? No. Various voices were heard, but everything was being said within the language of the huts, something that anyone else within this place kept quiet about. They wouldn't dare go against their overlords. Overlords that have the power to kill them if they wanted, plus they had brought along people that were considered criminals even more so than anyone else. They were a part of the organized crime here on Narshada, while the huts had also brought in some extra protection. Those criminal organizations had something to gain and lose in the huts falling to Anakin, especially since they didn't even know what Anakin would request of the huts once they would win. These criminals that lived here or here for temporary work, probably knew better than the huts, just what Anakin and the Emperor was capable of. We have lost all communication, a distinctly human character said towards his hut overlords, and while it may be a mistake to become the bearer of bad news, this guy would still do his job, as he was also on the cutting block. No one here was exactly innocent, and the Kajidic at least the presence of mind to not bring along any elements that could become traitors. They had also done their research into how things had happened, especially when it came to the Emperor's droids, since it was something that always made an appearance. What did you say? A hut Kajidic called out to the man. He communicated Dash he was interrupted as the same hut Kajidic that had asked this question got his droids to bring the man over. But we wait. It was too late however as the hut was easily able to pick this man up and then devour him whole. Something that wasn't exactly normal. But there would always be some unusual characters. Doesn't he taste disgusting? I don't know how you could ever bear to continue eating those fifth. One of the Kajidic said. I like the way they taste humans taste like pork or beef. The Kajidic had this look within his eye that would most definitely not be received well. The huts had decided to not keep any emperor made droids or droids that came from or even had the slightest of connections to the Emperor, the Emperor or their company of Skywalker Industries. They were smart to do this, and they had done this because they had discovered some things and incidents from when that slave rebellion happened. They would not allow what had happened to their compatriots on Tatooine to happen to themselves, not that they were the ones that came up with this information. It was in fact the allies of the Huts that had brought up this point to them, and while they used the droids from the Emperor or Skywalker Industries within their armies, they would not use them for personal use. Wherever his creations ended up, Anakin didn't mind what they were to be used for, as long as it wasn't for something against him. He allowed his droids to enter multiple, various economies exactly for this moment, but also because he didn't just spread his reputation and the reputation through normal means for slaves, and had his droids from within or anywhere connected to the slave trade in freeing people. Obviously, the enslaved people, now free from their burdens as slaves, would remember this and go towards the Emperor. Others could escape of their own free volition, but that didn't mean that they were helpless. Knowing that most slaves were implanted with chips, Anakin would send out multiple of his thought processes to also start taking care of the people in desperate situations. Even though he would deny the claims of him being some divine being, at this point, he has the ability to see everything at every point. Well, not at the same level of true omniscient, but because of the way his mind works in combination with his well-thought-out plan of planting his droids, that he could take control of and see through their eyes, allowing him a greater view of everything. He was probably one of the closet to being an actual god at this point, but he would still argue against this point. He already had the responsibilities of being the emperor of the emperor, and then there were the responsibilities to his family as well. How could he be the god of his people as well? It wasn't like he was starting to amass power enough to create his own energy field, separate from the Force, but with all of the same capabilities. What are we to do now? I don't know. This Kajidic burped from having a nice delicious human meal. Shut up you. We need to think of a way to escape. I do not want to die here. Do you really think the slave emperor would kill us? Yes. They were still in discussion about what was going on and what they would do about the situation. The only thing we can do now is hole up here and wait for the slave emperor's troops to come knocking. It would be hard to kill us anyway. Don't you remember what happened to Jabba? This question definitely got all of those within to quiet down at the mention of one of their most successful Kajidics, mutilated beyond belief. 
that he had become a husk of what he was. There was no point in even trying to keep him alive as they had no way to sustain him. There wasn't much medicine that was practiced on the huts because they had such a hard time being hurt by anything. Their bodies were just built differently and quite literally built like tanks, where they would be able to survive pretty much everything. Perhaps most remarkably of all, huts could even regenerate body parts when injured. Around the years ago, a hut known as Gargan lost half his head including an eye and apparently a sizable part of his brain. When he was ravaged by a Wendrella, yet it was anticipated that he would regenerate the injured tissue completely after a century or so. It is not known if the regeneration of his brain had any effect on his mind or personality. Some huts, such as Quaffig, were believed to possess multiple brains. Though whether this was a species-wide trait was unknown. This wasn't helpful for Jabba though as he was completely and total impaired from being able to heal ever again. Well, he could heal, but he most certainly couldn't grow back entire body parts like this particular hut. The slimy coating of sweat and mucus protected them from either chemical burns or heat. Huts were resistant to many poisons and diseases and seldom fell ill. It was also claimed that the species was indigestible with creatures such as the Salic facing indigestion from swallowing a hut. As a result, such creatures forcibly expelled their kind instead of eating them, which was a trait that saved some huts from death. Their body odor was noted for being strong enough to upset a sensitive human stomach. Despite all of this, they were not that hard to kill. But because of certain physical advantages, most weapons like very, very old weaponry like cold weapons or guns that were not energy-based would be unable to harm them. Mycogidix, they are coming. Someone called out, is this got everyone on alert with even the huts deciding that they needed to get into a better position? To positions. Someone called out, and they all started to move even quicker. The place was starting to become locked down, and there was minimal lighting to hide from their perpetrators. Not that, that would do much against those who were coming. Mycogidix, they are coming. Someone called out, is this got everyone on alert with even the huts deciding that they needed to get into a better position? To positions. Someone called out, and they all started to move even quicker. The place was starting to become locked down, and there was minimal lighting to hide from their perpetrators. Not that, that would do much against those who were coming. Lights out. The smell was absolutely horribly, despite the establishment being something that was much better than anywhere else. It may not have been the actual High Rollers Casino, but it was at least cleaned as frequently as they could. The reason for this was because the huts usually liked to gamble here. The casino had gone completely quiet as they awaited their enemies to make their entrance. Movement throughout would sometimes startle those that were either further away from each other or close by. Very small sounds would nearly have everyone start shooting in those directions, which would give away they were holed up here. Everyone here assumed that they were only coming here to check the place out, and were banking on the fact that they would leave before things had to get dirty. Heavy breaths created a resonance with everyone, their heartbeats or otherwise in line with the pace of what could happen. Adrenaline pumping through them as they were in an enhanced state of perception, an instinctual thing knowing that whatever or whoever was coming could kill them. What seemed like hours or even days to their adult senses was actually just a few minutes, and as time continued to move, they would slowly start to get tired at the weight. Their enemies that were said to be coming, seemed to not be coming, and they were slowly letting their guard down. That was until they started to hear some form of explosions happening from the outside. What was that? Someone hissed out and exclaimed both within a quiet voice. But because of the silence it was heard by everyone. Someone hissed back be quiet. Most of those within didn't have much to go back to. Only their riches and the huts within had many things of their own to go back to. But they most definitely wouldn't be let off easily. The same would apply to the bounty hunters or criminals from the criminal organizations that originated from here or came here. Even though the criminals knew that there was no chance of survival if they were found, they came up with another plan. A plan that would have them abandoning the huts and giving themselves up. What is the point of having all of the riches they have access to when they would be dying? No one was going to take their wealth into whatever afterlife there is for them. After a while the sounds they heard from outside had subsided, and they were once again awakened to their new reality. They were once again on full alert even with having their adrenaline-like states come down. It had been reactivated due to the situation, and this was tiring them out. Slowly but surely they would be mentally addled within states that would slowly weaken their senses and make them tired. If this continued, they would be unable to properly fight back to their fullest extent. They were silly to believe that their enemy would just immediately go after them without taking their own time. They obviously couldn't escape, but they were still willing to make some sort of effort to make sure they lived. Where are they? Someone hissed out, and this got some annoyed grunts from multiple people, but it had been almost an entire hour since they were set up. Most people here before they were even alerted of an attack were already drunk and, or tired in combination desperate as well. They were in a casino after all, and the huts had come here because it probably had the best defensive capabilities with some escape routes as well. Escape routes that had been disabled to them. Would everyone just shut the fuck up? A voice said again, but it was angry, and most importantly wasn't quiet anymore. This person impulsiveness however, would cause a chain reaction where their plan to do an ambush or hide it out was going to be exposed. Arguments were starting up, and the hushed whispers that started because of this man's impulsiveness lead to everyone starting to get irritated. As everyone was upset, frustrated, tired, and even high off of some dangerous substances, the huts were the worst for wear in this situation. They had thought that these well-trained men would be of some help, but they were obviously useless. Their minds addled by drugs being inebriated or even simply being personalities or characters that were impulsive led to this situation. How can someone put their trust in a bunch of thugs, 
that did the worst of the worst of crimes for money. As they were arguing, the huts could only further try and exclude themselves from the rowdy bunch. The much more smart of those bounty hunters and mercenaries were then backed up away from the ruckus that had transferred itself to the middle of the casino. They were obviously tired, and they would be unable to be of any help. So those that were smart, plus the huts, had decided to just use them as cannon fodder. They could prove to be a worthy distraction, if only long enough to allow everyone else to kill their soon-to-be intruders. Even then, no one came through those doors, and as everyone waited, with those that were impulsive, had also come down from their high, they were starting to become confused. Maybe I was mistaken. One person thought that was the messenger to tell them of the approaching people. By now everyone was starting to relax, and even the lights were starting to come back on, because people couldn't be bothered anymore. Even those that were most cautious of what was going to come were coming out of their hiding places. The huts were the most confused, given that they knew that the enemy knew that they were here, and should have at least checked the casino. What was even more confusing was that there were noises from outside the casino, explosions of various kinds indicating that people were either dying or things were being destroyed. This would usually be a good signal to people that something terrible was coming their way. Unfortunately nothing had happened. People didn't know how to feel, and their guards that had been on an all-time high were starting to recede. Even more so that some people were starting to become clear-headed at their situation once the drugs or the booze wore off. However, no one would be actually capable of proper combat if anyone was to come now. They had run out of that adrenaline rush that would help them in times of stress, plus becoming both mentally tired and physically even when they were not doing anything. Is that it? The huts were reconvening and a lot of them were tired. They were living creatures as well, with proper working brains. Meaning that they needed sleep to function as well. And when it came to a war of attrition the huts would usually win. But when it came to the mind, let's just say their minds were as powerful as those within the Emperor. Their bodies may outlast a lot of people, but their minds were just as energy consuming as the brains of other species. It can't be. That slave Emperor wanted to capture us. Wanted the huts to surrender to that puny Emperor. We would never surrender. They started to laugh feeling as if they had been let off the hook. It was as if their ancestors were looking down and smiling upon them, when it was actually not anything like that. Instead, it would be more accurate to conclude that their ancestors were nowhere to be seen. They would most definitely not want to get involved with Anakin, as he would most certainly search through their memories, and if they did wrong, kill them. Anyway, where do you think they have gone now? I don't know. They were puzzled as they had no clue and no communications to enable them to know of the situation. For all they knew, their reinforcements had arrived by now, but they hadn't. Even if the hut's reinforcements came, the combined force powers of the synths would be able to take control of a few of the control ships and droids, which would lead to the hut fleets having some men fighting amongst each other. I guess we should celebrate then. Maybe you shouldn't do that by eating more humans. They are disgusting creatures. Maybe you should try out eating some other species. What do you mean? Humans are the most delicious. Nothing else compares to them laughing and generally enjoying their time. The huts were doing good, or at least they seemed to be doing good. In the meanwhile those within the casino were also having celebrations of their own by re-indulging themselves within booze or drugs. This only went to further make the people incapable of doing anything if an intruder really did come. They were forced to assume that they were completely safe just because no one had come. That didn't mean the more intelligent of those within didn't decide to leave themselves. They were most certainly going to sink with a bunch of foolish drug addicts, desperate bounty hunters and criminals along with the slug lords of the Outer Rim. So they left. What those leaving didn't notice was that as people left, they would slowly filter out and disappear and there were very, very muffled noises coming from outside. However, the sound from within the casino completely muffled these sounds. So any and all of those that still had some capacity to fight, were completely taken in by those that were waiting outside. By the way, shouldn't we send someone out to check the outside? One of the hut kajidics asked. What? Didn't we send someone out a while ago? Why haven't they returned yet? Beats me. In a gesture reminiscent of a shoulder shrug, one hut replied, Well, I guess we could dash they were interrupted however, as it was time for some action. The lights were flickering on and off, while the entire building was starting to shake back and forth, with a massive amount of pressure crushing down on them. It was crumbling from the outside in, and there was no way to help the support beams within to stop the ceiling and floors eventually meeting. Their bodies juggled around the casino as they collided with some unfortunate souls, being crushed by the weight of their very weighty bodies. The huts weren't having a fun time themselves, and were in fact having to suffer the full force themselves as they also collided with each other as well. Multiple people weren't dying because the building was being crushed, but instead, the huts were killing everyone else. People were too tired to react to the situation, and in their really fucked up states, they believed that this was some sort of bad trip. A bad trip on drugs that was having everyone killed, whether that be their colleagues or close personal friends. Not everyone was dying however, as some key figures seemed to be kept alive for later purposes, while the huts themselves even thought taking a lot of damage, wouldn't die, simply because they became roly polies. After a while, the building came to a stop, and everything had been turned upside down. They felt themselves slowly being moved downwards, and it was similar to what an elevator would feel like. Slow and didn't actually feel like they were moving at all, even when they could tell they were going downwards. Are we what dash taking a deep breath, the hut continues. Happy dash the hut coughed up blood as they all tried to rebalance themselves from this situation. The doors of the casino finally opened, and they could all see the two people wait, one person and one droid come in. Hello there, Grievous said to everyone within this building and assessed that quite a lot of damage had been done. My emperor, it would seem 
you did quite the damage. It's okay. Anakin knew that people died in here, but all of those that Anakin could see being redeemed had been spared. Those that he couldn't be bothered to help were those that would die, just as he would always do. Usually he doesn't mind murderers as well, as they could be reformed, instead he mostly just let those that he deemed worthy of death die. He would do much more, but it was better to just allow them to go through a fate that could be considered quite embarrassing. Dying due to the weight of a hut wasn't a good way to go. That was for sure. Let's see here. Grievous started to send out some droids to take care of and handle the down people within. Specifically the criminals while any workers that were somewhat innocent and girls or boys enslaved just as they would both always do. Huts. Slugs. A whole lot of them. Grievous scanned all of the huts here and a lot of internal damage was done. Right, let's round them up. Shag Buki. Chu. Slave boy. Die. A hut exclaimed but was unable to do anything in return to Anakin's droid body. Anakin supposes that his voice must be recognizable enough for the huts to recognize fully enough even when he was using the body of a droid. Droid Anakin replied in their native tongue, shut up Udu. Shut it? Anakin also said some words that weren't as nice, but that would ruin his calm image, so it was done to the huts within their minds. He transmitted images of their deaths and the deaths of those that they had killed, using their own atrocities against them. It was a favorite ability of his, but he didn't want to mentally break them within that short amount of time. He was here for more than his own sense of justice, and instead was here to help the enslaved people, the common folk but most importantly to establish the hut space, and the hut cartel as something under him. As a tributary state, he was here for more than his own sense of justice, and instead was here to help the enslaved people, the common folk but most importantly to establish the hut space, and the hut cartel as something under him. As a tributary state, the Grand Hut Council, also known as the Hut Grand Council and the Hut Council, was the ruling body of the Hut Clan, a collection of powerful Hut Crime Clan families, and was located on the Hut homeworld of Nal Hutter, and included a number of high-profile and influential Hut leaders. Right now, at the current instance, there is only one leader. Marlo led the Hut Council as Jabba the Hut was another leader, but because of his current state was deemed unfit for duties. It would have been that during the war, the Grand Hut Council would ally themselves with Maul and his Shadow Collective, assisting the organization with its takeover of Mandala. Now, that may or may not come true, according to Anakin's will that is. There are two known clans and a lesser clan that Anakin knew more of because of their prominence within the Hut's leadership structure. The first two primary clans he knew of were the Desilogic and Basadi, while the lesser one he knew of is the Nuda. Most other Hut families operate from within their territories, which means that Anakin didn't collect much information on them. There are two other families that Anakin had to collect information on, as they were the lesser known ones even more so than the Nuda, who do have operations outside of their space. These two other clans were the Nemro and Phaethra. The Nemro clan was a Hut clan, or Kajidic, of the Hut cartel. One of its members was the Hut Suda, a crime lord or Nal Hutter. The Fathra clan was a Hut clan, or Kajidic, of the Hut cartel. One of its members was the Hut Ventara, a crime lord or Nal Hutter. The Fathra clan had members that had quarrels with those of the Nemra clan. Nuda was a Hut Kajidic. Long before the Galactic Civil War, the Nudas owned a luxurious estate on Mateu, in the Anote sector of the Outer Rim Territories. The Nuda were among the Hut patrons of the privateer side in Athano. The Sadi was a Hut Kajidic and one of the most powerful families of the Hut clan. Some of its members included Godala Basadi the Elder in a rock, the latter of whom had the symbol of the Kajidic tattooed on his upper left arm. They were the bitter enemies of the Desilogic clan. The more notorious Huts of the Basadi clan were Godala the Elder in a rock, the latter leading and representing the clan on the Hut ruling council. Godala would often be seen as the mighty and more successful Jabba Desilogic Tyre's main rival, but would also be of service to him. That was until Anakin had taken care of Jabba. Desilogic was a Hut clan. Desilogic, also known as the Desilogic Tyre clan, or the Tyre family, was an influential Hut Kajidic. Jabba Desilogic Tyre was the head of his crime family until his leadership was destroyed by Anakin and taken over by his nephew and niece, known as the Twins. It was bitter enemies with the Basadi clan. Members of the Desilogic clan were known for their appreciation of humanoid females, extravagant taste, hedonism, and expensive palaces. Some of them also had a mutation that resulted in hair. It can also be said that Desilogic was one of the first of the Hut clans from Val, since it could be represented on the Hut ruling council. This is all of the information on the Hut families, the Kajidics of the Hut cartel. Shao Wu Shag Emperor, Yuba Wa GG Kachu, Ki Chai Chai Kunabed 2 GGG. Well stupid slave emperor, you have us now. What are you going to do with us? A Hut clan leader said as they were held down through very painful restraints, that would cause pain if they were to try and move. Very efficient ways to imprison the Huts, given that they were unable to move very fast in combination, that Anakin needed to create something that would allow him to control them. He didn't want to kill his hostages. He needed them alive for other things. I have you here now because I want to come to an agreement. An agreement that all will be unable to say no to. And if you do not enforce the things or agree with my terms, 
then you will die. I can always replace you leaders with another heart. Anakin replied through the use of his droid body, while Grievous stood by as Anakin talked to the hearts. There are a few of you out there you know, and I imagine a normal hut's shock at the chance of becoming one of the Kajidic. Anakin continued, You Bachara, you wouldn't. Many voices of dissent was heard from within their cages. Oh, but I would. Anakin answered as he stared at the huts, and it made them uncomfortable to look at him, or more specifically to look at the droid that is being controlled by Anakin. If Anakin was personally here and he looked at them with his eyes, they would most certainly not want into his eyes. Here are my terms Anakin started. 1. The hut cartel now must concede as they will now be under the Emperor as a tributary state. They would have to provide a large amount of their profits to the Emperor, whether that be from the taxes they receive from citizens within their Republic, and any and all other sources of revenue for the huts. The Emperor will now be recognized as the hut cartel's suzerain. 2. The hut cartel must now pass a law against slavery. Slavery will become illegal within hut space, and they will stop deals with anyone that wishes to continue their slave trade. The hut cartel will enforce this law as well and if they are to not do so, consequences include change in leadership, execution in more severe cases, and even more so is the dismantling of a clan, at the failure of compliance with this condition. 3. Criminal activity will cease immediately, and the Hut Cartel will become the Hut Republic, but their current will be kept. If any of the conditions or terms of agreement are violated, the Hut leadership would also be charged for any criminal activity from within. 4. The Hut Cartel now will need to pay reparations to those that they have done wrong to. Of course, those that they indirectly harmed as well will be included if they cannot find and punish the ones that were a part of the slave trade. The payment to those harmed will be assessed by some officers that will stay here within a large ship that would be used as a base of operations for the Emperor to allow safe passage and shelter to the abused of the Huts and any of whom were related. 5. The allies of the Huts, meaning the criminal organizations will now be outlawed and will be forced to dissolve on the orders of the Emperor. The Huts will enforce these orders with no complaints, and if they are to resist, the Huts will be punished for failure to comply with terms and conditions. 6. Any companies that have been found here within the records kept by the Huts, that had participated in any devious acts, will be forced to also comply with the Emperor's orders. If they don't do so, they will be forced off of both the Emperor, if they have any market set up within the Emperor's economy, and will also be forced out of the Hut's territories. The Huts will enforce this order, and failure to comply will result in the change of leadership within the tributary state. That will be known as the Hut Republic. 7. The Emperor as suzerain of the Hut Cartel, to be known as the Hut Republic and tributary to the Emperor, will provide monetary and trade goods with the Emperor. Failure to comply might result in any or all previously stated punishments in breach of this contract. 8. The Hut Cartel, to be known as the Hut Republic, will transfer any and all current military assets, whether they be droids and ships to the Emperor. They will surrender all militaristic power, and in exchange, the Emperor will provide protection against any foreign enemies. 9. In control of the military. The Huts will allow the Emperor to make use of their various trade routes, hyperlanes, and give full complete militaristic control to the Emperor. This will only be like this for the next 100 years, to ensure the Huts would not try anything against the Emperor. Failure to comply and hand over any and all military-based assets will result in the arrest and immediate execution for the one in charge. 10. The Emperor is allowed to do any missionary work, whether that be the conversion of cultural, religious and ideologies from the Emperor. This is in an attempt to continue and develop a proper relationship between the Hut Cartel, to be known as the Hut Republic and the Emperor. There were some more things things. But this was the basic gist of it. The Hut Kajidics would have to sign over all of their power, and even give up large sums of wealth to not only the Emperor, but also to those that they have wronged. Anakin couldn't just take all of the spoils for himself and his own citizens, now could he? Now, one might be asking themselves what a tributary state was. A state subordinate to a more powerful neighboring state. The tributary state usually sent a regular gift or tribute to the superior state as a token of submission. This token often took the form of a substantial transfer of wealth, such as the delivery of gold, produce or slaves, so that tribute might best be seen as the payment of protection money. Or it might be more symbolic, where sometimes it amounted to no more than the delivery of a mark of submission. Here Anakin didn't want to take the path of least resistance, and decided to go all the way. He was doing more than what a normal tributary suzerain relationship would be like, and decided that he would even take control of their military as well. So, it couldn't really be called tributary when it was the Emperor and that was kind of the ruler of them through military and economic means. This was a way to ensure that they would have no troops to try and rise up against the Emperor or Anakin's demands, and ensure that they had no money to hire anyone to also do so as well. At least no money in large quantities that is. So it was better to start calling the Hut Cartel. No, the Hut Republic a puppet state. A puppet state, puppet regime or puppet government or dummy government is a state that is de jure independent, but de facto, completely dependent upon an outside power, and subject to its orders. Puppet states have nominal sovereignty, but a foreign power effectively exercises control through means such as financial interests, economic, or military support. So, what Anakin has done by using this contract the Huts were kind of forced to sign, if they wanted to live and maintain their positions of leadership. No matter how harsh the conditions were, it wasn't like they would be unable to change. If they didn't there would probably be no more. 
By leaving a local government in existence the outside powers evade all responsibility, while at the same time successfully paralyzing the government they tolerate. Puppet states are distinguished from allies, which choose their actions on their own, or in accordance with treaties they voluntarily entered. Puppet states are forced into providing legal endorsement for actions already taken by a foreign power. By the time 100 years have passed, the huts may still be alive, but they would have gotten used to the emperor's rule over them. They may even allow the emperor to officially rule over them, and annex themselves to Anakin or whoever is in charge at the time. There was also the fact that the people within would change rapidly because of Anakin sending missionaries out to expand the emperor's influence. It would take a few years for hut space to be completely flushed of any criminal influence, but it would be well worth the wait. So, how do you guys like this deal? It is beneficial to you guys, right? You will not have to worry anymore about any militaristic matters, and would hardly have to worry about the economy as well. In fact Anakin and his droid body was still as imposing if he was within his normal form, because he could control his presence within the force so much that it would make them fear him. He didn't need the hut's respect as he would find reasons to replace them later. It was better to seem like a much more calm, peaceful and diplomatic person than he really is. I do believe that your trade routes and trade posts would improve with the Emperor around. Anakin looked at them all, all of those filthy slugs and contemplated killing them. That was until he remembered why he was keeping them alive in the first place. To fabricate claims and cause dissent within the Hut Cartel. They would have to cut ties with any criminal organizations, and would even have to cut ties with corporations that were in the wrong, using them as a place to test things, and develop either dangerous tech or medicine. Please, I would like your signatures, physical, and virtually on these documents. Then I would like a public statement from all of you to everyone else at your agreements. Then I would also like a verbal statement right now as well. Anakin continued to pace around their cells with his droid body. Yes, that is good. Now please. I would also like to get your written consent and verbal consent, plus a video documented evidence that you will state you were not under any duress at the time of signing these documents. They are obviously under duress, but it wasn't like that mattered to anyone much. It was the diplomatic and bureaucracy part Anakin had to handle, as he didn't want to give the Republic reasons to go against him right now. Given that they had entered trade agreements with him, which kind of made them reliant on the Emperor and to help them with the war, it seemed to be working out just fine. Palpatine didn't seem to have any countermeasures, but that didn't mean he was going to continue using the Emperor for his means. At this point, Anakin was kind of looking forward to what Palpatine would try and pull. There was nothing he could do after all, or at least Anakin couldn't see anything that Palpatine could do, other than try and look for allies elsewhere. If the Emperor held a monopoly in this bet, then Sidious surely knew and probably had a bad feeling about continuing this deal. The Kaminans weren't an option right now, and he didn't exactly want to extend the war so far out until they knew batch of clones were ready. They had did it. The Emperor had won out against the tyrannical Hut Cartel, and their continued abuse of their power and diligent negligence for their people's well-being. Sooner or later they were going to fall, but no one had expected that they would become a tributary state to the Emperor. Or, at least that was on paper as those in the know, and even those that had some level of political experience, could tell that the Huts were nothing more than a puppet state. The Emperor didn't try to hide it either, but still kept up with the face that they would just a suzerain that would better control the Huts from going out of control. Today, I address the people a part of the Hut Cartel and those planets and systems under our control. I address the criminal scum, along with the corporations that have taken and used the common folk, enslaved and those that were innocent in their bids to outcompete their competitors, by resorting to horrid experiments. It was one of the Hut Kajidics addressing everyone at large, the Galactic Republic, the Hut Cartel's affiliates and multiple other people, that they were making a change. In accordance to the Emperor's treaty with the Huts, we will be outlawing slavery and converting the Hut Cartel into a merchant republic. Then we will also be creating laws in accordance with the Emperor's wishes to outlaw certain activities to do with anything that would be considered criminal acts. Furthermore, the Hut looked at everyone, and if people were good at reading Hut expressions, they would be able to tell that this leader had some embarrassment on their face. The Huts will be handing over some monetary gifts to those the Huts have previously harmed, and those that took part in the slave trade within Hut territories will also have to participate in this act. Names, organization and various people have already been identified and have been, in accordance to out new laws, either imprisoned or executed, because they wouldn't follow our new rules within Hut space. The Emperor has also graciously decided to help better take under their wing our military, and will be taking care of our external and internal problems, that require such forces. We will also be providing the Hut would go on and on, as they were forced to have everyone know, publicly that they were under contract, and the contract was also exposed to everyone, so that they knew that the Huts were going to follow this. This worked twofold as if the Emperor somehow did something wrong. Not in accordance with the treaty, they would be in trouble, and the galactic public at large would be upset. While the Emperors would only care little, if they didn't care at all, the Hut Merchant Republic would also be forced into a position of following through with the Emperor's demands. If they didn't do this publicly, there was a chance that they would be able to somehow escape this deal. But Anakin made sure that they did this, because it would ensure their loyalty through fear. They would be too panicked by this change, losing their money, and having no proper protection, due to no standing armies or protection from paying people. 
Then there is also the fact that the huts would have to deal with the public repercussions, being that they would exclaim at the top of their lungs, that the huts were doing wrong by the treaty. That is right. Anakin had weaponized the people through this one event. That is the end of my speech and update on the situation. I thank all those that have attended today, and all of those that have been watching from their abodes, or anywhere else in the galaxy. The hut finally ended their speech, while also being surprisingly much more polite and much more humble in their speech. It was obvious that the hut leadership had chosen the best person for the job in diplomatic relations within their leadership. It was also because they needed a replacement for the hut that Anakin had decided needed to die, and their replacement was someone else from their clan. This did two things, ensuring that they fear Anakin and the repercussions would be used to its full extent, and it also assured them that if they did wrong, it would at least stay within the family clans. Meaning that it would seem that Anakin could be trusted as a man of his world. The huts would have some smidgen of respect at this prospect, because it proved to them that he would keep to the treaty perfectly. Of course he had killed one of them as well, but that was only par for the course, as the one he had executed was because they were the one that was eating people. They would have been surprised if he didn't kill him and then replace him. The entire galaxy was ablaze with conversation about the very short-lived war between the Hut Cartel and the Emperor. It would seem that when everyone wasn't paying any attention to the Emperor at all and as they expanded, they had become strong enough to strong arm the Hut Cartel. Reports here and there spread out, and the contract or treaty that had been signed was something that was officially shown to any and everyone. There were no claims of dispute over this treaty being wrong, especially when Anakin had also decided to keep their families hostage until they official spoke up to the galactic public at large. Then there was the release of multiple and various information in regards to what had happened during the war. Any losses that had been recorded and losses that weren't mentioned at all as well. Then there was the reports on how the Emperor, or more precisely Anakin, had come to hut space and had conquered. Conquered and then freed all of those enslaved through clever tactics and planning. The common folk even bombarded by various sources of information, would see that Anakin has done something good. The Jedi most certainly couldn't complain about something like this, especially since it was a net gain for everyone. The Republic, the Emperor and the Separatists would all benefit from something like this. It was obvious what the Emperor would gain, but for the Separatists and Republic, they should be able to expand their own operations into the hut space. Of course they wouldn't be allowed to fight within this space because they would be going against the Emperor, an empire that had grown to a state that could decide the civil war of the Republic with some intervention from them. Anakin planned to just start mass migrating people from the huts into his own developed planets, as it was much better within the proper borders of the Emperor. The huts couldn't exactly complain, and it wasn't like he was taking everyone they had, all of their population or anything like that but was instead liberating them and the enslaved from the huts. It would surely cost some amount of upkeep to have them around, and Anakin could make them be of better use within the Emperor, not as enslaved people, but as free individuals. It also gave Anakin a reason a reason to start expanding more and more within the Arcanist sector, or the other sectors of Chamel and Queli. Admittedly there may not be much within Queli and Chamel, when in comparison to the Arcanist sector, but Anakin was planning ahead of time for when he connected the spatial borders properly. There was also the fact that he may continue to expand the Chamel sector through the use of technology capable of creating entire planets made of mech. He was already doing experiments, successfully that would enable him to build up entire fleets and planets that could travel. One such example being Tatooine and its transformation, but he wouldn't be turning it into something like Nar Shadda as he didn't want that. It needed to be living, and there was only one method he knew of to grant an entire mechanical base planet made from advanced technologies, the status of life within the Force, non-organic midichlorians, and he needed a way to start mass producing these things because it was hard to create more of them. So he would be making ample use of the moon, Nar Shadda to bring it back to proper life. Now that the problem of the huts was taken care of and the Emperor was taking control of their military forces fully, their droids and starship placed all around the hut space to ensure that things get done properly. Anakin had even sent out a few extra fleets back to the broom with droids, given that they were now under his control. Emperor in space is safe for the most part, because he decided to be a lot more compact instead of spreading his forces then throughout the sector or into other sectors. He also now has enough forces to start taking over some other places, exactly because he could also send some of the sense to overseer operations within the hut space. He is sure that they would do fine, especially since the ones chosen for semi-leadership positions were chosen exactly because of their compatibility with the jobs. Personality, character, training and other factors like their talents and education came into play. He didn't only send senses there are also capable statesmen from the Emperor, who were but simple people. Anakin was starting to see some benefits being harvested from his implementation of his plan to give everyone that super serum. He was able to delegate much better now. Now Anakin and Emperor in turns its sights to conquering the rest of the Arcanist sector. There was only one side left, that side being a conglomeration of systems closest to the Arcanist system itself. Anakin would and has already started taking control of this places, such places being Hefren was a planet located in the Arcanist sector sector of the Outer Rim. This mountainous world was a small mining colony maintained by no one at this point in time, meaning that it can come under the control of the Emperor. The planet held important ruins from a vanished civilization, including the Hefren Aqueducts, which spanned Hefren's continents research during the Cold War between the Galactic Republic and the Sith Empire identified the Aqueducts builders as early Athorian explorers. Hefren would become another planet supplying the Emperor with resources even if minor in its output. 
it was still better because of the large projects he has planned. The next planet and system is Mika, also known as Jellyfish Cove. That would have been an imperial penal planetoid, covered with oceans and barren deserts, littered with humanoid statues which came to life at sunset. It was an asteroid with which Anakin would be able to create yet another base of operations for one of the departments within the government. Or it could be used in a similar manner that the Galactic Empire would have used it as. A penal planetoid for prisoners, since Anakin didn't have a place like this, but instead had a place on Tatooine for any and all prisoners. It would be the perfect place to bring captured people and prisoners to, so Anakin decided it was a must. He disliked having those prisoners that were being redeemed stay on the same planet as the capital, so it would be done. They were still beings, but sometimes those that needed some reformation and reintegration into society shouldn't be on the same planet as the capital, because he knew that failure to keep prisoners at bay was normal. It could totally break down and allow for the prisoners a way to escape, which would allow them back into this place. It would be impossible for them to take a ship themselves, since everything was monitored by Anakin and Siri. However, they could take someone hostage on Tatooine. So it was best to send them to Mika. Another system and planet is Najiba, the Najib homeworld. It was a remote world covered with wetlands, and its surface was lashed with atmospheric electrical discharges and frequent rainstorms. Anakin could make use of its major exports of foodstuffs, low technology and minerals. The Emperor needed more and more minerals or ores for the project he was working on, and that Anakin wanted more and more droids to keep further expanded his domain of control as well. Vash was a planet located within the Vash system of the Outer Rim territories. An agri world of lush green, rolling hills, it was the source of Vashian Rai. Another planet and system to feed the Emperor's people. Another planet and system that would also allow for more jobs within the agriculture development to exist. Last was the planet and system of Holderman, an industrialized planet in the Arcanist sector of the Outer Rim. It was one of the Regency worlds, which meant that it would allow Anakin to increase the trade value within the Emperor as well as increase it outwards as well. This left three more worlds and, or systems that were a part of the Arcanist sector, for his full and total control and domination over the sector. Arcanist, Serpa, and Gorno. The Emperor would have to take Arcanus first to get to the other two, Serp and Gorno. Thankfully, Arcanus is not currently under the control of anyone, and would only be under the control of the Galactic Empire in the future. So this meant that Anakin would be able to take this over, which would lead to massive changes. Arcanus was the sector capital of the Arcanus sector. From Anakin could tell, it would just be another world where he could set up more homes for his people, as there was nothing of too much importance on it, other than its very powerful and direct connection to a trade route. So Anakin would make it a trade center. Serpa, a large planet with little natural resources, would be an imperial high-gravity training center and the Eklid homeworld. Anakin intended to also make it the same way the Galactic Empire would have. A training center to allow those from the Emperor to finally become a part of the army if they wanted to. He was starting to see more and more that there were people that wanted to join. Civilians, because for the longest time, he only used his sense and droids, not not including some special additions, namely Grievous to the mix. Serpa would become a dual planet and system, a trade center and a military training center for the Emperor. Last is Gorno, a planet in the Outer Rim, along the Corellian run near Tatooine. Like Serpa, it wasn't of much use other than becoming a place where Anakin would decided to set up a proper research-based planet, somewhere all of those scientists and intelligent people could call a home. An academy planet for the bright, brilliant and bold. This is where developments would really start to increase more and more, amassing a large amount of research on any and everything. With that, Anakin is now the true rule of the Arcanist sector, and now he could start focusing on things outside of the sector and start planning for some future actions against either the Republic or the Separatists. Deep within the outer borders of space, there was something lurking just beyond the galaxy, where all of the action taking place was. A massive entity of immense size was moving towards the galaxy, that composes the entirety of what were considered the only living beings within the universe. It was the planet of Zanama Seket, the place where all living ships had originated from, the place where Jabitha, Anakin's ship had been born. In the Ferran language, Zanama Seket meant world of body and mind. It was a living planet, much more so than any other planet, that most would think of as living as Zanama. The planet itself had Seket, the living intelligence. Zanama Seket was more than just a simple living planet with which Anakin had gotten Jabitha from, and was in fact something far more important. It was the seed of a planet that came from outside of the known universe of their galaxy, in another that was different from this one. It was never like this from the start, and had to grow to the immense size that it is now, and in doing so, it started to become settled by others. Zanama Seket was unique from other worlds. Its north polar region, a spot of pearl white, was surrounded by an entire hemisphere of tropical jungles. Its southern hemisphere was covered with impenetrable silvery clouds. Along the equator there were several rivers, lakes, and small seas. The edge of the southern hemisphere was also covered by elegant wisp of wind, which frequently broke free to form spinning storms. It was certainly a sight to behold, but if one took a step back and observed from a farther planet, it would look like a massive spherical planet that was green, brown, and with splotches of blue spread all throughout. Some might even see a massive face form because of the planet's strange state of being. Zanama Seket was the seed of another living sentient planet known as Yuasanta. The original homeworld of the extragalactic Yuasan Vong, 
that was destroyed in a devastating conflict war. It was a living sentient planet with a large asteroid belt around it. The Yuuzhan Vong themselves also referred to it simply as the homeworld. In the Yuuzhan Vong, Yuuzhan to meant crash of the gods, and the living planet was a template for the Yuuzhan Vong deities. During the time of the Galactic Republic, Zanama Sekit was rumored to be home to the fastest ships in the galaxy. Jedi Knight Obi-Wan Kenobi and fellow Knight, Anakin Skywalker, traveled there to find fellow Jedi Virgu, and to purchase one of the planet's living ships. Anakin bonded with a record 25 partners, while Obi-Wan was sent back to Coruscant after getting to discover information on Jedi Virgu. While Zanama Sekit was under attack from the Yuuzhan Vong around 10 years prior to events happening now, it was able to defeat them. Later Wolf Tarkin, then a Republic political leader and security force commander, declared war on the living world and attacked it in seven years prior to now. Zanama Sekit unveiled its hyperdrive system, which had been built by the Lingesi and escaped into the unknown regions. In the following years, stories of the rogue planet that had once made living ships circulated among many in the Outer Rim. It was moving more than just in the Outer Rim however, as it was also on the outside of this galaxy as well. It was fully capable of moving all on its own. Being the child of the Yuuzhan Vong's homeworld, certainly made the Yuuzhan have some level of interest in taking it over and making it their homes themselves. However, they were unsuccessful in doing so when they had the chance. The reach of civilization extended at least nominally to the edge of the galactic disk. For instance, the territory of the corporate sector extended to the end of the Tindal Arm. The galactic disk and some satellite galaxies were mapped well enough that the omission of 37 systems, including Kamino, from stellar charts, were obvious gravitational anomalies even when scanning from afar. Zanama Sekit was so far away now from where it would have been, and now was staying within the unknown regions because it was attacked. A few years had passed by now, and it was still in the unknown regions completely blocked off from hyperspace lanes that enable people to travel faster to them. No, if people wanted to get to Zanama Sekit, they would have to fly around in open space, not knowing where they are going. The large galactic volume designated as the unknown regions included uncharted areas in dense nebulae, globular clusters, and the galactic halos. 15% of the galaxy's stellar mass was estimated to be contained within the unknown regions. Many governments repeatedly sent scouts into the unknown regions. It was certainly a massive place left unexplored because people either didn't care enough to go into content with what they have or otherwise thought it was too dangerous. For Zanama Sekit, however, this was a great thing. It may have liked Anakin Skywalker, the boy that had come to its body, and then gotten and connected very well with one of its children, but that in on itself, wouldn't be enough for it to stay. Not when it was attacked like it was. The unknown regions included a unique section of the galactic disk to the galactic west of Bakura, Bobringi, and the Imperial Remnant. Important powers in this area of space included the Chiss Ascendancy, the Cyruvi Imperium, the Vigari, the Kilik Colony, and the Empire of the Hand, but it was also home to species such as the Croak, the Abruci, and the Akeri. Though severely cut off from the rest of the galaxy, these species interacted with one another, and had created a sort of interstellar culture, separate of that of the Galactic Republic or the Empire. Communication and trade were sparse and infrequent, but species such as the Lugabra were found in the services of larger powers across the regions. Common threats such as Ngalingal, brought together disparate species such as the Chiss, Lugabra, and others to combat its encroachments. To Zanama Sekit, this didn't matter, but there was something else out there, calling to it in an area of known space that it didn't want to return to. Something that was familiar. If she didn't know any better, she would have guessed that it was one of her previous living ships calling out to her, calling out to try and find where she had gone, something that Sekit would have responded to if it was stupid. However, she knew that it was probably for the best that it keep to itself for now. All of her children are dead, and those that still live on her are also now confined to herself. She wouldn't be moving from this spot ever, not even when others coming looking for her. So I have been keeping an eye on things. But that doesn't mean I am blind as to know of what you are doing, Anakin said, as he looked at the very cute looking Barris. She was like a startled rabbit that had just been exposed from its home, and was frantically looking for somewhere to escape. I, I don't know what you are talking about. Of course Barris knew what Anakin was talking about, but she wasn't about to cave under the pressure she hoped. I think you do. Anakin used his hand to grasp just under her chin, and make her look towards him his purple-violet eyes gazing into her own purple eyes. She blushed a little and nearly went into a daze as she leaned forward, hoping to have the taste of his lips on her own, only to be denied as Anakin retracted himself from her. I believe what? She was a bit upset, but it wasn't like she wouldn't be able to do something like that with Anakin ever again. I will give you an award if you tell the truth here. Anakin smiled a mischievous smile as he said this, knowing that she would gave in. Reward. She thought back to that moment from where she had nearly gotten to smooch Anakin. Yes. Anakin replied as he awaited for her to come out about what she was doing herself, confronting her about it. Communication is important within relationships after all, and he wanted to communicate with her properly, instead of having to find out that she was doing things behind his back. That while he was okay with, didn't exactly mean she should be doing as well. Why the hell would she become the high priestess of the religious organization that had started up? It would seem that she had grown bored doing other things. Abu Well Barris would then go on to explain what she was doing and why she was doing it. To put it simply, it was because of her love for Anakin, and in her belief that most of what was within this religion said is true, that she wanted to prove her own devotion to Anakin, prove her love as well, thinking that she had not done enough somehow. So you think that you haven't given me enough? Anakin asks. Of course. 
I have given you my mind, body and soul, but I wish to do so much more. It would seem that Barris has become slightly silly, not that Anakin all that minds her devotion. It was certainly something that he wasn't expecting from her, but he would accept that this is just a part of who she is. When she decided to love Anakin and even not care about him having multiple relationship with multiple girls, she didn't mind. What she did mind however is that she had some form of insecurities that included her not giving Anakin enough of what he deserved. It was certainly an interesting way to look at the relationship, and it was probably because he provided for her and the others, while they didn't really do much for him in return. Sure, there was the diet that connected them and made him stronger as a result in themselves as well, and then certain activities they would do, but again this went both ways. It wasn't just Anakin being pleased or being more powerful, but it was them as well. You indulge me and the others in our wants and desires, but it seems like there is so little for us to give you, that I wanted to do something. Anything that would prove my love for you, Barris declared quite passionately. Anakin stepped forward and then grappled onto her, embracing her within a hug. So when you feel these feelings I have for you, and I feel yours, that is not enough. Anakin asked her as she was flustered at this sudden situation. I be well it is enough, and I feel like Dash Barris was interrupted. And there it is. Your feelings matter, but think for a moment about whether or not this is something you actually want to do. A path that is extremely strange and a belief that even I did not hold of myself. Anakin stopped her, so he could explain why he thought these actions she was taking is a bit silly. I appreciate everything you do for me, and all of you just being here with me is more than enough. Of course, I also appreciate the private time you give to me. Anakin continued, of course. It is only meant for you, and you alone dash. Barris was cut off again, as Anakin decided to shut her up by kissing her on the lips. Anakin transmits his emotions through to her, and she does the same. In the end Barris couldn't hold out as long as Anakin could, and needed to stop for some breath. Now, why don't we retire to somewhere more private and try again with one of your desires? I am already having a child with Isla, and sooner or later Shark would also get pregnant due to her stamina. So how about we have another go at it? Anakin asked her, and she smiled a beautiful smile, and started to drag him off into another direction. This was your plan all along wasn't it? Anakin then had an epiphany that she may have waited for a moment like this. Why? I don't know what you are talking about. But now that you have suggested this brilliant idea yourself, why don't we get to it? Barris had a mischievous smile on her face of her own, something that was reminiscent of Anakin's. How devious. I like it. Anakin went along with what Barris planned, and the two would go on to have a very passionate, love-filled day. Of course, by doing these acts, they would inadvertently active his bonds with the others, and they would experience the same desires, wants and blissful moments as well. It was only natural after all, and it only made the rest of Anakin's week even better for him, as he got to spend more and more time doing some lovemaking. He may have not sought out the harem life, but the harem life chose him, and he could deliver. Something interesting of note was that during this time, Anakin and the girls were all going through a change in their bond. It was something that was becoming something so powerful and the feedback becoming so great, that the unity between Anakin and the others had reached a point that could be considered perfect. If any of them were to fight with each other, not against, then they would be in perfect synchronization. Even when the diet only connected them to Anakin, their bond with him was so powerful that allowed for something like this to happen. The only person left out of this was Ahsoka, is for the bond to flourish between Ahsoka and Anakin, they would need to start having an official relationship. Well, there was another person that is left out of this for now, and that is Xana, as she is trying out the dating thing she had heard about, and was willing to try with Anakin. At this point, there was no going back so she might as well try so, you wanted to talk did you? Anakin asked as he allowed Ahsoka into his room, given that this was a day they were supposed to be doing meditation practice, something that she very much disliked especially since he had done this as a way to counteract whatever advances she may be trying to do. I hear about that. Ahsoka started off, not really sure what she was going to say to Anakin, now that she had him all alone to herself. No, bad thoughts Ahsoka, naughty. She quickly brought herself back to reality as Anakin didn't seem to notice what had just happened, but Ahsoka knew better as he was quite the seeky person. Anakin may be pretty honest, but that doesn't mean he wasn't able to hide some things. I get the feeling you are insulting me somehow. Anakin asked her as she approached him. What makes you think that? Ahsoka questioned him, curious as to why he knew that. The look on your face, of course. Anakin answered nonchalantly. Ha, huh, you don't even have your eyes open. Ahsoka was confused as Anakin did in fact have his eyes closed, unable to see her. Also, that is true. I do hide things, just as others hide things from me as well. That doesn't mean I am necessarily a sneaky dasho, but you are totally the sneaky type trying to go around and then striking when the iron is hot. I can see it. It happened with the recent war, and even when it comes to the Republic. Ahsoka was actually quite intelligent, and she seemed to be the only one really paying attention to Anakin's actions the most out of everyone. I guess she does have the most free time. It wasn't like Anakin got her to do anything much except do some basic training, and when it came to schooling, he instead focused on private tutoring instead. It was much better than having the apprentice of the Emperor go to some public educational facility within the Emperor. Everyone would absolutely freak out about her arrival, and there would most certainly be some chaos as well. I don't lie, Anakin replied as she finally sat down opposite of him. At least, I don't lie to any one of you. Do I? I guess not. Ahsoka couldn't really recall herself, a time that Anakin had lied to any of them, 
that he did high things. One such thing was him doing experiments on himself, which they were so graciously brought in on this subject, because it had accidentally been leaked. They probably would have never known, and he would have kept it to himself otherwise. Just like how he had kept to himself his identity as Vader, and his participation in events that would shape the future of the Emperor in years before it became a proper empire. You do high things however, Ahsoka said as she wasn't starting to meditate just yet and instead waited there, staring intensely at Anakin. I concede. Anakin replied as he still had his eyes closed. Why don't you start meditating as well? Or do you want to talk about some things first? Vader. Yes. What about him? Or should I say, what about myself? Anakin asked her as he also had a small smoke develop having fun with himself, and this only irritated Ahsoka. Can you explain yourself you know what I've seen, and for you to do that? Ahsoka left off not needing to say anything more knowing that Anakin got the point. If you are worried about me being like Vader, it is fine. I only used this Vader persona for a specific purpose, and that was to do some sneaky activities that you seem to have figured out I have been doing. Anakin replied. Ahsoka believed him, just as she had believed in him years ago as well. Believed in him as they left the Jedi as well, and there was never a moment where her faith in Anakin was shaken, that was until it was exposed that he took on the mantle of Vader at some point. Even if he had retired this mantle, it was obvious it was something that existed within himself. I won't lie and tell you that Vader isn't a part of me, because Vader and myself are the same but different. There is a reason for existence here, and he isn't the same being you have had visions of. Anakin further explained as he wanted to assure her and take away her doubts or worries. Well, obviously, Ahsoka responded, but deep down she was feeling better just from Anakin's words. I can sense you rolling your eyes, Anakin stated, and she just gave a big huff before closing her own eyes and deciding to meditate on things herself. She was scared to see those same very eyes that Darth Vader had looking at her, and much preferred Anakin's eyes now as they were. Not that she would say this out loud. Within some Emperor and Citizen's home, one could see that they were watching something before being rudely interrupted by ads. Damn these adverts to the Emperor's void. A man roared as he had come back from a day's hard work. Generic country music starts to play in the background as the advertisement starts. Hey isn't that the man seems to be surprised at what was happening on his screen. The camera pans to a fishing pond where a genetically engineered Super Force user with dirty blonde hair and glowing purple eyes is sitting in a boat, opening a cold one with the boys. The man tips his cowboy hat looks at the camera and says, when I'm not being a space emperor. The screen quickly switches to him in his full battle armor, teabagging some figure that was within some sort of robe and had quite the pasty, baggy skin, while Emperor and Star ships are destroying the enemy combatants from the sky. The screen switches back to Anakin in the boat. I'm just a regular guy who loves his family. I love to sit back and relax and grab a cold one with the boys. And the best drink for that is Skylight. The camera pans to the beer in his hand, the logo being prominently shown with tiny droplets of cool water dripping from the brand. The camera pans out to the sky where the Skylight logo is shown in a big font and a narrator's voice says, Skylight, the drink that brings the home to you, no matter where in the sky you are. Well, I'll be. The man was now sitting up, thinking he had just come across some prime real estate. I got to get me some of that. I mean the God Emperor approves of it. So that must mean that everyone is going to get it, realizing that he may be late. Oh no, I need to phone up now and see if I could get some of that nice looking skylight. Of course the man fails to notice the next advertisement that rolls around. That would no doubt intrigue him some more. This same man was an avid basketball player as well within his free time, especially when hanging out with his friends, and they played off against each other in friendly games. The screen cuts to another advertisement, and it starts to play some generic hip-hop music within its background. The very same man from before, dirty blonde hair and purple eyes was on a court bouncing the ball all around that very same old man, with pasty white, baggy and wrinkly skin, and with a robe on. Why would this old man play against the Emperor? And why would he also do so while wearing robes is anyone's guess. The God Emperor of the Emperor went straight for a dunk and smashes the glass. The old man has a heart attack from the cool factor and multiple various girls. Whether they were human or alien, all were good looking, started to shake their bums for the camera because sex sells. The God Emperor looks towards the camera, smiles, then winks. You can dunk just like me with sky shoes. They make you feel like you're walking on air. The God Emperor is then surrounded by the girls before his wives now come into the shot and kick those whores away from their husband as they were in skimpy cheerleader outfits. The God Emperor gives his advice. Oh, and don't forget to be loyal now. They all start to walk away as the skimpily dressed girls pushed and pulled away from the Emperor by his wives, just stared at him leaving inside. The camera then fades to black as the man that was just ordering the drink just saw the ending part of the advertisement. No, I need to get those as well. This same thing would happen throughout many, many homes within the Emperor and Skywalker industry subsidiary companies that produce these products would be inundated with requests and orders for these very things advertised. Husbands, father, brothers, nephews, all men were probably in some way hassled by the females that lived with them, that were either their mothers, wives, daughters, or nieces about their overwhelming desire to get that stuff. They wouldn't stop them, no. In fact they would have liked to support the Emperor as well. But it was just that they didn't want their men to suddenly just go all crazy over some silly pairs of shoes or some alcohol. Given that the shoes and alcohol were endorsed by the God Emperor however, 
They knew that it would allow them to finally become drunk again. The super serum was super effective after all, and it near completely disabled the people's ability to poison themselves. But now there was an alternative to that problem, which was the super serum, and now a replacement for something they had lost. Anakin had created a problem through the super serum, and then was selling the solution as well. It was certainly a dastardly prospect for something like this to happen, but no one within the Emperor cared at all. Their Emperor wouldn't just do this to harm them or take advantage of them, and even if he did, he deserved something in return for his efforts in bettering their lives. It was something they would gladly look away from and accept it. Again, Anakin was taking advantage of the situation some people within the Emperor is in, and because of this others would try to look into this as well. Skywalker Industries could still grow, but so could its competitors try to grow as well, given that the business world is like that. It's better if he gives some encouragement in the form monopolizing the market for a short while, then does other companies created from within the Emperor and would do something similar. He also didn't just make these things at a high price either, as that would just be silly. He didn't want other businesses to get the great idea of trying to scam their customers for more money. That was something that he was already aware of within his previous life, and it even happened within the Galactic Republic as well. Making new brand exclusive, increasing the price, which would also increase one's accumulative wealth built on the backs of their workers and customers. It was a dangerous game, but Anakin would try and manipulate everything so it doesn't get out of hand, because at the end of the day, companies still needed to make a profit. While the Emperor was now officially the true ruler over the Arcanist Sector, which Anakin would promptly get requests to change the name of into the Skywalker Sector, they would start looking at their other areas. Shamel, where Nabu is in Queli, where Dathomir is. From Nabu, a lot of reinforcements were sent through them to start occupying planets, and taking over sectors from their system. Unfortunately, they couldn't take over the one other system within the Shamel sector, because it is under the Republic. However, Anakin didn't mind this. First was Anuk, a major trade world located at the confluence of several hyperlanes that connected mid-rim worlds between the Hydean Way and the Corellian Run. It was an end point of the Anarch run, and a jumping off point of trade and travel to the Outer Rim territories. No one currently held any sway over this system, so the Emperor would gladly take it for themselves. Then came the Aliwi system was a star system located within the mid-rim region of the galaxy. It didn't have much, but it could be used for some things since it was on the trade route. Within the Quelly sector, that of which Talzin is in charge of, the Emperor had been helping the Dathomirian queen named Talzin and took over Katha, the homeworld of the Katha species, filled with many ecological niches and huge insect predators. This place had quite the place, and Katha would be turned into something similar to what Dathomir is like. Then the last place for takeover was Vinceth, the home planet of the Chevin and Chev species in the Quelly sector of the Outer Rim territories. It was a temperate planet with zones of grasslands and prairies, arctic ice, and deserts. It was here that there may have been some contention with the Separatist movement, since this planet did come under their space. However it wasn't occupied or under their control, so Anakin thought it prudent to grab to increase the influence the Emperor has over the Quelly sector. After all of this is settled however, Anakin waited to have some downtime. So some downtime he would have meaning that he would be doing nothing much. He had after all just been doing some advertisements. That if Sidious was smart enough would see the message. Of course, Sidious may not actually see the message within those advertisements. Because it wasn't like he was interested in stuff like that and most of his time was taken up by other things. Anakin did however want to reveal to them that he knew about Sidious being a Sith Lord. If only to make him be even more cautious as Anakin had just shown the might of his Emperor through the actions taken. And now he has an even larger army now. It would certainly be interesting. But he would be focusing on his family for a small bit now. I think that is enough for now. I can start expanding again, once the refugees from Hut Space start making their way over to the Emperor. Anakin thought to himself, it was a fine day on Tatooine, as the suns that the planet orbited look as if they were in orbit around Tatooine. Like it was the center of the system, galaxy or even the universe itself. The people were going on with their own business, whether that going to their jobs or otherwise going out to enjoy the freedoms and liberties that the Emperor provides for its people. Everyone was generally having a role right enough time as is, and they were also in quite the festive spirit as well. One doesn't just simply build a culture and society within a day. And it requires festivities to take place as well. Religion is also quite normal, but traditions that families would pass on from generation to generation should become a part of a society. Without traditions, the culture doesn't have common things to connect people together. So, in remembrance of Anakin and, or Vader helping the people, enslaved as they were rise up and fight against the Hut Empire created by Jabba, the Hut was certainly something to remember. Then there was Anakin's birthday itself, making it something that everyone celebrates in, even when it was just another normal day. The people sought to make it something special. Then there was a tradition that involved Anakin going and leaving the Emperor and the date of his return recorded to symbolize a person's journey and growth into becoming an adult. Sometimes a person would have to leave their home to go somewhere else foreign and grow there. Anakin's birthday was a religious event. The slave rebellion celebration was a public holiday. Anakin's leaving and return is another religious and cultural tradition. And finally Anakin's coronation is considered a brand new holiday for the people. Public holidays exist, and a lot of it somehow involves Anakin. Then for every planet, they had their very own separate events in accordance with their own culture and history, along with the additions of the cultural and religious traditions, starting from Tatooine and Anakin. Not everywhere would have the exact same events, but everyone would have all of the events that included Anakin to some extent, and if it was a holiday, 
then it was allowed. Another festivity had come into play however, as the people were now celebrating what is being called the end of slavery. The end of slavery being a new event all starting because of Anakin and those within the Emperor, putting in the work to overcome this once and for all. Well, at least slavery that is out in the open, is no doubt slavery still happened behind closed doors, especially in areas outside of the influence of the Emperor or hut space. Hello, Anakin called out to see if anyone was there. He knocked on the door again, as he was within the Sky Palace, awaiting whoever is behind this door to come out and greet him. Is she asleep? He thought to himself as he was waiting for the person who he had made plans with today to come out but it would seem that she was either still asleep or was hesitating. He could always just barge in. But then that would just be something silly, now wouldn't it? But we wait. A feminine voice was heard from the other side, and she seemed to be panicking, and from Anakin could hear, she seemed to be in a rush to get to the door, but was otherwise doing other things instead, specifically trying to rush and put on some clothing, or from what he could tell some very minor applications of makeup. He didn't mind makeup, but much rather preferred someone's natural face. But it would seem that the woman on the other side didn't know of this or didn't want to come outside to meet with him without some assurances, that he would be attracted to her face. Not that, that would matter considering most if not all of the women around him were extremely attractive already. Opening the door, it is finally revealed to be Xana, the Sith woman rescued and brought back to life by Anakin from Hell, otherwise known as Chaos. I am ready, she very cutely said as she seemed to have been in a rush. Her clothing seemed to be okay, and accentuated her curves and other physical parts that Anakin would take an interest in. She had some minimal makeup as well, also given that she doesn't have the same face paint that she had in her first life. It was clear to see her beautiful features. Are you sure? Anakin was smiling as it would seem that Xana was willing to make some form of an effort when going out on a date with him, formally that is. Anakin reached out his hand and tucked away some of her hair that was a bit messy. Oh, she realized this and had a small blush adorn her features, which only made Anakin think she looked even better. There, already then. Since this is your first actual date, I have decided that instead of going all out like a person usually would, we should try some of the basic people do. How does that sound? Anakin would have taken her to do things she would have liked to do, which was probably destroying things or otherwise getting into spas or fights with others. He wouldn't have minded doing something like that with her, but that isn't exactly what constitutes as a normal date, and she hasn't had a relatively normal life before. What with her being a Sith Lord before her death, and then being dragged out of hell by Anakin not just because he wanted to, but he had his own reasons. Well, if that is what you say it is going to be like, then I guess it is fine. Deep down, Xana very much appreciated that her first date would be considered normal. She did want to dotty things those other girls she taught within the academy did. Which may or may not include some special alone time with Anakin afterwards. But wherever it may go, she would probably either be happy or bored. Given that everything would be a new experience to her, she has no doubt that she would probably be not bored, especially with Anakin around. If she told Anakin that she was bored with these normal girlish things, then he would probably resort to plan B. That being some pre-planned things that he knew she would have liked to do. Not that Anakin would tell her that, of course. Shall we? Anakin held out his arm as she also grabbed on, and they would go on throughout the rest of the day, enjoying and spending time with each other. Their relationship getting a little better as a result. Sheev Palpatine, the Supreme Chancellor of the Galactic Republic, Dark Lord of the Sith as Darth Sidious, was not amused. Not amused in the slightest as he had received some reports about the Emperor and having a big but very short-lived war with the Hutts. It wasn't hidden away from anyone, and in fact he would say that this was done publicly on purpose, to make sure that everyone knew of the Emperor's power. It was done at the correct timing as well because the Republic was thinking that they could just and bring the Emperor under their own control. They knew of the Emperor's power, but it wasn't like they couldn't pull on the other senators or systems within their reach's power to go after them and forcibly make them comes under the Republic. Some of the people were thinking that they could do it even when he, Sidious himself had suggested that they don't. He didn't mind if they tried however, because who knows what will happen, and instead he was going to wait for them to amass, and then force the peace-loving Emperor to help them win against the Separatists properly, instead of just using them for funds by selling them droids. Some people were upset as they could see what the Emperor was doing. Not that they could really do anything because at the same time they were also grateful. There was no telling how long this civil war would have lasted, so too was Sidious kind of banking on the Emperor, allowing them to buy mass amounts of droids to make up for their clone's deficit. Not that the clones made up the entirety of their armies. Now that the Emperor has kind of shown its true colors everyone within the galaxy knew to stay clear of the Emperor and whatever they wanted. While there may not have been any real conflicts between the Emperor or those within the Emperor to any one other organization or government within the galaxy, that didn't mean they would just stop their conquest at the huts. Those that were more political or just had a keen sense of the politics of what was going on from within the galaxy, could tell that the Emperor was making moves that may only seem as the natural course of action, but they had planned this. The Emperor was a much scarier opponent than Sidious had at first thought, and he was starting to consider that he would be more wary of Anakin now. Now he would look very deeply into any of the actions taken and words said by the Emperor of the Emperor, simply because of this massive event. That has changed the landscape of relationships within the galaxy. Everyone will be looking towards the Emperor and hoping that they come over to their side, because they were an intelligent enemy that no one wanted to face. 
So for now, everyone would hold their breath around the Emperor, simply because they have risen to power so fast that it is quite insane. They now fully control the Arcanist Sector. Sidious thought to himself as he gazed at the holographic map displayed in front of him, that gave him a view of the entirety of the known galaxy. Even some more undisclosed systems or planets not give out to the public to see, as not every piece of information was exactly public knowledge. With the Arcanist Sector completely under the Emperor's control and even Hut Space now falling under the control of the Emperor, while not officially, it was a puppet state and Sidious could very clearly see that. They had massive power and control over trade, and even over the hyperlane spaces and orders or rules were given to both the Republic and Separatists, that they were not to fight, while within both the borders of the Emperor and Hut Space. Completely natural and normal since no one would want to turn their home turf into a battlefield, just because some foreign powers were at war. This would both be great and bad for Sidious, as he didn't want to prolong the war for too long, and instead wanted to end it at the right timing, so that he may gain complete and total control over the Senate. Once that happened he would become an emperor himself, the emperor of the Galactic Empire, Emperor Palpatine. It has such a nice ring to it. These thoughts encapsulated the joy that Sidious would get out of achieving his goals. Goals that had become harder once again, because of the Emperor and all was it all along, because of the pesky Chosen One, it was certainly something to think about a little more, whether or not Anakin's status of the Chosen One was interfering with his plans, just as his now dead master had said he would. Or it was just the fact that Anakin was something that went against what he was working towards, and is very easily arguably the better of the two options for an Emperor. Palpatine was creating some backup plans for himself in case of failure, because he was starting to see that because of the Emperor's developments, the people within the Senate are not precisely going in the direction that he wants. It was like if everything was being taken out of his control and put into the hands of another. The boy must die. He thought to himself as he looked at the image of Anakin. That was extremely good looking. Sidious was now planning to take down the Emperor, by taking down its leader, because without the head, the snake would die. Once Anakin is taken care of, there would probably be some problems from the Emperor, but it would naturally be all okay. He has had enough of trying to bring Anakin under his control, and was already looking for another apprentice, someone that wouldn't be like Doku, and instead would be both an easy to manipulate pawn and powerful force user. He had many options in trying to infiltrate the Emperor, and trying to kill Anakin and poison is one such method. Of course Palpatine didn't know that this wouldn't work even if he managed to get Anakin to drink some poison. Anakin is immune after all. And if that didn't work, he would start to send some assassins that Dooku had been training, something that may prove to be of some more difference, but would probably still be relatively easy to take care of by Anakin. One man cannot defeat many. Sidious knew the powers in numbers, and believed that if he sent many to attack Anakin at the same time, he wouldn't be able to resist and would die, that is if his poisoning attempt would fail. If all else fails, in the end it would better if he tried to take care of Anakin himself. Something that Palpatine was starting to believe in more and more, is that sometimes you have to care care of your own problems, because others are too incompetent at doing so. If you want something done right, then you should do it yourself. Of course this would expose himself to everyone, no doubt the boy would expose him at that point, but at that point, he would have to kill Anakin, because this take care of his competitor. Then there are those that he was considering to take under his wing as an apprentice, and he had a few options that would be interesting. Ferris Owen was someone that Palpatine had been trying to mess around with, especially after he had left the Order because of reasons, one in particular being Anakin. Something that Palpatine and Ferris had in common. Then there is the bumbling buffoon known as Jar Jar Binks. Believe it or not, Jar Jar was actually Force-sensitive without even knowing that he is, and because he was such an easy pawn to manipulate, and one could see his luck, which is Jar Jar's application of the Force subconsciously to help himself. Then there are another prospective replacement, Garth Ezra, who Palpatine had only very recently discovered during the current times. He had taken Garth in and was currently training him in the dark side of the Force, which he already was learning in, before Garth killed his previous master, because she betrayed him. Garth is inadequate though because he wants someone stronger than Darth Duranus. Of course, there was one of senior administrative aides known as Sly Moore, someone that he had kept close to himself, both with the allure of the dark side and because she seemed to have some attraction to Palpatine, not that he all that cared, and instead he was using her for something in the future he wished to try. Now however, she may be more useful as a proper apprentice, but her power is inadequate for his needs. So his choices were between Jar Jar who actually had a very powerful connection to the Force or Ferris Olin, who was said to be a rival of Anakin's, meaning that he was also properly powerful as well. Or he could make them both his apprentices, and break the rule of two at the same time keep Tyrannus for now as well, since Tyrannus also held no concern for the rule of two. Choices, 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 let's have some time alone shall we? Anakin asked the question to Shark, whom was considered the loner of the group, and it was all self-imposed. But she wouldn't mind just having Anakin around, really. She asked in a tone that was quite seductive, as usually when the two spent some alone time with each other, it would somehow end in a bed where they would do some very exhausting activities well. Exhausting activities. That would mainly exhaust Shark as Anakin had stamina that is unending. And I don't mean having some of our alone time. 
I mean that we should do something else other than doing it all of the time we are with each other. Anakin said as while he didn't mind, he is sure that a relationship built solely off of sex wouldn't last. What are we going to do then? Shark didn't have much concept about how a romantic relationship is supposed to be like, and she had just decided to marry Anakin because she loved him. Simple, but not exactly prepared is she for a bond of that level. So you have not done much. No shopping or going out into Tatrine and just exploring the city or anything else. Anakin was not too surprised, but it still did seem weird. She didn't even at least try activities outside of her comfort zone. It is fine to have one and all. But with the level of isolation she has it only made sense why she didn't put much thought into leaving the Jedi. In fact, her unattachment to anyone within may have played a key factor in her leaving, and her attachment to Anakin was all she needed to leave. The thing, however, is that she also upheld the Jedi ideals for a long time, before he had come to start transforming the way she thought about things through either discussion or him simply being there. What do you mean? I think that I have done an adequate amount of stuff during my lifetime. Shark responded, seemingly offended that Anakin would say she was inexperienced. Well, she was inexperienced when it came to certain factors which was something that surprised Anakin, but at the same time, it really shouldn't given her character. She did have experience in other matters, an example being her skill with a lightsaber, and not in that way but a genuine lightsaber. She was heralded as someone that was kind of unmatched with the saber in combat with a saber of course of her own generation. Now she would most certainly give even Dooku and Yoda a run for their money in saber skill alone. It is a good thing that Anakin likes to stay trained and up to date on his skills, which in turn helps the others as well. All of his women kind of use him as a training droid instead of actual training droids, and he can see why they would, because he always mops the floor with them. He had been trying to hold himself back, but at some point his very, very smallest amount of power level is still enough to equal all of those he is bonded to at the same time. Sometimes there would be days where Anakin gathers all of them to fight him at the same time, something that seemed to increase as the days went by. It would seem that they all enjoyed trying to beat his smug face up together more often than not, and even then, they would still lose. He would sometimes even say, yes, let all of your hate fuel you and he would chuckle madly like some sort of supervillain. It was certainly an interesting experience. Of course you are experienced, more so now that you have spent time with me. Anakin smiled at that as he could see she was a bit shy at his statement. However, you don't really go outside to see the world, and while I don't want to force you to do anything, I am only here to suggest that maybe we could do something other than trying to make babies. Don't get me wrong. Anakin made a gesture and pulled her closer to himself. I wouldn't mind continuing with those activities if you so desire. However, that is on the condition that you try to do some of the normal things girls usually like to do. Anakin continued. Like, Shark questioned fully anticipating such a thing, having no hesitance at all when Anakin talked about the reward she would get if she complied. But she wasn't about to stop the negotiations early. She was going to milk him for everything he's got, or at least die in pleasure trying. Wait, bad thoughts. Save that energy for later tea? Shark thought to herself as she was being a little pervert. Well, things like going on a date, even just having me follow you around as you buy things in the shops, then forcing me to carry said things. Isn't that just sound so intriguing? To be honest, Anakin didn't want to do something like that, because it was a pain, and while he didn't exactly consider it a waste of time, because one was spending time with a loved one, that didn't mean that very same time couldn't be used to do something of greater importance. You know I am not like other girls. I would never really want to do those things. Shark said, not like other girls. Anakin raised an eyebrow as this seemed to be a play on how women somehow always thought of themselves as unique in some way, when they may very well be a basic bitch. Of course not, but I do, do things differently and you know this. Shark replied, I do. He nodded his head in reply. Then, if you really insist that I try some things that regular people do, I could try it out. Only for you however, since you seem to be so worried about me being a loner. No, I know that you have friends and confide in the others, but that doesn't mean that I dislike what you do. That would just be silly of me and kind of contradictory right? I know that being the Emperor of the Emperor isn't exactly what a lot of you would have liked for me. Anakin knew that the girls didn't exactly want him spending time on being the Emperor, but because he manages his time extremely well, and has access to using multiple thought processes, he is able to make time for all of them. Not just make time, but even have extra time of his own to do his own things because he wouldn't be spending every minute of his day with one of them, and neither would they spend every waking second being around him. That would just be silly, as it may be somewhat true that their worlds revolve around him in a sense like a star that creates its own gravity. That doesn't mean they don't have things of their own to do. Well, that is only obvious. I think the difference here is that you are able to make time compared to other successful men. It is hard to do what you do and I know of this, and so does everyone else. Shark responded before putting her hand on Anakin's check. Is it really that bad that I don't want to go and do things everyone else likes doing? She had a fake expression on her face that spoke of disappointment and hurt. That won't work on me. Your acts are pitiable compared to the faces Padme is able to pull off. Anakin thought of her act as cute. Well, D.U.H. Tilbert it is only natural that she has a better poker face than I. She is after all the person who has delved into the world of politics, while I am just an antisocial Jedi. No, not Jedi anymore, but instead an antisocial force sensitive. Shark replied, You know that I don't care too much in the end, 
but you are somewhat something that doesn't make any sense. Anakin said, oh, and how do I not make sense? Shark said nodding her head. Logically speaking dash, Anakin started only to be interrupted. No, 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 none of that. Come, let's go back into my room and allow me to suck that tense energy out of you. Shark started to pull him into her room, not caring about anything else and having one goal in mind. Sighing, Anakin gives up on trying to make her more social, because it would seem that there really was no problem, I guess. Whatever, I think I have had enough of trying to talk you into doing something, and it is obvious that you only want to do these things with me, or otherwise doing things with the Force. I love you Shark, just the way you are. Anakin said all of a sudden, that stops her right in her tracks as they were going deeper into her room. She turns around to gaze into Anakin's eyes, eyes that she would stare into for eternity. But she was just being dramatic here. Can you say that again? She looked to him and wanted to hear those words again. It was because it was rare for Anakin to say the words I love you. He much preferred expressing his feelings through his actions, because words don't exactly do it for him. While it was something that women in particular said all of the time, mostly about everything as well. Not that they actually love things to the same level, but it was still something to take note of. Really? Anakin asked. Shark only nodded her head and awaited for Anakin to give in to her request. He sighed, before saying it once again, just as she had requested as it wasn't really that hard to say these words. But it wasn't something he wanted to say all of the time as well. I love you. I love you too. Shark smiled as she then started to drag him over to her bed. And I am sure that you will love me more for what is about to happen next. I am sure that I will well that was interesting. Obi-Wan said as the Jedi that had left on their trip to Tatooine had just come back, as they were taking their sweet time coming back. They may have left immediately, but before they were given any orders or created their own orders to follow when it came to the war, there was nothing. They may have known about the war between the Separatists and the Republic was now back to full scale, but they were taking their sweet time coming back. None of them within wanted to exactly go back to war again, especially after they were not ties to anything, and just explored what it was like on Tatooine. Mace was even swayed into wanting to stay, while the others also had similar thoughts of wanting to stay there. It was alluring. Something that drew them in was the balance and vibrancy of the life and force of the planet. This group Yoda, Yaddle, Mace Windu, Qui-Gon Jinn, Obi-Wan Kenobi, Quinlan Vos, Luminara and Julian Plo Koon, were in for a shock and surprising return. Specifically they would receive word that the Emperor had somehow went to war within the short two weeks, they had stayed on Tatooine, and then their short delayed trip back, where the Emperor would then proceed to win. Yes, Qui-Gon responded as they hadn't received any news, but as soon as they got back, it was as if their communication devices started to explode with the messages sent to them. Anakin had deliberately sabotaged their communication for the short time it would take the Emperor to take over the huts. It was done because he didn't exactly want them to turn back around, and then start demanding explanations from him. Not that he would give them one, but it was one less headache to worry about, especially now that he had won and had done so with minimal lose to life. Well he is your apprentice Master Windu. Qui-Gon wanted to shirk the blame of helping raise Anakin in a sense all to Mace. What? No, I think it is best that he was following in your footsteps. Mace of course gave that responsibility right back, as if they were the ones that had lead to Anakin doing this. Enough, I think this is. Yoda finally spoke up as he started to rub his forehead at the things they had discovered. Contemplate, need not Skywalker's actions. Emperor and problems separate they are from the Republic. At this point Yoda has had enough trying to keep tabs on Anakin, because it would seem that they were failing at even that. He would rather that they focus their efforts of the war between the Separatists and Republic while simultaneously trying to use their restored or slowly restoring foresight abilities to identify the Sith Lord within the Senate, that Dooku had spoken about. I think that I will go back to my quarters now and start contemplating my life choices. Quinlan said and started to head off without so much as a proper goodbye, where Luminara also started to slowly walk away from the awkwardness of the situation. Right, I just remembered that I have some things to do dash Obi-Wan seeing what the other two Jedi Masters had done, tried to get away himself, only to be stopped by Qui-Gon. Oh no you don't. I think that you will be needed in some other things, the war is back on don't you know, Qui-Gon said in a no-nonsense tone, sighing, Obi-Wan replies, okay, right, Master Qui-Gon Jin is, Master Obi-Wan Kenobi, be redeployed you will, Yoda said, right, Obi-Wan didn't seem too enthusiastic at this declaration, the rest of the time, they would all regain their bearings, and Yoda would go into a small meeting with both Qui-Gon and Mace, so that they could discuss some things in private, specifically to do with Anakin, while Plo Koon and Jaddle went their own directions, with their own thoughts on the matter, especially Master Yaddle, that was contemplating what she should do, specifically she was questioning herself and what she was doing within the Jedi. She would some time later have an epiphany that going to and joining the Emperor in Order was probably the best course of action. This would come from the Force itself, and she would go there later, her role undetermined in the grand scheme of things. Then there is Plo Koon who had similar thoughts, but was mostly focused on Ahsoka's well-being, and could see that she was fine. He did however have a feeling that things were going to change, and the Force wasn't the one that was going to remind him. Obi-Wan was sent back to continue his job out on the battlefield. Luminara and Quinlan both had their own thoughts specifically to do with Ilar and Barris. Did Quinlan really not want to be there for his surrogate daughter, 
And did Luminara really not want to be around what she had started to consider as family? Only time would tell, and how their thoughts would start to affect their actions within the Order, whether this lead to them leaving and convincing others to leave with them, or to become staunch in their beliefs within the Jedi Order. Anakin had amassed a large amount of militaristic forces at this point, meaning that he could continue his current campaign, taking over and making use of more planets and hopefully shrinking the gap between the Emperor's mainland and its other, what was considered colony systems. The Koagra system was the only star system located in the Grohl sector of the Outer Rim territories, meaning that after the Emperor had taken it over, this sector is now considered proper Emperor space and territory. It would become another trade world, a center of trade just like the others that were taken. The next sector after this would be the sector that the Kaminans come under, which would mean that Anakin would have to be careful when taking this sector for the Emperor. Technically, the Kaminans aren't a part of the Republic at all, and if he happens to become their leader, it would mean that the Republic really is relying on the Emperor for everything, even their future endeavors where they could have future clones. First things first, the worlds and systems taken over are... Teos, a planet in the Arian sector of the Outer Rim Territories, completely covered by grasslands. Teos is considered to hold strong potential as a future agricultural planet, which means that it would become another place allowing for the growth of food for the Emperor. It was a planet that was strange, since it had some ties to both the Republic and Separatist, but wasn't actually considered a part of none of these factions, meaning it is ripe for the taking. Next is Rune, a planet located in the nearly impenetrable Cloak of the Sith. Known for its rune stones, the planet was constantly sought after by treasure hunters for years. Located on the treeless trade route hyperspace route and the smuggler's route, mumbles turnaround. This place would be perfect to start increasing the value of the Emperor and its currency yet again, meaning that their economic power would increase yet again. This planet and system could only be a place where Anakin could house more people, and also be a place where people may be able to strike it rich at discovering runestones, the precious crystal that this planet naturally produced. There were also some other minerals that could be extracted, so this was also a useful planet. Hefi, the next planet located in the Hefi system of the Abrian sector, within the slice portion of the Outer Rim territories. Covered by land masses and oceans, Hefi's surface featured very climate and was capable of supporting various forms of humanoid life. Nothing much here, and is just another boring world to add to the collection. Who knows? It might become something, but for now it would just be another colony system for the Emperor to develop more to see what it holds. Abrian Major was an astronomical object located in the Abrian Major system, a part of the Abrian Sector in the slice portion of the Outer Rim Territories. Abrian Major served as the capital of the Abrian Sector, and the latter was represented in the Galactic Republic's Senate by Senator Essa Ritzino, who held from Abrian Major. In fact, it was the year before current times that Ritzino tendered her sector's Articles of Secession in that day's Senate session, thereby withdrawing the Abrian Sector, which contained more than 200 agriwolds from the Republic, and would have folded into the Separatists. The reason she didn't was exactly because the Emperor was so close, that it would be silly of her to not join them instead. And join she did. The next planet and system that folded into the Emperor's ever-expanding spatial borders was in Chusi, a planet in the Abrian sector of the Outer Rim territories. It didn't have much and is much like the system of Hefi, which may or may not produce anything within the future. Absence was a desert planet that hosted a factory belonging to Siena Fleet Systems, or at least it used to belong to the Siena Conglomerate, before Anakin had it demolished from within. Never again would this company and those connected to it would thrive. That was a while ago though, so this place was all Anakin's or more precisely, it is all for the taking for the Emperor. It would be used in a similar manner, a test site. Science and technology would be the main factors of focus for this planet and system. In doing this, Anakin was able to take over many planets and systems, whilst having everything come one step closer to the unification of this sector. Anakin owned 42% of this sector, so obviously with a bit more time and consolidation, would the Emperor swiftly take the rest of this sector. Unfortunately there were no sectors nearby to where the Arcanist sector that is at the same level of the Arcanist sector, as there were none nearby, and anything else was further out, and not really within one spatial area. None had the absolutely packed chock full of planets or systems. In fact most systems were quite bare bones, what with very little star systems and planets. And that is why Anakin was mostly interested in taking over sectors that had a large degree of planets and star systems. Clusters were better as while well, it may take longer to fully explore and develop a clustered sector, its long-term benefits could be seen with the Arcanist sector becoming something near impossible to stop. You know, I think that you should have informed people that you were going to war. Specifically inform those on Naboo. Padme said to Anakin within the throne room, Oh, I didn't want to involve your peaceful people. So I decided that it would be best if I just went ahead with the plans I had. I had a feeling, distinct feelings that there are spies in Naboo as well. Anakin replied, Spies? Huh? Padme said, Yes, spies. While Naboo now be under the control of the Emperor, that doesn't mean anything when your people, well, the culture of Naboo is different from Tatrayan, and most of the rest of the Emperor. Anakin explained. He continued, There is also the fact that I know the Separatists and Republic are using Naboo as a place to try and spy on the things happening with the Emperor. I allow this because it gives them, no, me a way to trick them if I need to. If I didn't keep Naboo in the dark, just like most others, it would probably end up with me having to explain myself to the Republic, who seem to have a vested interest in the Emperor. Vested interest? Padme asked, curious. Yeah, Yes, vested interest. There is a reason I didn't stay within the Republic as a Jedi, and while I would have left either way, 
There are still more reasons on top. I am sure you must have noticed the corruption from within the Republic by now. Anakin said, Yes, the Senate seems to be corrupt, and here I had thought that I could change things if I stayed. Things only seem to be getting worse and worse, and I doubt I would have made much difference. Padme replied with a sad tone. Anakin got up from the throne and moved to the right where more thrones had been constructed for the Empresses to sit on. Of course it is all retractable, so there is only Anakin's and Padme's throne at this current time. You are not at fault, Anakin said. But Dash Padme was interrupted. No buts. I think that you are looking too deeply into things, and instead you should simplify how you look at things. Anakin stopped her. Look at it how? She asked. I may not tell any of you some things, which does mean I hide things. But that doesn't mean I lie. Anakin said before continuing. I think I could tell you now, especially since you have better control over your mind and mental defenses, tell me what. Padme seemed to only have questions upon questions today. Well remember your great friend Supreme Chancellor Palpatine? I do. She nodded her head, not knowing where this is going. He is a Sith Lord, the Sith Lord that has been controlling everything. Of course, he had a master before, but it was a combination of Palpatine and his now dead master that had interfered and caused all of that panic on Naboo. Between you, your people and the Trade Federation. What? She was surprised and exclaimed. But Palpatine as a friend was a friend I have been light too. Yes, Arnie. She looked into his eyes and wanted to know more, as she had many more questions now. But things were starting to fit the puzzle pieces, and her mind was connecting all of the dots. We are going to fight against the Republic, is that it? She was wrong with this however. If things go good, then no. If things go bad, there is a chance that we may or may not fight the Republic as well. Then there is also Dash Anakin was stopped as Padme said. The Separatists. Padme finished for him. Yes. Anakin nodded his head as went to sit back down, because he was pacing just behind her chair as he explained things. Padme had been growing quite a lot recently, not in the physical sense as she has probably reached her peak physical status. But after some training, she did start to develop some muscle as well. No, Padme was going through growth mentally and spiritually as she was exposed more and more to the galaxy and its true colors. Not that she hadn't already known about some things. It was just that she was lacking when it came to the intrigue part of ruling, and when she became Empress, Anakin had been helping her in this regard. This is why she was able to develop even better skills when it comes to governing, than she did before. Padme also started to change her perspective on things, many things, especially when it came to the weird laws that have been passed, even that law about incest. While it was weird to her at first, she started to see why it wasn't outlawed, and that was because there was no negatives. Not after the super serum, if people wanted to start a family with their family. She still found it strange. But if even the people were not that afraid, and it was only accepting those that do things like that, then it was fine with her. She liked Anakin's freedom and liberty calls, and it could be seen within the Emperor's culture. There may not be many throughout the words that participate in this. But on the off chance that there is, then it should be allowed if they wanted. Who was she to stop them? Especially when there is no valid argument anymore to go against this. Anyway, the way Padme was starting to look at things was different from before. So, of course she was much more accepting of the actions taken by Anakin, even the big war that had just happened. Are we prepared for such a thing to happen? Padme had an idea of what the Emperor's military was like, but she was unsure if they were enough. We would not be able to go on the offense but we would most certainly be able to defend. You have seen the star map. I have focused on defense the most because I wanted the people to be secure from most things that would try and attack. Anakin replied. He continued, whether this be simple smugglers, pirates and brigands to an armada and fleets from the Republic and or the Separatists. Of course, there was the threats of the huts at first, but now I believe and think that we could handle the combined threats of them both. He further continued. Did you also know that the entire civil war is a farce that Palpatine has set up? What? She wasn't as surprised as before, but this was still a shocking revelation. How is this possible? I think that since I'm telling you these things, shouldn't we bring in the others as well? I do think it is time I tell everyone of what exactly is going on. Padme agreed with Anakin, and they would start to bring the others in. Even if they were busy, which they really weren't. Everyone that was coming in were loved ones to Anakin, and Anakin would be setting up a discussion later on to tell the rest of the leadership within the Emperor. Talzin may know some things, but she would also need to be informed about what is going on, especially since she is the one that really wants revenge against Sidious. Anakin would retell some things to everyone, with varying degrees of surprise from them, and then some questions, with Anakin answering and telling them many, many things. After a while everyone, having heard everything that Anakin had to tell them went back on their own way, given that they also had some things to think about now. Especially when it came to the Jedi, some of their previous home. They would surely struggle at least a little bit at this new information, especially knowing that it was Anakin pushing the Republic further into destruction, and then benefiting off of it. Not that what Anakin was doing is wrong, because they all agreed with his methods. What they were disliking, however, was that the Jedi Order was a threat to Sidious. Or more exactly, Sidious is a threat to the Jedi, and would take whatever chance he had to kill more Jedi. It was something that for some of them, they were anxious about. There may have been some Jedi that left for the Emperor in order, but it wasn't all of them, especially those that they cared about. Now that they were all alone again, Anakin had to ask. By the way, you don't seem to want to have a child or children, is there a problem? No, it is just Padme started and stopped, not sure of how to say this. Anakin got up and then made a gesture, using the force to pull her towards him, and he embraced her. Yes, tell me. 
Her words were muffled and really, really unintelligible that even Anakin couldn't hear her properly or what she said. I'm sorry, but could you repeat that? He asked as she seemed to be rather embarrassed rather than anything else. I want children. She all of a sudden exclaimed. Huh. What happened to Dash Anakin started only to be interrupted. Well, I got jealous and seeing Isla wanted me to have children as well. Ani. I want your children now, and I can't wait anymore. She had a good point. Padme felt silly for being a holdout, especially when she wanted to have children with Anakin as well. But because she thought the timing wasn't right, she would not go through with it. Sighing, Anakin says, You're silly, but you are my silly empress. He proceeded to kiss her on the lips and then proclaim, I love you, which made her blush before she proceeded to kiss him back with passion as well. I, I love you as well. Padme replied, Things were heating up within the Senate, something that was going out of the control of Sidious. For some reason he was starting to lose his ironclad grip on the power over the Senate, and his control was becoming unstable. Things were not looking up, and it was because Sidious wasn't putting on a show of good leadership, and then there was one of his aides, believing themselves to be the actual one in charge, further messing with Sidious' plans. There were rumors, rumors going around about how the Supreme Chancellor Palpatine was incompetent, because they hadn't come to peace or had won against the Separatist movement. Rumors that started within the underworld of the Republic, right in the heart of their capital of Coruscant. Anakin had taken over the underground for a reason after all, and now those people that were criminals reformed as they are, now work for him. Of course, unknowingly they work for him. Surely if they knew that he was the one in charge it would cause some problems, especially when people from the Republic, or more specifically from Palpatine, come looking for him. With these rumors floating about within the capital, even though from underneath the underbelly of the pure and pristine capital above, Sidious would have to investigate and destroy the source of these rumors. They were undermining his authority, and it could be seen within the Republic, as the Senate was starting to split off more and more from each other. Different factions were forming within, and how to deal with things was becoming harder and harder, even with Palpatine's ability to overturn everything he wants with executive power. Doing so all of the time, not before he properly established himself, would just lead to more and more discontent. This is not even to mention that the old man was distracted by other things, specifically things in relation to his desires and plans with the Force. With finding and training an apprentice and all sorts of other things, like Dooku and keeping an eye on this. Palpatine may be a genius, but there was a limit to even his mind, for he does not hold the same mental capabilities Anakin does. Of course, Palpatine's supposed incompetence is backed up by the fact that the clones that he allowed into the Republic were slowly being taken away. Meaning that his choices, whether they were good or not at the time, would only be meet with criticism, as his choice now seemed like a bad choice. Their clones were gone, and now they had to rely on the Emperor, something which only further served to create disorder within the Republic's Senate. A foreign power that held a massive sway in whether or not they continued the war surely would create doubts as to the leadership of Palpatine, especially since he was not the one to even suggest the Emperor and request their help. He had never even expected for them to step up to the plate themselves. Without going to the Emperor himself, and instead having them come to him, most would think that only showed the good relationship between the Supreme Chancellor and the Emperor, when in fact it wasn't like that at all. Everyone knew so as well, because the Emperor has very clearly been making waves of their own profit from this, and they didn't exactly keep it secret as well. They did it out in the open, which would only go to further undermine Palpatine as a leader, as he had to rely on others to help him. It has already been done with the Kaminans and their clones, but with it happening again with the Emperor left a bad taste in the Senate's mouths, so to speak. Now, if the Republic didn't have some level of troops they could try and muster, then that was fine. But because of the war, other systems and planets started to get involved as well. The Republic wasn't just about to completely just rely on the clones, but they would certainly be their main forces. Unfortunate for Palpatine it would seem that things were happening just at the right time from a certain perspective, but from his, they would take a turn for the worst. And things were only just getting started. Palpatine would have to do something, and something fast to make sure all of his plans don't get outdone, simply because people started to question his rule. He liked that no one was doing so before, but now that things were becoming unprofitable for those within the Senate. For those that were corrupt, it would only mean that Palpatine would have to be called into question about what he is doing about his incompetence and other factors gone into the current time frame. He may just very well reveal himself early and openly declare himself the emperor of a new galactic republic as soon as he could with the supporters he still had backing him and still sway to his ideals. Then there is the Separatists, which he could also swiftly bring back into the fold, making him probably the strongest military-wise within the Republic against all others. He fears though that there would be yet another civil war if he does this, and it would probably take longer to deal with this one. All of his work gone down the drain is what would happen, but he needed to see if he could still seize complete control. And it just so happens he is unable to do so, then he would conquest as much as he could. There is no one that could stop him, but for now, while he still has supporters, he would rather further consolidate himself and further implant the idea that he should be the emperor of their new regime. Do you know why I don't engage with you? Anakin asked this question posed to someone that was arguably left out of a lot of things, especially since she herself was starting to notice it herself. Master, I wish to know, Renala said as she bowed her head in deference. A show of submission towards Anakin, and she was starting to look older now. 
For Anakin had not given her immortality like he had to those he cared for, for those that were connected to him in a special way. He is aware that Rinala held some level of affection and desire for him, but it was nothing more than an obsession. It wasn't true love in the same sense that Padme was able to give to him, as she was different. Anakin and Rinala had been around each for a bit, and Anakin had never felt that connection, meaning that the Force didn't see them as compatible. Not that the Force could dictate who he wanted, but it certainly at least wanted to look out, if only in a minor way, for him. Your love is not love, it is an obsession, and you know this yourself. Anakin said as he gestured for her to take a seat as they were within the Emperor in order. E but dash it was as if she was trying to deny that it wasn't. But Renala knew deep down that what Anakin had said is true. She didn't actually love him, and instead just wanted him because he was attractive, and had taken her under his wing. He had not really done anything else to indicate his own attraction even if she knew that he had some level of lust towards her, it wasn't actual love but physical attraction. I cannot return or give you what you seek and desire. You are getting older now, and have more of your life left to you. You must give up your obsession especially since it is the key thing holding you back. Anakin explained as it was true that within the Force, because of this mental block she was unable to move on with herself. Not every woman in the world, the galaxy and universe, belong to Anakin. It is also vice versa as well, because Anakin didn't belong to every woman in the universe as well. Why? 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 It would seem that Renala was having a breakdown, as what Anakin had just said implied that she would never have him, not in the same way his lovers would have him anyway. Renala, calm down. This instantly got Renala too shut up as she obediently listened to Anakin's command. Sighing, Anakin continues, I am not sorry for this. I can't be, for your emotions are something that you have to work through. Whatever has happened within your life that has led you to this point, just know that I appreciate the things you have done for me. Really. It would seem that Renala was taking it better than expected, or at least others would expect, because Anakin knew Renala in and out, she would so very frequently be very, very open with him. Yes, really. Anakin really didn't want to seduce the woman, but she was so easily swayed by him and his force energy, drawn to it like a moth to the flame. But she would burn herself the closer she got to the sun, and Anakin needed to put a stop to this. So instead of a sun, he had become a light within her orb. A light bulb that would not harm her and at the same time reject any and all attempts at getting together with him, whether that be in the physical or emotional ways that she could. If she didn't develop a diet at this point, then it only went to tell Anakin that she was not to be included within his wives, but he could always allow her to stay within the family so to speak, as she could still be considered a part of the family. But it wouldn't be anything more. Nothing more than that. I I think I will think on what you have said, Master. Renal replied. And please stop calling me Master. I appreciate the sentiment. But I am not your Master is the only Master you should have is yourself. Anakin said with some exasperation leaking into his tone. Please, just call me Anakin. aaa dash Renala was having trouble saying his name. That is okay. We can talk more about this at another time. But I suggest that you do some meditation with what we are. No, what you should feel when it comes to real love. I may not be able to 100% know your experience but I have tried my best to know and understand. I ask of you to understand where I am coming from in return. Anakin said, Yes, mazed I mean AA yes. She gave up at the end and just decided to leave in this instance, as well hurt. It didn't make her go crazy at the thought of Anakin had just said. He had allowed her to continue being around him when she wants, just that it would never evolve into the level of desire that she would have wanted herself. Located at the peak of the southeast tower of the temple, this circular chamber granted its occupants a rare glimpse of Coruscant. The chamber itself existed in several incarnations over the years as the temple grew, expanded, moved, and relocated. However, the room has always kept the basic circular shape accessed by a single turbo lift, high arching windows, and a ring of 12 cushioned chairs for the members of the August body. Each of the stone seats were equipped with a holo projector that could be used when a council member was attending the meeting from a distant world. One of the earliest versions of the council chamber, erected 4,000 years prior to current events, was at the summit of a lone tower that stood at the center of a broad plaza. The simple chamber was equipped with a holo projector capable of displaying images in the center of the room as the council did during the examination of the Padawan massacre. This room would soon be abandoned in favor of another domed room located near another tower. Similar to the previous meeting room the chamber was made of dark stone with a large, polished rock at the center of the circle. It it was here that the Council banished the revanchist Mitra Surik, who had returned to Coruscant after the Mandalorian Wars. At the end of the trial, Surik drove her lightsaber into the center stone, and left the chamber indefinitely. Several years after this event the chamber would be lost as the Sith Triumvirate began the First Jedi Purge. The room would come into existence in its final, most recognizable form, after the temple expansion of 1000 years ago. Erected atop the council spire of the temple, the chamber was ringed by a small corridor set between the inner and outer sets of transparent steel windows, which granted a panoramic view of the cityscape. The hall was accessible only to the members of the High Council, and led down into the secured treasury room. A dedicated turbo lift ran up the side of the tower to deposit Jedi summoned by the Council into a small limestone lobby, which served as entry into the vaulted chamber. This turbo lift was specially crafted with Force-inspired dynamics, in order to accommodate Jedi of different species and size. The floor was decorated with a natural and circular motif symbolizing harmony and balance between the Jedi, the Council, and the Force. 
incorporated into the five pillars spread around the room with the supports and wiring for the reception and or transmission antennas that crown the spire. These antennas were responsible for feeding data to Jedi Command. Today, gather here to discuss Emperor in order we are. Yoda said to everyone within, Yes, Anakin has gone ahead to create his own order in an attempt to find harmony or balance within the Force. It would seem many others agree with his sentiments as many, many people come there. Mace said, Wise, young Anakin is. Yaddle spoke as she was starting to feel more and more inclined to go towards the Emperor in order. Especially since she was starting to feel a pull of sorts, a pull that comes from the force that everyone else may be feeling as well. With their foresight back in operation, they were now starting to feel the cry of the force, of the light side that them staying here was dangerous. Tumultuous. Many within the room were kind of surprised by Yaddle's input, because it was rare for her to speak. Is there something wrong with the Emperor in order? Of course it was Kai Adi Mundi that went up to the plate, and immediately wanted to know whether or not they would be taking care of the Emperor in order, or Anakin. Wrong. Yoda spoke, which immediately drew everyone's attention. Practice of the dark side, the Emperor in order does. Wrong. Yoda spoke, which immediately drew everyone's attention. Practice of the dark side, the Emperor in order does. What? People exclaimed, now knowing that Anakin Skywalker, their chosen one, would engage in such activities. Sure, they should have known that Anakin was different and had complaints with the Jedi, but he wasn't meant to switch alignment from the dark side to the light. Wasn't Skywalker meant to destroy the Sith, not join them? Someone asked amongst the chaos, and this definitely raised some eyebrows with people stopping for a minute to go over what they thought were meant to be Anakin's responsibilities. Bring balance to the Force, not leave it in darkness some would say. Another person walked into the room, this person being Jedi Master Qui-Gon Jinn, since he wanted to say something today. That would certainly bring shock to the people within. The Chosen One was the central figure in the Jedi Prophecy, that foretold the coming of the One destined to bring balance to the Force, by destroying the Sith. So potent would the Chosen One's power be that even the Father, one of the Three Mortis Gods, would seek to recruit Skywalker as his successor, believing that only the Chosen One had the strength to maintain the balance between his children, the son and the daughter, in the realm of Mortis. The Great Holocron contains many references to the prophecy of the Chosen One. A Jedi will come, to destroy the Sith, and bring balance to the Falls. Records are unclear about this prophecy's exact origin, or whether the above words were the actual prophecy or a concise interpretation. Several accounts indicate that the prophecy was the subject of debate as far back as 1200 years ago, but it may in fact be much older. Even more interestingly was the fact that possibly contradicting the above, or possibly reflecting the notion that the text in the Great Holocron was simply a concise interpretation rather than the actual prophecy, in Obi-Wan Kenobi within a few years from now would have said, I have scanned this prophecy. It says only that a chosen one will be born and bring balance to the Force. Nowhere does it say he has to be a Jedi. Most definitely interesting since the prophecy that the Jedi are so proud of was an actuality of falsehood, while in on itself, the chosen one may be real but they wouldn't exactly have to be a Jedi. In the end, whether it be right or wrong, the Jedi's interpretation everyone was in agreement that Anakin Skywalker was. No, is the Chosen One. Master Qui-Gon, do what do we owe the pleasure? Mace questioned, given that Qui-Gon's entrance was unexpected and even more so, that he would have been listening to what the Council were discussing. Oh, don't mind me. I am but a humble and passing traveler only overhearing what the High Council were talking about. Qui-Gon replied as he glanced at everyone, where Qui-Gon seemed to have been enlightened. Everyone there could feel it, sense it within the very force that something must have happened or occurred for Qui-Gon to feel so weird. No, please tell us of what you may mean. Plo Koon and most of the others, including Yoda, was interested in hearing what Qui-Gon had to say. I have scanned this prophecy the prophecy of the Chosen One, that we as the Jedi have not had much interest in. That was until Anakin came along. Qui-Gon said as he looked at everyone within the room. I have gone over the records within the Great Holocron, and I could only find mention that the Chosen One is meant to be born, and then bring balance to the Force. There is no mention of this Chosen One being a Jedi, neither is there no mention of this Chosen One destroying the Sith either. Qui-Gon continued, finally relaying what he had found. It was all he needed to know, before he would be making his final decision here today about why he is here. Impossible. The Jedi would never mistake such an important prophecy. Kai Adi Mundi had a lot of religious zeal for the Jedi and the Jedi Code, meaning that he even believed totally in whatever had come before as well. I am sorry to say this Master Mundi, but there is no record of anything but the mention of the Chosen One being born, and then bringing balance to the Force. Nothing. Technically this meant that there were a whole lot of other candidates besides Anakin, but he was the most likely. Hell, the Chosen One could very well be Yoda or Sidious themselves, since they are both extremely powerful at least when it comes to the Force. Similar prophecies existed among other galactic cultures. The celestial group known as the Ones, for example, had such a prophecy. But theirs focused instead on a literal balance in the Force, and required that the Chosen One succeed the Father, once the latter had become too old to continue restraining the Son and the Daughter. The embodiments of the Dark Side of the Force, and the Light Side of the Force respectively, is too much of either would spell disastrous consequences for the galaxy at large. Even the Night Sisters of Dathomir held to an ancient prophecy concerning a perfect being who would one day arise. The prophecy was made by al -Yar, an exiled Dark Jedi and the mother of all witches, whose daughters became the first crafters of spirit world magics. 
This chosen one would be brought into existence by the spirits, and would embody the balance between the winged goddess and the fang god. The Heidsnake cult, a separate dark side faction from the Order of the Sith Lords predicated on unrestrained chaos and anarchy, featured a similar interpretation of the prophecy to that of the Jedi Order. However, in their case, the prophecy entailed a black armored figure proceeding to lead the Heidsnake cult's army, to bring chaos to the galaxy, and that the figure would decapitate three snakes with two of them dying, while the third, symbolizing chaos, would be immortal. In the future, the Heidsnake cult believed the Imperial and missionary Darth Vader to be the armored figure, and considered both the Jedi and the Empire to be the two snakes that would die. However, this prophecy, in the end proved false when Vader wiped out the Hind Snake cult. I have not only looked at the Jedi's own prophecies, but also discovered other interpretations as to what the Chosen One could be or mean, and most of all, everything lines up to Anakin. I am not taking back my statement that he is the Chosen One, and instead would present further evidence of this fact. Qui-Gon said as he started to send through information about more obscure groups, force sensitives that were of course of their own religions and cultures. The Jedi were not prepared for what they were about to see. Too much, too much burning. Burning. It was like a sun. A star with an infernal grasp over the entirety of the universe, and as its mass expanded indefinitely, it would engulf everything within its own brilliance. A gasping sound is heard as we rejoin Anakin within his royal bedroom. Isla was next to him, but fast asleep, and she didn't seem to notice Anakin's making of sound or the movement of his body. What is that? Anakin was going over the records from with whatever he was dreaming. He may not need sleep, but he still sleeps anyway, and it would seem that he has discovered something interesting. His mind was taking him places that seemed to be telling him something, whether that be something the Force wants to tell him, or it is just his very own innate power to see into whatever it is that he sees. What Anakin was seeing through his dream was not like anything he had really seen before, and he did remember that what he is seeing seemed to be something important. This is one of the reasons he didn't to sleep. A problem that he knew the original Anakin also had was the problems with either falling asleep or meditation. Thankfully he had gotten a method to where he doesn't need to be in a proper meditative state to access all of the benefits that being in a meditative state can grant. He is even using one of his other four mental processes to go into this state, but he does so cautiously. I guess that means it should be soon now. Anakin was thinking about the next steps of what will happen. Getting out of bed, he started to pace around the room silently as Isla lay there with peaceful breath and movement. Anakin was not worried about Isla or his child to be, and knew that they were probably going to be fine. However, he didn't really want to leave and go places away from his pregnant wife. Of course, he could always take her along with him to wherever he is trying to go towards, but that isn't exactly a good thing. Now is it? The reason why he was contemplating leaving is because there is much to come and much to happen. Specifically he had still yet to meet the Mortis Gods, as Anakin considered them important, especially in regards to their connection to the Force. The son, representing the dark side of the Force, ultimate selfishness, and the daughter, representing the light side of the Force, ultimate selflessness. He was starting to see himself within his own mind, something that wasn't just him but a star. His dreams were a foreboding so to speak, a forewarning of something yet to happen or to come. He knew that the burning represented something, and he didn't like the implications that he would become something painful, especially since it was similar to the original story of course this could all be something the Force wanted to do, to further test him for or on anything. Whatever it was, Anakin knew that he was getting both closer and further away from what the Force wanted for him. It would still try to guide him and still fail because he wants to do other things, and it may want the Jedi dead. But at the same time, has he not already given it all the reasons it would need to allow them to live? They were being converted by him, or maybe there is something much, much deeper to what is going on. He doesn't know everything, but he was trying to understand just what being the Chosen One meant even though he didn't just go on to fully embrace this destiny. He thought that there are more important things to do, especially since his family was starting to form. Still pacing around his room, he stopped and then started to think about what he should do. I think. Sitting down on the ground, Anakin begins to float as he starts to go into a meditative state with his first consciousness. Well, come on then. Tell me just what you want to tell me. He sent out very strong pushes through the energy field that is the Force. There was no response however, and if Anakin had to put a feeling to the way the Force was acting, it was like a mischievous kid playing with a toy. Something that may be correct, but Anakin was slowly turning into something that was most definitely not a toy. It is entirely possible that Anakin could become something rivaling and possibly overtaking the Force. He could become the Force itself. Arnie, are you alright? Isla called out from the bed with a tired voice. Yeah. I'm good. Anakin got out of his meditative state as he was probably not going to get an answer, and if he wanted to advance further past his current point, he had to make progress. He may be starting to generating his own energy within the Force, and has even made his own version of the Living Force as well. Plus him having access to his own Cosmic Force as well, only meant that he had all of the necessary tools to continue down whatever path he is on. Are you sure? Isla could sense there was something, but if he didn't want to talk about it, then that was fine as well. You don't have to say if you don't want to. She was wide awake now, and it wasn't like that was a problem. Most people within the Emperor and don't need as much sleep as they used to, meaning that they could work longer, or do other things longer without feeling tired. All thanks to the Super Serum, as it truly did upgrade everyone's capabilities. No, it is fine for you to ask. It was just a dream, nothing serious or anything like that, but it was symbolic really. Anakin headed over towards the bed and sat down next to her. Symbolic how? Isla asked. 
I was a star ever expanding and it burned. As the star I didn't turn into a black hole the larger and larger I got, but instead started to encompass everything. And Anakin answered, are you not already a star doing just exactly that? She asked again, what do you mean? Anakin questioned himself, I mean exactly what I mean. A star that has his own planets orbiting him, me, Padme, Shark, Barris, Ahsoka, and Xana. Isla answered, I guess you could interpret it that way. Anakin could see her point. Yes, you can. Of course, I know it is more than that. But you as a star is also something important as well, isn't it? The Force is telling you that you will eventually become something greater than what the universe could handle, or I may just be making silly assumptions. Isla explained. There was a bit of silence before Anakin replied. That is something. Whatever it is. I may need to leave Tatooine and go somewhere, on the other side of the known galaxy. You have to leave? Isla questioned. I want to take you with me. No, preferably I want to take everyone with me. But that would just be silly. Anakin said. That does sound silly, but understandable. Tell me, is it important enough that all of us should go with you? Isla asked. In a way it is very important. No, extremely important despite it not seeming like it isn't. Anakin replied. Then just do it. Take every one single one of us with you. After a little bit of contemplation Anakin decides that there wouldn't be any harm in taking all of them with him to Mortis. In fact, they could all learn something while there, whether that be within the Force or not. Sighing, Anakin then replies. Okay, okay. I have a feeling that you just want me to take you guys with me, because you want to keep an eye on me. We can't be having you continuously forming dire bonds with every girl you meet now. A woman's instinct seemed to be very strong, especially in this instance since there is a woman on Mortis. But Anakin doesn't think she would be interested in any relationship. Right, Mortis was a planet enclosed in a monolith located in the remote Prolithian system. That was a conduit for the entire force of the universe. Mortis became home to the Ones, a family of powerful Force users, years prior to the Clone Wars. Time was experienced differently inside the Mortis monolith, than in the rest of the galaxy standard day's experience on Mortis. Mortis was a realm of the Force which contained dreamlike environments. It could not be mapped, and even its landmarks appeared in different locations frequently. The daytime was a time of peace during which luminous creatures moved about lush fields, green mountains, and stunning vistas. Dense forests, molten caverns, and floating mountains above the surface were among some of the different biospheres. The light had a healing quality, though it came from no star. When night fell the plants withered and died, the creatures vanished, and the few stars that shone in the black sky were unidentifiable. Scalding rain swept the terrain, making survival without shelter near impossible. Entrance to the realm was never voluntary, as Mortis drew in its visitors inexplicably. It manifested itself in different ways, Mortis was reported as having appeared as a massive monolith floating in space, other times individuals walked through a door or landed there without discernible reason. Time within Mortis had no meaning. What seemed like days or weeks within the realm passed within seconds without. And so the time has come. A voice spoke out. A masculine voice. Everything was going just fine on Tatooine. In fact everything was going just fine with the Emperor and overall. And it would seem that there was some amount of downtime. That could be taken from the hectic life of the Emperor, for at least a short while. Of course, there were many things to consider and worry about. But for now, none of that would impede what Anakin was gathering everyone for. And why exactly am I coming along? Xana asked in a half as she watched everyone start to load themselves, and whatever they wanted to bring along with them onto Jabitha. Jabitha hadn't really been used all that much, and she was starting a little lonely, which did resort to her sending out psychic signals from time to time because of boredom. Of course, their target wasn't to anyone in particular, and Jabitha made sure not to use the Force when using such signals. But instead she started to use it only with that psychic connection and nothing else. What Jabitha didn't know, was that by doing this she was attracting the attention of a planet, a living planet that was still around to hear those sorts of things. Because their distance apart was not so great as to be unable to connect. You are here because why not? Anakin replied to Xana as she seemed to be a bit upset, while surrounding by these other girls, especially since they were much more in line with the light rather than the dark. Well, there was one person among this group, other than Anakin, that could potentially go with away when it comes to alignment. That person being Padme. Really? That is your reasoning. Why not? Xana seemed to be exasperated. Wouldn't you feel sad if I went with everyone else? and then decided to leave you all by yourself. Here on Tatrian where you would just be teaching some snot-nosed brats or otherwise some other old students, that may be checking you out. Anakin was acutely aware of the appeal the women around him had, and they were also aware of his own appeal, that attracted the opposite gender as well, I guess. But that still doesn't change the fact that I don't, no, we all don't understand or even know of where we are going in the first place. Xana spoke. You can consider where we are going, is somewhere that is beneficial to everyone here. Something that will benefit everyone has in common, which is the Force. Anakin replied, not giving up where they were headed. I also think it is reckless to even bring along your pregnant wife. Xana spoke with some level of dislike, as she was the only one truly against this polyamorous relationship, that all of them seemed to be okay with. Oh, you think so? Anakin questioned, because he was also hesitant about this as well but decided that there was no danger as long as he was there. Which he would be and he was more worried if he left her here instead. Of course, I think so, and I believe that everyone else should think so as well. Given that it must be dangerous for a pregnant woman to go on any trip, especially since you still haven't told us where we are going. Xana explained. It is good that you believe yourself to be a part of the group. Using words like us, it truly shows your growth. 
Anakin cheekily smiled as he said this, which did make Xana a bit frustrated and flustered at the same time, because his smile was more than enough to attract her. You still haven't answered my question, Xana said. Right, I haven't, have I? Anakin said, stalling for some more time. But Xana doesn't like surprises, and instead would very much like to know where they are going. No, you haven't. Now, if you would please tell me where we are going. Xana even started to use some of her polite vocabulary to better butter up to Anakin. Okay, okay. Anakin decided that he was done with being mysterious about this, and called everyone the center of the living ship called Jabitha, before they took off for their destination. Isla, Chuck, Padme, Ahsoka, Barris, and Xana were all gathered, and were prepared themselves as Anakin had told them that they may be spending both a long and short time where they were going. It was confusing, but he told them to pass the time if they get bored. They should bring some things that would keep them busy. Not that there wasn't a lot of things to be gotten and discovered where they were going, as Anakin intended to use this place as a training ground of sorts for all of them. While most here would be using the dark side of this place, there was someone that would also be using the light side. Those aligned to the light would have to go to the dark, while those aligned with the dark would have to go to the light, meaning that Anakin would probably be the only one left out for now. That is until he decides to finally step in himself to see just what Mortis could provide him. What insights or connections to the Force it may bring for him and the others would surely be of great help for everyone. He didn't want to be the only one in balance within himself, and they should start to balance themselves out as well. If there is a well of the dark side, then there is surely something similar for the light side of the Force as well. Meaning that even Xana would benefit from coming to this planet, and then there is Padme who has not been influenced by either side. At least not yet that is. Anakin knew that it was strange, but Padme seemed to be leaning more towards the dark side of the Force, meaning that she was inherently more of the dark side than the light. That certainly wasn't the impression he would have gotten at first, but a lot of it did make sense. I mean, she was willing to die for me I know that may seem selfless at first, but this was incredibly selfish in nature. Anakin thought to himself as he regarded just what it meant when someone said they would die for you. That wasn't exactly healthy at all. Or if it was, then it wasn't because of selfless reasons that you would die for another, but instead are purely selfish desires. Padme was definitely more selfish than she seemed even with the original saying stuff like they shouldn't be together because they were both Jedi and Senator. Something that would never work out. But in the end, what did she do? She got married to the original Anakin just because he persisted. The more and more one thought about her actions, they were definitely not selfless in the least and were pretty selfish. Not that she was wrong to desire or want these things, but because she couldn't be more selfless, so to speak, the galaxy went into chaos. Because the original Anakin loved her that much. Tragic, or is it tragic? The flaws of these two individuals meant that it would always happen like this, for they would make the same decisions. Just as Padme, although influenced by this new version of Anakin, she had still decided to be selfish in the end as well. After explaining to all of the girls what was going on and where they were headed, they now held much more resolve in what is going to take place. A place that would be a test for all of them, something that would surely not backfire at all. The history of Mortis was strange, since 24,480 years prior to now, near approximate to now, the Ducksiders end the journey to Mortis and met the ones. However, he believed their claims on the nature of the Force had no more or less legitimacy than the teachings of any other force group. Also sometime before Anakin joined the Jedi, Darth Plagueis heard tales of the Jedi about Mortis and the three powerful beings who lived there. He wrote about Mortis while studying the prophecy of the Chosen One in his science journal prior to his murder by his apprentice, Darth Sidious, which Anakin had discovered by getting Plagueis to tell him everything he wanted to know and his knowledge about things relating to Mortis. Plagueis had practically been taken for all that he had. His only future use would be to help those that wanted to learn, learn from the holocron that he had been entrapped in. It was perfectly safe to leave within the Emperor in order as well because Anakin had made a very strong and inescapable device, with which his soul would never be able to leave. The realm of Mortis was inhabited by only three intelligent beings, force wielders locked in an eternal struggle for dominance over one another. The Sun, who represented the destructive and deadly aspects of the realm, and was aligned with the dark side of the Force, the Daughter, who represented peace and creation on Mortis, and was aligned with the light side of the Force, and the Father, who maintained the balance of the Force between the two. The Ones were a family of exceptionally powerful Force wielders who lived on the planet Mortis, led by the Father, the Son and Daughter. The Son and the Daughter were worshipped as the twin deities, or simply as the spirits in the Night Sisters' religion. Mortis was therefore a fulcrum for the galaxy, and an extremely powerful conduit through which the Force flowed. It was fun seeing the connections within the Force as Anakin connected the prophecies, religions, cultures, and peoples throughout time. They they all had something to do with each other, and yet they didn't have anything to do with each other at all, besides this fact. Originally, more than a million years prior to the Clone Wars comma four the Celestials, mysterious beings who were thought to be capable of restructuring space on a massive scale, lived in the galaxy. According to Thurit, the oldest of the Killic Hives, the Ones are what the Celestials become. For it distinctly remembers the Ones coalescing out of a geyser on an unnamed tropical planet. There were three of them, the Father, the Son and the Daughter. They gained these memories from the Son and Daughter themselves, who joined the Hive Mind briefly to help coordinate the construction of Centerpoint Station. The Ones initially lived in peace and harmony in the home they made for themselves near the side of the geyser. The father warned his children to never drink from the font of power, or bath in the pool of knowledge. However, they eventually disobeyed his orders, with the son drinking from the font, giving him the power of the dark side, while the daughter bathed in the pool. 
bestowing on her the power of the light side. The siblings then claimed areas of the jungle for themselves and started to fight each other, while the father tried to keep the peace between them. If Anakin could discover the secrets as to what they had used to grant themselves these powers within the Force, then Anakin no doubt it would make it the more easier for him. Font of power and the pool of knowledge were the two things he was interested in most despite these things probably not existing anymore. There was something he wanted to learn, and there was still more to do so. A young woman somehow came to the world. She initially became the servant, serving and catering to the ones' needs. However, she eventually became the mother, doting on the father, and succeeding in mending the relationship between the daughter and son. She also managed to persuade the son to use his destructive nature for a constructive purpose, by using his force lightning, to carve new rooms in the walls of the gorge where they lived. However, she was still mortal, and as a result she grew old, and was no longer able to keep the peace between the siblings. The ageless children started to resume their fighting, and neither the mother nor the father were able to prevent it. One day, while the three were fighting in the courtyard of their home, the mother snuck a drink from the font like the son did, and quickly bathed in the pool like the daughter. The father pulled her out with the force, but it was too late. She ceased to be the mother and became Aboleth, the bringer of chaos. Aboleth attacked both the son and daughter, forcing them to bow down to her. The father then stepped in to save his children, afterwards taking them and leaving the planet stranding Aboleth behind. The daughter and son then obtained the help of the Kilix, such as the Thurret Hive, by joining with their Hive mind and lending them their power in the Force. Sharing their knowledge with the Hives, the siblings directed the creation of Centerpoint Station, Sinkhole Station, and other devices to help create and maintain the Maw, which imprisoned Aboleth. Afterwards, the father moved his family to the monolith-gated planet known as Mortis, so that he might control them, and keep the Force in balance. For it stated that when the current of the Force was altered and the flow of time changed, the current forced where it could not be taken Aboleth was able to escape. She would stir up conflict and destruction each time, sending the galaxy into chaos and disorder, thriving on fear, death, and havoc until the son and daughter returned to the Kilix and together they would re-imprison her. This cycle would repeat itself periodically for hundreds of thousands of years. This was someone that Anakin would also have to look out for as well, considering she is meant to also be a representation of chaos, which for all intents and purposes, may very well be the antithesis of the father, which would make this cycle complete in a sense. Instead of reminiscing more about the history of the Mortis gods and their strange mythology, powers and or personalities, it would be best to take a look at other things, more specifically looking towards some developments within the Galactic Republic, the Galactic Senate. The Galactic Senate was a place where all the Republic's elected and appointed senators and representatives from the farthest reaches of the galaxy would discuss major problems and come to decisions. The Galactic Constitution invested the Senate with the power to regulate trade, maintain maps of the galaxy's hyperspace routes, and to maintain the Republic's military. It was still a relatively weak body at the end of the old Sith Wars. Following the Ruison Reformation, a large amount of power was removed from the Supreme Chancellor and granted to the Senate, which although resulting in greater regional involvement in galactic politics, also resulted in increased gridlock and corruption. One of the privileges a Supreme Chancellor still possessed was his or her ability to call an extraordinary session. Originally the Senate was planetary and welcomed any planet with a large enough population until the core was occupied by the early Republic. Then the Republic was politically divided into sectors containing up to 50 inhabited systems, small enough so that they wouldn't expand into separatist empires. The Senate then was apartized by sectorial senators representing the planetary senators. After the first Orsican conflict roughly 17,000 years ago, the Senate was composed of seated senators with full rights of address, and unseated senators, who had to petition for such rights. That made the Senate viable but bred corruption, since unseated senators traded most of their votes. The Senate's role changed somewhat over the centuries. As of the old Sith Wars, it played a slightly more passive role regarding internal affairs. While recognized as the central government of the Republic and deferred to in matters of galactic policy, the Senate's power over many members was more that of a mediator than a ruling body. Negotiation and coercion were staples of its activities. The terrorist organization known as the Flail attempted to overthrow the Senate in a year prior to Anakin joining the Jedi Order, accusing it of corruption, but Chancellor Finnis Valorum's forces disbanded the Flail. Before the start of the Clone Wars, the Senate suffered a shutdown, with corporations controlling it. The majority of the senators around the time of the invasion of Naboo became corrupt changing their affiliations based on their own interests. Eventually through a series of various organizational reforms in response to the separatist threat, the charismatic Palpatine took control of the Senate. During the Clone Wars, Sate Pestage was in charge of the Senate's executive agenda. The charismatic Palpatine that was in control was now starting to lose his support even with the organizational reforms that had taken place. It wouldn't do well for him to start ordering people around to do things the way he wants. Not until he could ensure the people would be loyal to him. Loyalty to him, they were not. The Senate was led by a Supreme Chancellor elected by a vote of the Senate from amongst its delegates. He had little real authority over the Senate other than prerogative to call for a special session and could be removed by a vote of no confidence. The Vice Chair, also elected and removed by the Senate, wielded far more power being empowered to open, close and moderate debate on each motion, which allowed him to control agenda within the Senate. 
The Galactic Senate was made up of over 2,000 congressmen, governor delegates referred to as senators, and representatives representing sectors, systems, individual planets, or even corporations or guilds. Some were elected directly, while others were appointed by a planet's ruler, or even with a planet's ruler. Diplomats, religious figures, local political leaders, and other prominent people could also address the Senate as part of a senatorial delegation. Senators, however, were the only members with voting power, with the representatives organized into the Galactic Representative Commission, although they could be appointed by their absent senators as their temporary substitute and still could have a minor voice in Senate business. The full Senate convened on a regular basis, although the meetings were unscheduled in advance and could sometimes even reach up to 100 full assemblies per year. The order of the day was composed of a series of day-long meetings in committees and subcommittees in formal and informal situations. Most of the negotiation and diplomacy, however, happened behind the scenes in the ambassadorial offices behind the Senate platforms. Before the invasion of Naboo, Republic member worlds could join or become signatories to various federations or groups. Often, smaller worlds would give their voting power over to these federations in exchange for lucrative trade deals. This allowed various corporations, guilds, federations, and businesses to gain extra power in the Senate. It was truly a corrupt system. In the end, its various changes, shifts in power and all-around continuous bureaucracy would be its downfall, whether orchestrated by Palpatine or not. Today, we have gathered here within this August body to discuss the actions the Separatists have taken recently in combination with the Supreme Chancellor's current granted emergency powers. A voice announced to everyone within as they were joined here to talk about many things. Factions were starting to form within the Republic, just as they always did, and it was always going to be for the benefit of themselves. Not necessarily a bad notion to have. To look out for oneself could certainly be fine, but what those in power had over those that were ordinary could be considered excessive. An excessive abuse of power and a greediness that was unappealing to those that watched. So the Separatists have done something important, have they? No, the Separatists have done nothing at all. It is as if they have gone quiet, off of the tracks so to speak, and this could only mean they are planning something of great importance. Thank the Emperor's Emperor for his droids, otherwise we may have already been taken over by the Separatists already, and would have had to give up a lot of what the Republic stands for. Right. Numerous voices were discussing numerous things, and there were even those within the Senate, that seemed to be supportive of the Emperor, or more specifically the Emperor's Emperor, Anakin, and this was something that Palpatine was getting annoyed by, that they would so readily accept someone else that very clearly didn't seem to care for their needs. He was only profiting off of their desperation and Palpatine could only applaud Anakin for that. Then what are we supposed to do then? We can't exactly be spending more resources than we already have been doing. It already costs us more than enough to continuing supplying the Kaminans, but to also buy the droids, we have to make some sort of sacrifice. It is obvious that in the long run the clones would be better, but who is to say that they would be finished in time for the war? What if this conflict ends earlier than what is suspected? That is true. We have no idea when this could end, but preferably it should be as soon as possible. Is there any word on what exactly the Separatists want to negotiate on? We have not really heard what exactly they want. Again, mistrust was brewing from within as the Senators looked at each other, assessing who is and who isn't their foes and allies. The life of a politician was definitely not something to be admired, especially when it came to the Galactic Republic, where corruption was very, very prominent. Choosing one's own leaders is already hard enough when there are only 10 of you. But when it starts to get into the hundreds to hundreds of thousands to millions of billions to trillions, one can only start to rely on the knowledge that the people you choose best to represent you are true to what they say. Which most of the time, they aren't, and that is also usually because of money or power. Money grants power, and power corrupts, while absolute power corrupts absolutely. At least that is what most would think, or they wouldn't, because what normal person has the time to worry about what those higher up within the governmental hierarchy worry about? The common person is usually worried about the common things they do, and that is completely natural. I think that we should come to some form of negotiation with the Separatists. Palpatine suddenly added, and this seemed to create some sort of confusion and silence within the hall, as they all were surprised by what Palpatine had just said. Even his aides didn't know what to think, because Palpatine had just suggested something they had never believed he would ever suggest. Not when it was paramount to his plans that they were to take over the Republic by using the Separatists to their advantage well, to Palpatine's advantage. The Separatists, as detestable as they may be, are people just as everyone else here is. Palpatine said with such passion, that everyone here was being swayed by his words, or at least the people that liked what he was saying, as it would either benefit them or otherwise follow some people's principles and philosophies. They were a part of the Republic once, just as we all here are a part of the Republic ourselves, and surely we all must know of what is to come if we continue as we are. We are on the losing side, even with the additions provided to us so graciously by the Emperor's Emperor, but I must say that I feel as if we were being taken advantage of. As we pay the Emperor, he was off gallivanting and while doing something commendable, Palpatine was starting to speak more and more with fervor. He has taken advantage of the Republic, and this August body should not bend to the will of a tyrant that only cares for his own, while taking from us. The Republic, Palpatine's proclamation had some support, while there were some that were not liking where this was going. It was a foreboding to something important. I declare that we first make this meeting secret, and then we conclude the war with the Separatists through peaceful resolution. Then we must, but a stop to all trade between the Galactic Republic and the Emperor. For I, no, we, the Republic shall not be taken advantage of by the tyrant from a foreign empire. 
Palpatine was really worked up in this instance as if this was his real emotions being on display. Not that anyone would be able to tell whether his worlds were true or not, whether his feelings and passion was actually of any worth. Arriving at the destination that the coordinates that have been set, Anakin gets up and looks out into space as Jabitha communicates to him. Papa, this place feels strange. Jabitha sent this message through to him, and Anakin could say that, yes, it does feel strange. It's okay, there is nothing to fear. Anakin said to calm her down. Let's continue to look around for a bit, and the direction we should head in is there. Anakin gestured with his hands, which was something Jabitha could easily tell. Right now, Anakin was piloting because Jabitha, in combination with himself, could increase and go at speeds that were really, really fast. After a while, others came out from their rooms since they were starting to feel the strangers themselves. At first they didn't feel anything, but soon enough they were able to identify what they were looking for. Arnie, I feel drawn to something within the Force, Ahsoka said as she came up from behind him. The others were similarly feeling strange, and they were also expecting this, but it was still something strange. While not quite as drawing to them as Anakin is to them, but it was like it was something important to them. To all of them, I think Dash Padme was about to speak before being interrupted as Jabitha started to shut down. Wait, what's happening? Don't worry, Jabitha is fine, Anakin said, as this was happening because they were close. They just could not see what they are looking for yet. What do you mean Dash Isla was concerned for Jabitha and was about to ask? But Jabitha replied to all of them. I feel sleepy. Jabitha sent this to all of them. See, perfectly not fine, but we'll be fine after a minute. Why don't you all come see this? Anakin said and then pointed out to something in the distance. A large spatial object. It was shaped like a octahedron, and it was colored black with red lines spreading out on the surface of the object. What is that? Barris asked as the others remained silent. That is the place we will be going into. As Anakin said this they started to become drawn inwards by a suctioning force. Papa, should I resist? Jabitha asked, but Anakin wanted to go in, not escape what he is here to do. No, Anakin said as Jabitha didn't do anything, not resisting and not going inwards as well, just letting whatever was pulling them be in full control. As they went closer and closer, the octahedron opened up at the middle, and there was a white light that was being released. It was something that showed nothing and didn't let away what they were going to see, leaving everything as a surprise. Closer and closer and closer, the white light was starting to get so bright that they were all unable to properly see anymore. Even more so since their perception was enhanced. Whether that be Anakin being able to see more, further and more colors to the rest of them enhanced through the super serum. Well this better be good Sky Guy, since this doesn't feel like it will be all that fun. Ahsoka said before they went fully into the light. Closer and closer and closer. The white light was starting to get so bright that they were all unable to properly see anymore. Even more so since their perception was enhanced. Whether that be Anakin being able to see more, further and more colors to the rest of them enhanced through the super serum. Well this better be good Sky Guy, since this doesn't feel like it will be all that fun. Ahsoka said before they went fully into the light. Everything was silent, and as Anakin awakened, he was exposed to the strange sight before him. Even Jabitha was asleep, and so was everyone else. With him being the first to awake, as it seemed as if there was something that forced him to be like this. Strange. And here I thought that there was nothing that could force me into a state of unconsciousness Anakin thought to himself, as he glanced at everyone else, thankfully all seated in comfortable positions as they slept. For now, he would leave them here as he knew they wouldn't be waking for a while now. It would only be him here. Whatever trials he or they may face, it is likely that they would do so alone. For now, he is very much interested in the things that have been calling to him ever since coming here. He had not created his own weapon just yet because he knew it wasn't the right time. It is here that he may find the missing pieces of the puzzle to what he wises to do, and even though he is unsure of what it is, he will find them. He may not need a weapon per se, but it would still be nice to have one, something that was, no, is going to be extremely powerful. Right. Getting up, Anakin uses his innate connection to Jabitha, and have her open up. Before he goes and exits, he records a short message for all of them to see, knowing that they would be safe within Jabitha. After a minute, Anakin now exits Jabitha, and then uses his connection to once again close the area he had exited Jabitha from. He didn't want any pesky animals or any of those inhabitants getting in, now did he? Wait, if I remember correctly, there are no animals here. In fact, I don't sense any as well. And here I thought that there would have been at least something Anakin thought to himself. The grass was green, the sky was blue. Looking at the obvious, but not so obvious details were important as the landscape was a reflection of not only the Force, but also of the people connected to the Force. There were trees, green leaves and mountainous areas surrounding him. That was distinctly not green, but brown as the rock and dirt it is. The atmosphere was breathable enough, and the primary terrain. It would seem to be floating mountains, lush forests, and molten caverns. Where everyone had landed was in fact a small plains. But that wasn't exactly what the primary terrain is, and they had landed in an area that was bereft of the jungle deeper within. No trees to block his way, and nothing else to impede his vision, Anakin started to walk further outwards, leaving the others to the safety of Jabitha's internal defense mechanisms. Anakin had upgraded her constantly after all, and now that she had a connection and had her own transformed non-organic midi-chlorians, 
because he had two, she would be safe from others accessing her. The only ones that were allowed to control Jabitha at this point is Anakin, the girls within, and any of whom Anakin trusted enough, which is probably no one else, except Shmai, his mother. There were some large plants that seemed to look like lamps, with hanging white masses, and Anakin was amazed at the connection to the force he felt here. The land itself was teeming with life, but of course there is something else calling out to him as well. Both the light and the dark wanted to call out and allure him to their embrace, whether this be because of his status as the chosen one or otherwise, because he is really powerful. It did not matter as he wanted to better explore this place. There was a misty fog that seemed to disperse all throughout the lands, and as Anakin looked further and further in, it didn't seem to clear up at his enhanced vision. Instead, it was able to even block his sights, meaning that it was probably much more magical than it had seemed. Are you the one? A voice was heard, a feminine voice as a telepathic message sent through to him. Are you the one? This time, the voice was not a mental message, but instead it was heard within the physical realm. Turning around, Anakin came face to face with a woman. That was very pure looking. Hello, and who may you be? Anakin asked, knowing full well who this woman was, or is. I am daughter. She introduced herself with a gesture of her hands, and she seemed to be taller than himself. If Anakin had not shrunk he would only have been a small bit taller than her. But now he is most certainly shorter than her. It wasn't anything that would impede his ability to talk to her, and he barely has to look upwards as he looks upon her form. Standing at 2.13 meters tall, having flowing, wavy, long green hair with green eyes. She was extremely beautiful, that if Anakin could, he would use the description of a jade beauty to describe her. But he wasn't so cruel to subject whoever was reading about his life to the good old Chinese writing technique. Instead, the only words he would use was ethereal, beautiful, pure, and above all else, she also looked like some stuck-up, stick in her touch. Are you the one? The daughter stepped forward as she said this. But then she stepped back, sensing something strange about Anakin. You, what are you? She seemed confused. But Anakin knew that this was because of his own force energy field being generated around him. It was expanding more and more, but he tried to control it as best as he could. It all originated from himself, and as a result he was the force in a sense, meaning that he had similar abilities. However, it would seem that the daughter, now up close, could also sense this because Anakin couldn't completely extinguish this energy field. It was something that would always exist no matter what. You are questioning me. I think I should be the one with all the questions right. Anakin said and smirked a little as he could sense her confusion at Anakin's existence. I... I will take you to him. The daughter got over herself, and in the moment she started to blush a little, seemingly out of nowhere she was being strange. Even blushing, something that Anakin had thought she wouldn't be doing, not in this instance. Who do you wish to take me to? Anakin asked, and she seemed reluctant to give him any real answers. In fact, she would never properly give him a straight answer, and would instead say something else that would seem confusing to most. But Anakin knew full well what to expect. Only he will help you strangely enough, the daughter seemed reluctant to move, something which Anakin noticed. But he didn't say anything as she was supposed to be the one in control of this situation. Well, he asked because it had been an entire minute since she had moved. There is little time. Follow me. The daughter was acting extremely weird, different from how Anakin would have imagined it to be. But otherwise he didn't mind whatever the hell she was doing. He could always keep himself preoccupied, especially since he is still connected to and has access to a points of view from many other places. Especially the virtual world back within the Emperor and with his droids in the galaxy outside of this place. Suo, tell me. You must have a name other than the daughter, right? Anakin tried to start a conversation with the high-strung woman. I am daughter. Nothing more, nothing less. She answered, seemingly willing to answer Anakin. Or at least she was willing enough to grace him with her voice, for it did sound beautiful as well. It was like she was made specifically to both tempt Anakin and not tempt him, as he had both the desire to want her but at the same time the desire to keep her pure. It was a strange feeling, but it was certainly one he had not felt before. Who exactly are you taking me to? It would be strange for Anakin to just know straight away of what she was talking about, so he would rather get her to give him an excuse. The father of course. She replied, like it was matter of fact. It is matter of fact, I'll give her that. Anakin thought to himself as he continued to follow her, and he viewed the shifting of seasons as time seemed to pass strangely on this planet. And who are you exactly? What exactly are you? You have a lot of questions she snapped back a little, which was strange considering that she wasn't exactly supposed to be like this, but instead was supposed to be the epitome of the Jedi way. Not exactly a Jedi, but definitely at least the extremity of the light side. We are the ones that guard the power. We are the middle, the beginning, and the end. After walking for a while and trying to talk to the woman, Anakin senses that something was about to fall on her. Anakin easily grabbed a hold of her in an attempt to save her, and had successfully grabbed her from her doom. You must not touch me. It is forbidden, the daughter said. But she made no movement to pull herself out from his hold, and she seemed a little reluctant to be let go. And Anakin believed that he was starting to see things. I thank you for saving me. She again was acting in a way that contradicted the way he understood how she was supposed to be. She continued, That was my brother's work. You are in great danger. The daughter seemed as if she wanted to reach out and grab him, to pull him with her. But she stopped herself last minute from doing so, seemingly remembering that she was forbidden to do so. Wait for me here. Do not leave this place. The daughter said, 
But Anakin wasn't about to just listen to every command this woman gave him. Back on Coruscant, it was currently the night cycle of the planet, and Palpatine usually made contact with his apprentice at this time, Darth Tyrannus. Palpatine forgoes his persona of Sheev Palpatine, the Supreme Chancellor of the Republic, and gets into his real self. Darth Sidious, Dark Lord of the Sith. Yes, my master. Tyrannus, otherwise known as Count Dooku, responded through the communication device, surprised to find that his master wanted to communicate with him in this instance. I have made some interesting discoveries, and have also come to the conclusion that my plans are not working. Sidious said, It has come to my attention that the Republic, and in turn my have become reliant on an outside force, the Emperor. Sidious continued, I wish to end this civil war between the Republic and the Separatists. Do you know how we will do this? No, but I had thought that through the Separatists that Dash Dooku tried to answer, but was instead interrupted by Sidious. It would seem that you have not been trained enough, Tyrannus. You seem to be slipping back into your Jedi habits of not seeing things for how they are. The Republic cannot go on any longer, and it would be foolish to continue scheming now, and instead, we should end this conflict now. It may have been a short-lived one, but it has more than enough allow me to leverage and gain power within the Republic. Sidious explained as he was going to declare himself Emperor, because at this point, there were so many Jedi starting to leave, that he would be unable to find them all and kill them. It would be a pointless endeavor, and using the Emperor's droids, he wanted them to deliver the striking blow against the Jedi, thinking that they were under his full control. Yes, my master, I shall have it be done. Now, all you need to do is send the negotiation request while I convince the entirety of the Separatist movement that they are getting what they want. Dooku actually had other plans, as he has not only become disillusioned with the Republic, but he has also started to consider his actions as a Sith as well. Disillusioned with everything, Dooku was planning to fully take over and not accept Sidious's situation, and would instead turn to the Emperor and ask him for protection. In doing so, those that were part of the Separatists may gain independence from the Republic. Good good Sidious was also accounting for Dooku's potential betrayal, but there was nothing that would enable him to as of this moment take it over. No, the politics of the situation became harder to control, once the Emperor started to gain more and more traction, meaning that Sidious should have done something to stifle their progress and more. That one thing that was done a few months ago was not enough, and would require Sidious to start thinking of ways to slowly unravel the Emperor from within. But given that he has had no luck so far, Sidious would have to consider his options, and would instead focus inwards instead of outwards. Taking care of one's own bedroom came first before trying to conquer the galaxy. If Sidious's room was an absolute mess, then that would only mean his conquest would be as well. You have done well, my apprentice. I believe that I should award you for your efforts. Sidious was planning on killing Dooku, in hopes that he would be able to take a hold of the mantle, and fully get the Separatists under him as a result. Using and taking Dooku under his wing, may have been one of his wisest decisions, as this would now enable him the ability to take over the Republic even when he is under pressure from within. Come to Coruscant you must. But come under disguise, for you must not be recognized. Sidious said as he had plans when Dooku is done and dead. Of course, my master. Dooku had no idea what was in store for him. Wait for me here. Do not leave this place. The daughter said, but Anakin had other plans in mind. It did not take him long to get here even as the time seemed to pass by normally. Anakin knew that it did not. He could feel it, and instead of arriving at nightfall, within a time frame that would have been reasonably for a human using the Force, Anakin arrived within a few minutes after the daughter had left him, which also exposed to him just how fast the daughter could travel as well. She was within his place with her father and her brother, known as the Sun, so he could hear out their conversation, while they would never know he was there at all, and see what they were going to do, now that he had arrived. You have seen him, my daughter. Tell me, what does he seem to be like? The father, taller than both of his children, spoke, asking his daughter the Vanakin. He seemed. The daughter left off, not too sure how to answer her father, and would have a look in her eye. That seemed to be different from her usual self. Yes. What did he seem like? The father further pushed her, ignoring the subtle changes in her character. She would not be so flustered, not usually, and there seemed to be something else as well. But again, the father ignored or did not see such things. In his old age, it would seem he was starting to lose some grip on reality. It also doesn't help that they are powerful beings that have been trapped within this cage. They would call a home, or sanctuary, or prison. Whatever fits the bill more nicely for whomever stays here, which is all of three people. The father, the son and the daughter. He is different. Within the force he seems to be somewhat balanced. But there is also something else that I can't quite identify. It is like he is the force the daughter finally availed her thoughts when first meeting Anakin, and quickly hide whatever else she may have been feeling at the time. For selfish emotions should not be a part of her being. But it seemed like something had been awakened as soon as Anakin arrived here on Mortis. Incredible. It would seem that the Chosen One has arrived, and all of those rumors that I have heard about are real. The Chosen One from what I have discovered seems to also be a ruler of some kind. While the Ones wouldn't really have access to anything outside of their domain here on Mortis, that didn't mean they were unable to preview what was happening outside. Father, I believe that the Chosen One is not the Chosen One at all. The Son had been doing his own surveillance of Anakin, and from what he could tell, he was not something that was conflicted like he was supposed to. The Son had been frequently looking through time and knew well enough that Anakin is the Chosen One, whether he would agree or not didn't matter. The Son had seen his destiny as Darth Vader, and so too, did he see his physical features. While Anakin most certainly looks like the Chosen One, he also does not look like the Chosen One in that one key difference. His eyes. 
They were not the blue eyes of a conflicted and broken young man, nor were they the hate-filled yellow golden, red eyes of someone immersed in tragedy and hate either. Oh, and how so? From what I can sense he seems to have the abilities himself. The father questioned his son, knowing that there must be more to what is going on. He has not had the opportunity to speak to this chosen one, face to face himself, but neither has the son, and he seemed to already have his answer. His eyes are not like the eyes of the man I saw Dash, the son said before before interrupted, and he was forced to the ground by a wave of the father's hand. You dare look into the time vortex, the father called out at learning his child was going through and looking into the future. The son may have not said that he had looked into the future, but that didn't mean anything, because the father was exactly able to tell. Struggling, the son replied, But father, he is not the man who is to be the chosen one. No matter how much he looks like him, he is not dash enough. I will have none of this. The father shut the son up with another wave of his hand before he pulled him back to his feet. We shall see soon enough whether this child that comes to us is the chosen one or not. I shall test him. He will deny and go against the daughter's orders of staying, and would instead come here, seeking something. The father seemed to have an inclination of what Anakin is here for. Son, you have go and try and capture one of the chosen one's companions, and so too will the daughter go with you. Both of you will head my command and wait for my signal to bring them in, for I shall question the chosen one first, before I tell you to go through with my plan. The father continued. Yes, father. They both answered son and daughter, with the son looking at his sister in a frustrated way because she was smirking at his misfortune. As for you, the father then turned his attention to his daughter. You have made a mistake, that mistake was allowing the chosen one to touch you. But father dash the daughter however was going to get a scolding of her own. There will be no buts. You are forbidden from being touched by anything, including the chosen one. It may not be fair, but that was the fate that the daughter had accepted. Or more like she mistakenly had taken on after not listening to her father many, many years ago, along with her mischievous brother. Yes, father. The daughter was really acting of character here, as she had nearly talked back to her father, where the light side of the force made sure he never was so openly disobedient, unlike her brother. Good. Make sure to not make the same mistake again. There were some unknown consequences as to why the daughter may not be touched, However, they would not go into the details here. Go now. The father dismissed the both of them, and they both transformed into their other forms, disappearing from the place they had met, leaving the father all alone to sit back into his throne. Right. I guess that means I should be making my appearance soon. Anakin also had a feeling that the daughter may spend some of the time she has looking at him instead of awaiting the signal given by her father. How he had this feeling, he did not know, but he believed that the Force was probably trying to tell him something. Something that was different from the original galaxy that he knew of and had watched or read about. Before the daughter would get back to the spot she thinks that he is at, Anakin would arrive quicker. All right, here is the gist of things Anakin's voice was synthesized here, as the girls were now all fully awoken, along with Jabitha, and one of them had noticed that a message was left behind. We have arrived here on this planet, known as Mortis, and if you all would look outside, through Jabitha, you may all see that it is quite beautiful looking, and it is also quite mystical in a sense. It was true about what Anakin said, so deep and vibrant within the energies of the Force and life itself, did this place feel very peaceful. The only thing it was missing was animals, but that was only natural, as this place is only meant to be a prison for three, in particular beings. I have already left, as you are all aware of at this point. And no, I wasn't about to wake any of you up, as you all know that you may not come with me. Anakin within the hologram projection of himself, seemed to be looking towards someone in particular, pointing them out as a very clingy person. That person being Ahsoka. Chuckling awkwardly, Ahsoka said, E that must not be right. I am sure it is just a coincidence. Yeah, a coincidence anyway. Seeing as you have all awoken, I may also inform you right now, that two of you may be taken as some sort of test for myself, that one of the beings here want to do. Olo Anakin rubbed the back of his head here before continuing. Yeah, maybe I should have said something. He didn't forget and they all knew it. He just liked to hide things, and they all failed to ask him the right questions. He would never lie to them, but that didn't mean he wouldn't hide things. I would prefer as Isla is left out of this equation for now, because I don't want the baby being harmed in any way. Anakin made a point here as engaging in any really high intensity things, like being kidnapped, could lead to some complications. Isla was really only here because Anakin had decided that this was a good idea. But not only because of that, as it was also a unanimous decision in regards to Anakin coming here. And all of them following along. That should be everything important, and the last thing is that you should all just stay inside Jabitha. When it becomes nighttime, this place changes and it switches from the light to the dark, as destruction and creation are an important process to balance. Anakin gave his final piece of advice but didn't really tell them anything else as it wasn't important. Not where he was going or anything like that, because they could probably follow him anyway if they wanted to. Accessing the diet was easy enough as it is, but when they really wanted to, they could locate each other no matter how far. The hologram message came to an end, and then deleted itself as they all were able to memorize something as easy as that. Right now what do we do? Ahsoka questioned everyone here as they had no idea of what to do next. 
Why do I have a feeling that Arnie has somehow met another girl by now, and has even managed to seduce her? Isla had this sneaking suspicion, but she couldn't quite put her finger on why. Anakin had told them of the inhabitants here, but he had not told them anything about names or genders of those that live here. He had not considered that any of that would be important information. That doesn't matter right now. I think it is best that we do as Anakin said. Barris input her own suggestion. They mostly nodded along with this suggestion as from what they remember he told them or at least from what was taken from the hologram message, was that nighttime may be dangerous even to them whether they were enhanced or not. Slowly, but surely day turned to night and the landscape started to change, allowing for everyone here to see the immense change that the environment would go through. It's like everything is dying, Shark commented seeing the destruction waged by the shift in time, and the planet seemed to go through some sort of repeated cycle. The dark side, Xana commented, which did get the girl's attention as they overlooked the green pastures and green trees, start to wither and die. The ground started to go from its nice vibrant color of life to the deep set red of the ever-dying world. It seems to be. Padme felt some sort of calling to her, not that it was something alluring or anything like that, but something that was meant to be hers in some fashion. As if she was meant to do something important, a decision that would shape her future experience with the Force. Right. Staying inside we are then. Right. Ahsoka said as she most defiantly didn't want to go out there. Weren't we supposed to train here? Xana said this as she knew she was within her own territory right now. She could finally feel as if she wasn't being constantly barraged by these light-sided girls all of the time. The dark was not so comfortable a place to be in, but its allure was still something strong. Yes, but I do believe that Arnie would be upset if we just suddenly decided to go out there. Padme gestured to outside. That is correct. Xana may have felt like she was at home once the say turned to night. But she was also reluctant to go outside, because she felt it was dangerous to do so. Papa said that Jabitha is strong, so Jabitha will protect everyone. Jabitha commented as she could also sense everyone was feeling hesitant. Jabitha had confidence in her ability to escape anything. Even the possibility of escaping a black hole existed simply because she was that powerful. Maybe even powerful even to enter into hyperspace without a proper hyperspace lane being created or already there for her to access. So what are we going to do to pass the time? Padme asked, not really knowing what to do now. Isn't this the reason we brought over those games? You can still play these things right Jabitha, and connect to the virtual Sky Network. Ahsoka said, as she seemed to be fully prepared for the wait. Jabitha can access Sky Network. Jabitha will always be able to give a full proper connection as well, so no lag. Jabitha replied, and said this to everyone telepathically. Right. Who is up for a game of Uno? Ahsoka asked everyone here, as she was the one with the greatest foresight abilities, second only to Anakin. Everyone replied, no. Ahsoka was a veritable cheater, because she could basically see the cards already even when it was through a virtual machine. Oh, okay then. Ahsoka may be trying to get better at acting, but that doesn't mean she has reached a proper standard as of yet. She failed to attract any sympathy by applying the puppy dog eyes technique. Even Xana knew not to mess with Anakin's freaky apprentice, since she probably had the strongest force potential comparatively to everyone here. You know, Ahsoka exclaimed. You won't get us this time. Girls, let's team up to defeat our opponent. Padme said as she glanced around the room, and they all would proceed to team up together only for Ahsoka to still win in the end. It was inevitable. I am inevitable. Ahsoka said this smugly. Whatever. I give up. I am never going to play this game with you anymore. Barris wasn't actually upset. But she was definitely frustrated as it seemed like Ahsoka would never lose when playing this game, and they had even told her to stop using her inside abilities. It wasn't fair after all. Well, that is just how I am. I can't stop it when the Force obviously wants to help me win at these games. Ahsoka replied. Sighs were heard, and there was some exasperation within Ho's sighs as well. They were releasing that frustration through the sighs, as it was incredibly annoying to lose over and over again. Who said when you fail, you learn from that experience? That learning experience is that they should never play with Ahsoka when it comes to games like Uno. I think we may have company, Xana said, as she got up and moved over towards the windows where she could take a look outside. Who is it? Ilo asked as she got up as well, followed alongside everyone else as they closed in on the person outside. It seems to be one of the people Arnie talked about. Padme could sense that this person was of the dark side as he appeared out of nowhere. I see that you have all decided to stay with your ship. The son's voice was heard from outside, and they all could tell that he was here to tell them of something, but they were unsure. Getting Jabitha to allow them to be heard, Padme started to speak for the group. Who are you? I am Sun. Why are you here? Padme further questioned him. You are not supposed to be here. However, given that your ship seems to be living, I would suggest you all retreat into shelter. The knights here are deadly, and it is best that you do not remain within that ship. The sun didn't know that Jabitha had the ability to create a force field around herself to protect everyone within. We are fine within here. Padme stated being cautious, as her instincts told her not to trust the man before them all. So be it. It is your choice. There was another reason the sun was here, and that is to take a look at the companions the Chosen One had brought along. Remember, I suggest you find shelter. The sun looked at the ship before turning around and then transforming into something else. He was some sort of strange creature now. One that looked similar to a bat. It was like he was a combination between a bat and a man, giving birth to some sort of wearabout. But that was obviously not what he was or is. No one said anything, 
but they were only semi-speechless. They had not seen anything like that before, being able to transform like that. In fact, there was probably a possibility that they had never seen a shape-shifting species before. Well, that was interesting, Padme said as she glanced around at everyone else, as there also seemed to be estranged from this event. As they were all coming back from their amazement over that transformation, the world started to quake, not because it was an earthquake, but because of lightning. What was that? Ahsoka questioned as they all felt the rumbling. Another lightning strike hit the ground outside where Jabitha was, and then another. It was causing a real hassle as it then began to strike Jabitha herself but not before her shielding came online, and blocked the damage the strike could have caused. It would seem that what Arnie said and the person called the sun is correct. This planet does become dangerous once it is nighttime, Isla said as she rebalanced herself. It's a good thing that we decided to listen to Arnie then, right? Padme asked, not feeling unsure, but more like slightly trying to brighten the atmosphere within, as they seemed to be a little downtrodden. When has listening to him ever gone wrong? Barris said as another rumbling was felt, causing all of them to focus on balancing themselves. Well, there was that time Dash Shark was cut off as once again the lighting hit more than once. Jabitha, find us somewhere where we don't have to deal with this. Padme told Jabitha. Jabitha has located a cave just behind us. Jabitha can just fit inside. Jabitha could indeed just make it inside, given that it had enough room for an entire ship to go inside. There was also the fact that the girls wanted to go outside themselves as well. But at this point it was better to stay within whatever shelter they have. Okay? Jabitha, good job, let's go. Padme commanded and Jabitha started up and moved within the cave. Rejoining Anakin, we see that he is currently moving at a slow pace as he approaches the monastery. He is also very aware of his current stalker known as the Daughter, seemingly very invested, or at the very least interested in watching over him. He would dodge the lightning strikes everyone now and then, simply because this place was a conduit for that type of behavior. He was also aware of the dark side permeating the planet now, which was a result of how this place worked. Night to day, then day to night. It was a cycle established because some sort of balance was being maintained within this place. The landscape wasn't just red dying plants, but the ground had gone from a red to the blackest of colors, symbolizing death, or at the very least the dark side. Distraction. There is also things that seem to still be living despite the chaos, those things being glowing trees, and they seem to actually be alive. They were corrupted in a sense by the dark side, not that they were in a bad spot, but instead they had embraced the dark side fully. Black trees with engraved, symbol-like patterns that glowed an ethereal cyan. It was certainly a sight to behold, but Anakin wasn't going to stay here for too long since he had other places to be, more specifically within the monastery here. While the other side, during day may have represented the light side of the force, or in other words life itself, the dark side had to represent the opposite. Despite being opposites however, However, these two things are supposed to work together. Without one, then it would only cause disorder and chaos. Too much dark, then everything dies, and there would simply be no more anything, with the end goal of the dark side being to not just be the embrace of one's emotions, but the complete and total destruction of everything. When it came to the light side however, it would also similarly lead to destruction as well. The monastery. Anakin thought to himself, as he finally got around to having a proper look of it instead of zooming past or moving away from it as he needed to play his role better. The monastery was a construct within the realm of Mortis, a place where the force converged. The powerful force wielder known as the Father resided inside the walls of the monastery and presided over the lands. The monastery was a pyramid-like structure located atop a rocky spire. Temple-like in appearance, the soaring facade seemed to be made of stone, and a glowing crystal was embedded within the pinnacle, casting a dim light for kilometers in every direction. The halls and rooms that made up its interior were random, and prone to shifting without reason. Meditation rooms, sleeping chambers, and reading rooms opened onto cavernous halls. On the exterior was an arena, marked with symbols corresponding to the light and dark aspects of the force, including a wolf, a snake, and a bird. Anakin coming now closer was upon the steps to enter this gigantic building. Climbing up the steps, Anakin is finally able to properly enter inside the monastery. Walking down, Anakin could see that the father was sitting in a posture that would seem uncomfortable, while also having his eyes closed. Upon reaching the very precipice of where the father was, Anakin decided to sit down as well. Since there was nothing better to do, he wasn't rude enough to interrupt this guy's sleep or meditation, so he would just wait it out. After what seemed to be a few seconds, the father opened his eyes and his voice, the voice that sounded like many spoke to him. Welcome my friend. It was certainly disconcerting, and Anakin could also make his voice like this as well. If he truly wanted to do something like that, but he wouldn't be changing his voice or layering it and changing it just to sound like that. It was already hard enough for people to hear things. Why would he make it harder to hear himself or have others hear himself as well? Well, I can say that I have had a rather interesting welcoming. Anakin replied before continuing. What is it that you want from me? He knew exactly what he wanted, but he wanted to hear the guy say it himself. To see who you truly are. The father was also feeling strange, as he could tell that there was something off about Anakin. But it wasn't the fact that he isn't the chosen one. It had more to do with how the Force was interacting with Anakin. Anakin was a virgin in the Force, much like the father, or his children were. Because that was just what Anakin was or is. The father continued. One that maybe you have known all along. He had gotten up from his uncomfortable seated position, and Anakin decided to follow as well. One you must believe in order to fulfill your destiny. I do not remember the chosen one having purple eyes. These were the father's inner thoughts as he regarded Anakin. Well, why don't you just tell me already? The riddles certainly don't help much. 
I can tell that your daughter gets her ability to answer things from you. Anakin said to the father, which only resulted in the father raising an eyebrow. You see there is nowhere else left to go. The father gestured with his hand while saying this, while keeping an old wise man's composure. It is late. You will be my guest tonight. The father said as everything seemed to go according to plan. They started to walk in another direction. A direction that was supposed somewhere Anakin would be able to sleep for the night. Rejoining Anakin, we see that he is currently meditating. Given that he is unable to do anything else as of this moment, meditation may not be that fun, and he had time with it. But that didn't mean he was just going to run away from this activity, as it could show him many things. Whether these things are good or not didn't matter, as it allowed him to better plan for the future. He couldn't control absolutely everything after all. He wasn't an actual god at this point, no matter how much power he has. Well maybe one could compare me to the gods of Olympus or something like that. Those gods couldn't control everything, and they were also able to still be killed in a sense Anakin thought to himself comparing himself to those types of gods. It didn't exactly leave a bad taste in his mouth either, as he didn't have to fully compare himself with them, because he is different in the end. He was only comparing their power level to himself and stuff like that. A vision started to appear before Anakin. My son, I must tell you a secret. A voice was heard, and Anakin knew that this was an illusion. His mother Shmai had not come with him, and neither had she died like in the original as well. So there was absolutely no way he was going to fall for this. You are not real. You cannot trick me, for my mother is not dead. What do you mean? You. The fake Shmai then started to turn into the transformed son. You are not the chosen one. You are a fake. The son exclaimed before leaving himself, leaving Anakin all alone again. It would seem that at least someone knows the difference Anakin thought to himself, as he decided that it was probably soon time to confront the father. Gone. Gone like the wind. The son was as he was unable to confirm to himself that the chosen one was Anakin, and now Anakin is left all alone, by himself. It should almost be daytime, it should be time to meet with the father. Anakin thought to himself, seeing as everything was going as planned, or more like everything was going, as it was meant to be going as. Anakin went from his most humble accommodations, and arrived back within the great hallway or throne room, where Anakin finds the father is yet again still sitting there, seemingly doing nothing, but he should be doing something right? Anakin arrived in front of the sitting man, and he spoke, cannot sleep. He knew that Anakin was within his presence, but that was hardly something to talk about, but Anakin wasn't even able to properly hide himself within the force anymore. His own energy field had become somewhat of a beacon, and while he could reduce its size, he was unable to completely bring it under his control in a sense, for it was not something that could be suppressed. But it was something that he could minimize, is seen when he was spying on the father, the daughter and the son before leaving and then returning. They were unable to sense his presence, simply because he was far away. But it was here that one would be able to easily sense Anakin within the force. He may be unable to be totally seeky anymore because of this. But that doesn't mean he is completely unable to utilize his set of skills to his advantage. Well you could say that I don't really need sleep so, yes. Anakin replied, I do have a question however. Go ahead. The father complied with Anakin's request. You are not a Jedi and you are not a Sith, so what would you call yourself? Anakin questioned and just stood there awaiting an answer. You seem to have a very simple view of the universe. I am neither Sith, not Jedi. The father stated before opening his eyes once again and staring at Anakin. I am much more, and so are you. There is something strange going on here, and I would like to know more. Anakin said, given that there were really only three people here on this planet, that would be willing to give him the information that he wants. Standing up in a strange manner, the father begins to speak. Some call us force wielders. I won't lie. I have heard of you guys before, and the reason I am here is exactly because you three are here. Anakin added. Humming, the father continues. Few even know of our existence. You see something tried to trick me while I was within that room over there. Care to explain? Anakin asks. My son, I suspect. The father stroked his beard as his eyes were cyan blue, while his sclera were black. Eyes that were kind of rare within the galaxy at large. But given there are so many species with so many planets, Anakin had not seen it all. So of course, if there was some other being with the same eyes, he would not know. Well, maybe not know of. But at the very least he had not seen for himself. We can take many forms. The shapes we embody are merely a reflection of the life force around us. You carry a sadness in your heart. No, wait. You used to carry a sadness within your heart. But it seems to have been taken care of. The father could sense something like this. Or he either was allowed to because the Force allowed it. Not that the Force was able to influence Anakin at this point anymore. It was getting harder and harder after all. My children and I can manipulate the Force like no other. Therefore it was necessary to withdraw from the temporal world and live here as anchorites. I don't know, this place seems like a prison to me. Anakin said as he also felt that this place was a prison, a place that may need some freeing. Then you would be correct in assuming that it is. For this place is more than just a place with which myself and my children reside. It is also a prison. The father confirmed Anakin's thoughts. You cannot imagine having such love for your children and realize that they could tear the very fabric of our universe. So what you are saying is you and your children could destroy the universe. If you or any one of them were to escape this place, Anakin said, the father was not simply staying still when saying all of this, and had already moved himself, gesturing just vividly a lot of the time as well, now standing further from his throne. 
Now he was starting to talk to Anakin while not even looking at him, and instead was doing so by looking out into the large hall that was this monastery. It is only here that I can control them. A family imbalance. Light and the dark. Day and the night. Destruction replaced by creation. Then why reveal yourself? Anakin questioned. There are some that would like to exploit a power. The Sith are but one. To much dark or light would be the undoing of life as you understand it. When news reached me that the Chosen One had been found, I needed to see for myself. The father seemed intensely interested when saying this, and somewhat excited perhaps. It was after all a sign for the father that he could finally die peacefully, knowing that he could hand over his position of power to the one that would come after him. The Chosen One seems to be a myth to me. Anakin said this knowing full well that he was, but he isn't about to just say this, because he also considers stuff like prophecies to kind of be self-fulfilling, especially the kind that the Jedi have seemingly wanted to propagate themselves. Is it? I should very much like to know. The father had this smirk on his face as he said this. Why don't we find out together? Pass one test and I shall know the truth. Then you and your friends may leave. The father added, seemingly goading Anakin into playing his games. Not that they were games, but it would sure seem like it to some that were to be in Anakin's position as of this moment. The girls back on the ship were all sleeping themselves as of this moment for they didn't have much to do, and they didn't exactly want to start exploring this planet, when it was within its dangerous state of being. They would all be experiencing their own thoughts as of this moment, but we will only focus on a few, as they were the most important to their growth within the Force or otherwise. The first person is Ahsoka. She is having a dream, a Force vision, so to speak of her older self appearing before herself. Are you happy child? Ahsoka heard a voice and woke up, but not with a start, and she was seemingly all alone with the ship. Shibitha, was that you? Ahsoka got up and looked around, but there was no one there. Barris, Isla she called out, but there was no response. Jibitha, are you okay? She reached out her hand, but there was no response from Jibitha, and there was neither anyone else around her as well. Your master, does he treat you well? Does he even want you? Because from what I have seen, he doesn't seem all that interested who is it. Ahsoka called out, and pushed away those words spoken by this other voice. She then spotted herself, but older looking over towards her from within the ship. What concern of it is yours? I am your future. The older Ahsoka said as she looked down upon her younger self. Your potential, or your would-be potential, but it would seem that you are much greater than even I am now. The older Ahsoka could admit that whatever was happening, it was certainly not going according to how she would have been. Is this a trick? Ahsoka was not immediate to the trigger, and instead she was cautious of the person before her. There is a wildness to you young one. It would seem that there are seeds of the dark side within you, planted by your master and you don't even realize this older Ahsoka looked at younger Ahsoka's eyes. Or you already know of this and have already accepted it. That may be so. But I don't know what you are trying to do here. Sky Guy is most certainly not what you may be suggesting. But he is also not a Jedi as well. Ahsoka spoke with conviction. He may be passionate and impulsive okay, maybe not as impulsive as myself. But still I trust him with my life. There are many contradictions in you. In him. There are a few as well. But that is only natural. And it would seem you know of this as well. I can see it in your eyes Ahsoka. And that is discounting the fact that I am you. After all, older Ahsoka said, as she seemed to be able to determine that Ahsoka knew far more than she should at this point. Ahsoka didn't say anything else, and awaited for what is to happen next as she felt that it was going to end soon enough. Be warned, the path you walk down isn't one that many would dare. No, it is not you that walk down this path, but you master instead, and this path is not a path that is good. What do you mean? Ahsoka wanted to know what her older self was talking about. Answers will come in time. Reveal himself, Anakin Skywalker will. Your master may be someone you can love, and he could love you back forevermore. But be warned that you will have to wait. Be warned that he isn't what he always shows himself to be. Older, Ahsoka said. Joke's on you. I already know about him being Vader. Ahsoka said, thinking she had one against whatever this apparition was. Then it is as I thought. It is already too late. Older Ahsoka sighed, then vanished. What was that about Ahsoka was thinking to herself before she was pulled from the sleeping world and drawn out into the waking one? Padme was within the ship, and she was sleeping. But she was woken up by a noise. Revenge. A blue what? Padme yawned before getting up only to not see anyone around her. After exiting her room, she was unable to find anyone else as well, meaning that she had been left all alone. But this was strange as they wouldn't just up and leave without her. Well maybe they would have. It wasn't that she actually believed they didn't care about her, just that they may have left her. Because they didn't want to wake her or something like that. But that would just be silly. Hello. Padme called out. Revenger whisper was heard on the wind, and Padme was slightly drawn to go outside of the ship, which exposed herself to the cave Jabitha had gotten them in. It was lit up by blue lights, which came out of the dead but not dead plants inside. Is anyone there? Padme called out again, this time taking one step closer to her goal. Revenge is what you want right? Another Padme appeared before herself. Who are you? Padme asked, unsure of how to respond to there now being another her. What do you mean? I am you. This version of Padme had strange markings on her face, and seemed to be pronounced within the dark side of the Force. You are not. While Anakin had told Padme that both the light and dark were necessary for balance, that didn't mean she didn't have her own unconscious biases. Just like the rest of the girls that had their own origins, whether this be within the Jedi or the Sith. Oh, but I am. Do you not want to see who you truly 
truly are. You are the chosen of the chosen one so to speak, and it is not just yourself but all of those other girls as well. Dark Padme said as she came one step closer to real Padme. Are you referring to Anakin? Padme asked. Of course I'm silly. Dark Padme chuckled a little here before appearing behind Padme and spooking her. Anakin is the only one of course. Whether this be for me, or for you. Dark Padme continued. Why are you here? Padme asked. Do not fret. I am only here to show you that you are more in line with the dark side of the false. Of course, Arnie already knew of this. But he didn't want to tell you. How sweet. Dark Padme had a very loving and somewhat obsessive smile as she said this. You are wrong. Padme refuted. But she had an inclination herself about her own alignment. She had done a lot of selfish things. But at the same time she had also done a lot of things that were for others. This all relied on perspective however, as one doesn't know all they do about the benefits there are in helping others. For when you help someone, they are kind of indebted even if they aren't. And because of this, they would be more willing to help you out in certain things. Am I? Come now, Padme. Don't lie to yourself. You have already done so before when you told our beloved that you do not wish to have children with him then and there. Look where that got you. Dark Padme pointed out to a blurry image of Isla having a rather plump belly, due to pregnancy. I know that you are jealous. To not be the first one to have his children, it must make you frustrated, doesn't it? Dark Padme continued. I, I admit that it does, but that doesn't matter now that I have told him. Padme answered back. Well, at least there is that. But remember, right now you should not lie to yourself most of all. If not to Arnie, then most certainly not yourself as well. Dark Padme said as she looked into Padme's eyes. You are who you are and Anakin has already accepted this about you. You know this already. Dark Padme started to vanish with Padme starting to feel weird, as if her world was starting to fall in on itself, before she was awoken to the waking world. One may wonder about the timeline of events. But most of what is going to happen next is before Anakin and the group landed on Mortis. Dooku, otherwise known as Darth Tyrannus for his Sith Master, who was the one running the Galactic Republic as of this moment. He is a man that had seen through the corruption of the Republic, and knew that sooner or later he would be leaving. The build-up to his departure wasn't anything too grand, but it had him trying to have some small form of protest that didn't work. He at first from with the Jedi, trying to make them see the error of their ways even towards his own master, Master Yoda. But his pleas and criticisms fell on deaf ears, blind eyes, and in general blocked off senses. Even the Jedi Order's capability to empathize with others was greatly hampered by their lifestyle, and the way they tried to live their lives. They disconnected themselves from the mundane world, and became monks that were holier than thou, which resulted in many, many failings. There was the fact that Jedi constantly lied to the Senate about how powerful their abilities were, specifically in the instance where their abilities to foresee the future was diminished, and no one had thought to tell the Senate about this. The Jedi's abuse of their powers through the use of mind-altering and manipulation type abilities on innocent people, especially when it came to their inability to see that taking children away from their families was something incredibly wrong. Years-long training programs used to initiate their new members, which were in a sense a way to brainwash the children into the way or lifestyle of the Jedi Order. Children as young as the age of three were taken from their homes, their families, and then are forced into indentured servitude right from a young age. Forced due to things like blind combat with droids along with simulated initiation tests that see the children within fighting in life or death scenarios to test their force abilities. If the Jedi really cared about the children they took, then they would know that it is scientifically proven that it is wrong to separate children from their parents. Ignorance lead to suffering and suffering lead to hate. Something that Dooku had seen before and if Anakin heard these thoughts, he would say this was also exactly what had happened to the original Anakin. Because of the Jedi ignorance, it lead to original Anakin's suffering, and because of his suffering, it lead to his hate of the Jedi Order. The legacy of the Jedi Order is not about doing the right things. No, the Jedi's legacy is about putting toddlers into slavery, deceiving their parents, and then brainwashing said toddlers into becoming unquestioning members of their cult. This wasn't something Dooku had learned on his own, but had been told by someone else very recently, by the Emperor's Emperor Anakin Skywalker. It seemed like he was able to perfectly encapsulate what the Jedi had become. Or was it what the Jedi always were? And that is just the tip of the iceberg, believe me. Something else that had intrigued Dooku was that Anakin could say this even coming from the Jedi. The lies, their actions, hubris hypocrisy, their outright refusal to give up control would result in the dark sides rising to power, and the eventual downfall of the Republic. Quite possibly, the Jedi's greatest failure is perhaps their inability to to change. Their inability to accept that they are in the wrong and then change because of it. Darth Tyrannus, how good of you to join me. Dooku had come to Coruscant on the orders of his master, Darth Sidious, because he wanted to tell him something important, but also be better prepared for the events that would happen. Not that Dooku was about to let Sidious gain control fully, as he had been awakened to Sidious in his way. He is intently aware that Sidious may very well be trying to kill him off in the search of a better apprentice for himself. Dooku is aware of his own flaws, or flaws within the eyes of Sidious, that would make him an apprentice, 
that may not be to his liking. Master, Dooku got down on one knee as he bowed in servitude to Sidious. You may rise. Sidious gestured and allowed Dooku to rise. Yes, Master. Dooku got up and then continued to ask himself, if I may ask my master, but I am unaware of the reason you have brought me here. Yes, I think that would do nicely. Sidious seemed to have this smile on his face that was absolutely radiating mad glee. I have brought you here for something important, something of extreme importance, and it is somewhat akin to a test of sorts. A test. Dooku said this in a questioning tone, knowing not to question Sidious, but instead redirect oneself in a way that would enable his mincer of power. Yes, a test that is for you in particular. I have been holding back on teaching you some more of the more powerful or dangerous secrets of Sith power, for I have been cautious of your loyalty. However, you have proven yourself to be a very loyal apprentice, so I have decided that it is time that you go through a test to learn some of the secrets to immortality. Sidious of course wasn't going to teach him anything, but wanted to lower Dooku's guard for what will happen next should not be something he is expecting. What is this test, Master? Dooku was now curious at what it could be, while at the same time expecting it to also be some sort of sadistic game. Curious, 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 aren't we? Sidious started to walk around Dooku, before blasting force lightning at the man, fully prepared to harm him at the very least. Dooku didn't see this coming, but he ignited his own lightsaber, and quickly diverted the force lightning, before it could hit him. Laughing with madness, Sidious stopped what he was doing and looked at his apprentice, who was sweating a little bit after that exchange. Dooku was not young anymore, and it would take time for him to recover if he was harmed as well. Some heavy breathing was heard from Dooku as he was exhausted after that exchange. Dooku didn't say anything, and instead gave a confused look, which was something Sidious easily answered. You have done your job, but your death would end the Separatist movement much better. I will use your death and then make the Separatists come under myself. They would not refuse the offer I am to propose to them, and given that the Trade Federation has dissolved as well, it only makes it all the more easily to control the assets under the Separatist control. Imagine if I came with you, dead or alive. Another long blast of Force Lightning went Dooku's way as Dooku was forced to use his lightsaber once again to absorb and redirect the lightning's energy away from himself. A cackling was heard coming from Sidious, as if this was some sort of joke to him, which would have angered Dooku. But he knew that he was not Sidious' match. Most certainly not his match by having created distance between himself and Sidious. Why? Dooku questioned as the lightning came to an end. Did I not explain to you why? My apologies, Tyrannus. Your usefulness has come to an end, and the Emperor has become too much of a problem. Then there is the conflict within the Senate. I may have emergency powers. But it would seem that even with this, my authority is starting to decrease. Sidious said. And it was all because of taking the deal the Emperor from the Emperor had created. If I didn't know any better I would say that the Emperor had planned for this to happen from the start. Sidious continued. Then what would you gain from me dying? Dooku wanted to know. But he was in actuality trying to stall for time. Time enough for him to escape, for he knows that Sidious wouldn't want him alive, and instead was trying to kill him. Oh, who said I am the one to kill you? Sidious had stopped attacking him by now, and instead gestured to another area of their meeting place. Some abandoned building way far out of the Republic's capital of Coruscant, but still on the planet. Come out my budding apprentices. Yes master, the being that came out was quite tall but the most distinct features of this person indicated that he was a Gungan. Yes, master. The next to come out was a human. They were Fierus Olin and Jar Jar Binks, two incredibly powerful Sith apprentices that Sidious had decided to take under himself. He has had enough following the rule of two from those of the past, and instead would focus on having more than one. He had already gotten into whatever Dooku was doing, so he might as well also embrace this change. He was getting desperate after all, so he used Fierus Olin's dislike of Anakin Skywalker, and then changed him into his own apprentice. When it came to Jar Jar, Sidious didn't need to do much to shift and transform Jar Jar's mind into the allure of the dark side. Using his insecurities against him, and proving to Jar Jar that people didn't like him, in turn made Jar Jar not like others. And once that started it was all downhill from there. So, what do you think? Sidious asked his other apprentice, Dooku who was now on the opposing side of himself. Nothing. Kill him. Sidious then ordered Jar Jar and Fierus to attack Dooku. Dooku would easily outclass the both of them. But there seemed to be something strange about the power behind these two. Jar Jar shouldn't have come this far already without any training, and Fierus shouldn't have been this skilled with a lightsaber. But in the end, Dooku was defeated. Dooku was on the edge of a long drop off of the old rotting and decaying building everyone was on. Jar Jar was approaching along with Fierus. I am sorry my apprentice Darth Rannis, but I have noticed some of your activities, and they seem to be going against myself. Sidious spoke as he waited for Dooku's end, tormenting him. Darth Jar Jar just wouldn't fur, so I decided that Jar Jar shall be reborn as Darth Imabiz. Then for Fierus, he goes by Darth Verdred. Quite nice, aren't they? Jar Jar and Fierus, or should one say Imabiz and Verdred raised their own lightsabers, red and glowing ominously. They both lunged forward only for Dooku to willingly throw himself off of the edge of the building. Well, that should be the end of him, Sidious said, feeling that Dooku would be dead. Dooku had not in fact been killed off, and had secretly survived the descent from the building. He landed not so gracefully, but landed nonetheless, and was able to make his way towards the Jedi, for they would want to know some things. He wouldn't just show himself however, and instead he would be trying to move himself to find someone he is familiar with. I only hope he is here. Dooku was thinking about his own apprentice, Qui-Gon Jinn, when he was a Jedi. 
Sneaking into the Jedi Temple wasn't too hard, and Dooku was going to go as fast as he could for he couldn't allow Sidious to continue his plans. Where would he be? Dooku knew that Qui-Gon wasn't someone to be here within the Jedi High Council, but he had already been going around checking up on every area that he believed Qui-Gon to be. Unfortunately, he wouldn't find his student to help him, and instead he would only find himself needing medical treatment. I doubt the Jedi would keep me here, and they wouldn't believe what I say. Did you hear? A voice spoke as they were passing by where Dooku was. Did I hear what? You know about Jedi Master Qui-Gon Jinn? Oh, no, I hadn't heard. I was out on a mission. There were two voices and they were speaking to each other about Qui-Gon, which prompted Dooku to follow these two to see where the conversation went. If he didn't hear the information he was looking for, he was very willing to just take them both and force them to be quiet while also extracting information from them. So, what happened to the Master? You really haven't heard. He went to the Jedi High Council a few days ago. Remember, I was out on a mission. Right, right? Anyway, Master is known for not liking the Jedi Code all too much. I am pretty sure everyone knows of this, especially since he was one of the Chosen One's teachers. Well, Master Qui-Gon has left the Order. What? What? Even Dooku was surprised at this revelation, for he had not left the Jedi even after his own apprentice had left, neither when he discovered when and why Dooku had left as well. Yeah, he left. Supposedly he has left the Order and has gone over to the Emperor, where the Chosen One is, believing that he is still brining balance to the Force somehow. That sounds reasonable. From what I have heard, the Emperor is quite the place to be, and while it isn't a republic-like government or a democracy, or full democracy, the Chosen One isn't a tyrant. That's not what I have heard when it comes to the things happening with those politicians within the Senate. Politicians are always arguing and of course they would say that the Emperor's Emperor is doing something wrong. I am starting to see their corrupt ways. The voices continued for a while, as Dooku extracted information from the both of them for a while. Qui-Gon had gone to the Emperor to follow after his apprentice. It made sense to Dooku now that he thought about it, for he has also kept close contact with Skywalker. I need to go to the Emperor then. Coughing up a bit of blood, Dooku comes to a stop. But maybe, I should find a way to get myself some medical help. Here within the Republic, it would be hard to do so, and he would not have a way to escape especially in most other areas, so he would go to the underworld of the planet. There he would find things are a bit different from what he was expecting. The girls within the ship all had their own dreams or visions, that showed them things. Things about themselves, or things about what they must do and things that are to come. Now however, their dreams and visions have come to an end. Did anyone else also experience some weirdness? Everyone had come out and meet back up within the common room, and as they did everyone seemed to have gone through something similar. The first one to speak was Ahsoka as she made her problems the night before known. It wasn't quite daytime just yet, but there was something that seemed like a change occurring, which lead to everyone knowing the strangeness of this place. Yes, I also experienced something similar. Padme told her side of the story, leaving out some bits while keeping others, as she wasn't prepared to just say out loud that the vision was telling her to go to the dark side. She wouldn't have it. Does anyone remember when Arnie said something about being taken? Isla was the first to being this up again, given that she wouldn't be the one involved in whatever is about to happen. Yes. He said that two of us will be captured, but we would be completely fine. Barris confirmed what Isla said. Then who is going to go as tribute? Xana asked, seeing that everyone was still out of it, including herself as she had also experienced something strange within her dream. She was confronted by the possibility of being able to properly feel things like love, just as she was starting to feel right now with Anakin. Not that she would admit it, given she is stubborn like that, I don't know. All I know is that anyone but me is to go. Isla said so while rubbing her slightly plump belly. Right. Since no one else seems to want to be going now, I think that I will offer myself up first. Ahsoka said as she glanced at everyone as while they were safe in knowing that they would be fine, it would seem that they all wanted to stay behind with Isla, within Jabitha. Anyone else then? Padme asked, seeing that they didn't want to get involved, and one would think that they would want to because Anakin was. But that wasn't how things work. They were not scared and didn't fear what was to come, but instead they all wanted to do other things. Specifically they wanted to go back to their rooms and meditate on their one dreams, and think on the things that they were shown. I think everyone here has something else to do, right? Shark said as she also looked at everyone, seeing right past everyone's desire to explore just what their dreams and or visions were meant to mean. Fine, fine. I will go with Ahsoka, while we can all stay here to deal with, well, whatever it is. Padme finally spoke here as she would be the one going on the trip to where Anakin is. Great. Now let me get back to my room and play some game dash looking around. Xana stops herself from saying more, as she wasn't at all concerned about what she had experienced and instead was much more interested in playing some games. I mean meditating. Yeah meditating. Sure, sure. Everyone started to go their own ways, while Ahsoka and Padme got ready themselves to leave. Anakin only wanted two of them, and they also knew that it was for some reason that had to do with the inhabitants of this planet, or whatever this place is. After a while, the ship quieted down again, leaving Padme and Ahsoka to leave, and as they did, they started to make their way outside of Jabitha. 
then they would proceed to make their way out of the cave they were in as well. So, what are we supposed to do exactly? Ahsoka asked, but Padme was just as confused about what to do as Ahsoka was. How am I supposed to know? You know Anakin doesn't like to tell us everything. Padme replied herself. Yes, that is a bit annoying. Ahsoka replied. It's okay. You could say we all have out secrets. Padme would know, as she wasn't about to just tell anyone everything. Maybe Anakin. But even then she wouldn't just tell him everything about herself. Now would she? Not because she wouldn't tell him but because she didn't want to do so sometimes, and it meant that she would keep things to herself. Because she had her own things she wanted to keep to herself, as it was her privacy after all. Just as she didn't well, maybe she did want to know and maybe even want to tell Anakin everything about herself. But it was obvious that he wasn't into knowing everything about her as much as she was. As they continued to walk, the planet that was dead, or dying, was starting to begin anew as the black, red grass turned green once again, and the trees which were glowing blue but with no leaves and dead, started to come to life again. Things were simply becoming better and better as night turned to day, dark turned to light, and destruction gave way to recreation. This place is getting stranger and stranger, Ahsoka said as she glanced around, looking at the planet that was becoming anew, just right underneath her. Yes, the longer we stay here, the stranger this place gets. Padme replied also taking a look around and comparing this place to the way Anakin views the Force. The way everyone within the Emperor and Order was starting to see how the Force worked, which would only lead her to come to the same conclusion. Another step in the direction that the dark side is necessary, even though it could very well become something unnecessary because of someone turning mad by its corruption. That was just how it was, and she saw herself within that corrupted state of being, not transformed into something hideous, neither become something she was unfamiliar with, but something she does not want to admit to. Her own selfishness that has led her to this situation, where she has become someone that would abandon everything else for Anakin. Not that what she was abandoning was something that was great, but it was definitely something that may have needed her. The Republic was dying. No, is dying, and it was only a matter of time before it all came down, crashing and burning. She may not blame herself for this inevitable fall, but she would definitely still feel guilty, believing that she may have been able to change something. It appears that the planet is renewing herself. Padme continued as she further observed this place through the Force, and her own physical perception of the landscape. Is what Sky Guy said even going to happen? Ahsoka questioned as they were now quite a ways off from where Jibitha and the rest were, and instead were all by themselves. Not that they were unable to take care of themselves but they would most certainly not be a match for either the son or the daughter. Don't worry. I am sure that he has everything planned out. Padme replied as she had full faith that whatever was going to happen. As they continued they turned around quickly, as two beings of massive proportions to themselves swooped down and caught them. Both Padme and Ahsoka were both unable to do anything in turn, and because they were able to communicate with each other, Padme calmed Ahsoka down before she did anything. Calm down this must be what Anakin was referring to. It was a mental message sent where the two creatures that have them now couldn't hear. Okay? Ahsoka stopped her struggle as they both would just have to enjoy the ride, for if they don't see Anakin soon, then they would struggle and properly go against these things. But for both Ahsoka and Deep Padme, they would both receive a message from Anakin to not panic soon after, and that they should properly remain quiet for now. It is time to know the truth about who you really are. The father spoke as we rejoined both Anakin and the father, within a place that was not too dissimilar to a proper arena. It also was a place that seemed to have symbolism in relation to the balance of the force. Above, the transformed son and daughter both hold their own captives. Padme was within the grasp of the daughter, while the son had Ahsoka within his own grasp. Knowing perfectly well that everything was now within his control, Anakin allowed things to play out as they were supposed to. The two children land either side of both Anakin and the father. Hello, nice of you two to join us. Anakin spoke as he waved hello to both Ahsoka and Padme, as they were both safe and unharmed. Of course one would or should be more worried, but because they were so close, Anakin knew he has complete control over this situation. And they didn't even need to be this close. Sky Guy, what the hell are we doing here again? Ahsoka asked, wanting to know what was going on while Padme kept quiet, feeling strangely comfortable in the grasp of a being that holds her. Despite the situation she was in, it was like all of her fears were washed away about being more in tune with the dark side, while Ahsoka didn't exactly feel comfortable, but did want to escape and embrace Anakin, which wasn't something new but it was like her innate desires or passions were being inflamed within the presence of the sun. Passion for Anakin of course. So why do you have these two captured? I would suggest you let them go. Anakin spoke to the father as he was the one truly in charge. I have ordered my children to kill your friends. The question is the father chose this moment to reappear back on top of the viewing platform and instead started to look down on the situation happening. Which one will you choose to save? Your wife or your apprentice? Strange how things have turned out. It was not originally supposed to be like this. But perhaps this may be a better way to decide the claims of you being the chosen one. The next sequence of events that happened next went in a similar manner to how it did within the original, with Anakin saving both Ahsoka and Padme, before exerting his control over the both of them. Specifically exerting his control over the daughter and the son, by then proceeding to make them both kneel before him. He would be lying if he said that he didn't like the power flowing through him as of this moment, because it was quite addictive. But it wasn't a part of his own, and instead it was something that was enhanced by being here. 
Not that he would be unable to replicate what he had just down, but it was because he was using the actual force rather than his own energy field. It was surprisingly easy enough, with no resistance at all, and the energy he felt coursing through him was definitely the force trying to sway him once again. It doesn't like in taking whatever moment it has to try and persuade him into doing what it wanted. Not that he wasn't already doing it. He was just accomplishing the prophecies assigned to him in a different way or manner to how they would have been initially received. After the whole process of night turning day, day turning night, destruction, creation, dark, light, in the end, all that mattered was that Ahsoka and Padme were okay. They both went up to him instead of backing away, for they knew they would not be actual distractions to his magnificent display of force ability. Instead, by them both being closer to him, his abilities only get more powerful as this was how the dive worked. The son and daughter had transformed back into their humanoid forms, bowing before Anakin like the emperor that he is. And now you see who you truly are. The father had come down to speak some more, also looking towards Anakin, and seeing that he was current being embraced by the two females that were brought here. This is wrong. What is? Anakin questioned for he didn't know what the father was referring to. This isn't how it was supposed to be. You are the chosen one, but the father left off giving Anakin a thousand yard stare. Only the chosen one could tame both of my children. Well, I have taken your test. Now what? Ah, well, yes. First you must understand the truth. The father seemed nonchalant about the situation. Now all of you leave us. Father, I deny that he is the chosen one. Look at him and what he is. He can't dash the sun tried to make his stand but was interrupted. Quiet. Leave now with your sister and these two girls that are wrapped around the Chosen One. The father's authority was hardly ever questioned by the son, but it would seem he was becoming more and more chaotic, just as the daughter was changing as well. It would seem that something was changed, different in a manner, and it all started with Anakin arriving on this place. In this place, be careful. Ahsoka said not trusting anyone here as she went along with Padme, who also showed her care and concern, by giving Anakin a peck on the cheek before moving along. While taking a close look at the daughter, Ahsoka and Padme would be spending a bit of time with the daughter for now. Do you feel your destiny? You must see it now. I'm dying, and you must replace me. The father said after everyone had left. Replace you. I am sorry to say that I am unable to stay here. Now with everything else going on I can't. Anakin replied to the father's words. But this is yours. It has been foretold. The chosen one shall remain to keep my children in balance. The father seemed to be surprised that Anakin would reject him even knowing that Anakin is also an emperor now of sorts and had other responsibilities. No, Anakin replied matter of fact, but just because he wasn't going to stay. That didn't mean anything as of this moment for there were still things happening. Things changing in the very course of history changing because Anakin was so different from his original self, even more so because he was challenging the fate and destiny of not only himself, but for others as well. Specifically the things happening to the daughter and the son. I I cannot force you to do this. The choice must be yours. But leave and your selfishness shall haunt you and the galaxy. Truly. Why do my thoughts wander to the chosen one? The daughter questioned herself on this matter, as it was not normal for her to think of things down on such a personal level. She would usually be much more disconnected and would rather think of everyone instead of just herself. But her thoughts wandered. Wandered to Anakin and most important, wandered to why she wanted to be near him in a much more intimate manner, such that she would not even mind his touch. It was an incredibly strange experience, and that she would even allow him to do so why. She questioned herself. Whatever her reasoning may be, she would surely find out soon enough as she had a feeling that the Chosen One, along with his small group, would not be leaving so soon. Anakin. A voice echoed within his head as Anakin was now back with Ahsoka and Padme, specifically at the living ship, Jabitha. He was meditating to himself within his own room as after everyone had come to him for some more explanations, he decided to put that off for now, as he knew that some meditation was in order. Within his mental world, Anakin was alerted to an intruder, one that he allowed. He was most curious as he had seen the reaction of the sun, and he wanted to know why the sun would still try and get into his head and communicate with him. He clearly didn't believe Anakin to be the chosen one, but that didn't mean anything, since the sun may be trying to use Anakin to escape. It was entirely possible for such a thing to happen after all. It's true, what they say. Another him came forward, and he walked on water within this place, for Anakin was not within his own mind, but instead the mind of the sun. You are the chosen one. Join me. Together we could change the balance of the universe. My friend, it would seem that the sun had forgotten that Anakin had seen his outburst. I think you forget, but I did happen to hear what you said. I thought you didn't believe I was the chosen one. Anakin said, oh, that? I was simply misinformed and had failed to realize the truth at the time. The sun responded, misinformed, eh? Then you must know that I would not become a Sith. Anakin continued where he left off. Sith, you make it sound so simple. There is no duck without the light. There isn't simply one without the other, as that wouldn't be balance. The son replied, I know of this. I was just hoping to make a point with what I said. Anakin said, and what point would that be? The son replied with a question, that I would simply not conform to whatever you wish for me to do. You clearly know that I am not the Anakin Skywalker that would have became the Sith Lord known as Darth Vader. Anakin said, the son visibly recoiled and took a step back. How do you know that he exclaimed, not really scared, but definitely surprised at Anakin's declaration. Because I do. Anakin had a smirk on his face as while the son was taller than him. He didn't fear for he had men larger than him under himself. In fact at one point he would have been the same height as this being before him. Your tricks will not work on me. 
and you were smart to call me to your mindscape instead of trying come into me own. I knew it. You are not the chosen one. The son said, seemingly confirming to himself that Anakin was no the chosen one. Oh no, you are not right. You are very, very wrong because I am in fact the chosen one that you want, your father wants and the daughter wants. Anakin said taking a step forward, representing that Anakin was in more control of the situation than the son was even if they were both within the son's mind. You are wrong. My sister would never be interested in you, as she is not like that. My father may believe that you are the chosen one, and you may have proven to all of us your power to control myself and my sister but that means nothing. You have upset the balance with your existence. Do you not feel what you have done is wrong? The son was still trying to manipulate Anakin. I do not care what the force wants. Anakin simply stated, what? The son was confused. You heard me right. I don't care for what the force wants at all. I have had my fair share of being pushed, and whatever you say will not come in the way of what I think is right. Anakin continued stepping forward, which started to break the illusion or place they were in. The light that the son envisioned within his mind was all a ploy after all, and what was behind the curtains was his domain. The volcano of mortis that was steep in dark side energies. I don't understand. How could you listen to the will of the Force, for it is the very thing that guides you. It should call to you and tell you of your destiny. The sun said, My destiny and fate is my own, and so should the destinies and fates of others be their own to make as well. Anakin said, You are wrong. You are most definitely the red herring, and are most definitely the antithesis of the chosen one. The sun was now more confident in himself and stepped forward himself, further closing the distance between himself and Anakin. You are not balanced. You have only brought disorder to the galaxy. Have I? I believe and have actually seen the changes I have brought. While not all to my liking, it is still then more than enough for myself and others. Anakin replied while turning this mindscape into his own control, allowing him to show the Emperor into the sun. That is wrong. You are wrong. The sun pointed to Anakin, for this was not the plan, and was not exactly of what was foretold. I guess I am, aren't I? Anakin just smiled at a disarming smile. But he was kicked out of the mindscape of the suns, and instead found himself back on Jabitha. There was some silence within his room, as he could very faintly hear some argumentative noise outside of his room, due to his enhanced senses, and due to the girls probably playing some game where they fighting with each other. Well, that went better than I thought. Anakin of course didn't actually think this but knew that what he had done was provoke the living embodiment of the dark side, meaning that he could very well try and breach Jabitha's barrier. Not that he could, but he would certainly try and kidnap someone like he had originally. He may do so because things were not going to his plan. Or it may be that he was becoming insecure in knowing that Anakin would not become Darth Vader. Not knowing that Anakin had become an embodied Darth Vader to some sense. I wonder what will happen next arc. A sound of pain was heard from outside, as someone had just tried to breach the barrier set up around Jabitha. This alerted everyone to someone's presence, which was in fact the sun. In actuality the sun would have been able to get in if Anakin wasn't here, and the only reason he had not made it in was because Anakin had reinforced Jabitha's shielding. Of course if the girls knew he was coming, then they could have come together with Jabitha to enhance the shields as well. Who is it? Isla called out as she went forwards, identifying that it was indeed the sun. What do you want? She called out, not afraid to face off against something or someone that was possibly stronger than herself. The sun didn't say anything in reply, and instead started to attack the force field surrounding Jabitha. But it was useless, for his use of force lightning was unable to break down the barrier. Anakin had already exited the ship and was already making his way over to the sun, while having a calm look on his face. Hey! The force lightning stopped as the sun realized that the person he was after was right in front of him. Chosen one, you have come. The sun said seeing Anakin, and he had even stepped outside of the barrier. Arnie, what is going on? Through the speaker, Isla was able to get this out. But Anakin didn't verbally reply, but instead sent a message through the diet he shared with each of them. Anakin told to stay within for now and go back to doing what they were for he has everything under control, and instead he walked forward towards the sun. I am out. Now what do you want me for? Anakin waited for a response. Oh, you wish to question me? Then you must first catch me first. The sun transformed and instead headed towards another direction, away from everyone leaving Anakin to try and catch up to him. Anakin didn't go after him, knowing that he wanted to follow him. Instead he had other ideas, ideas in particular, that would be getting to go towards the monastery again. For Anakin wanted to hear more conversation between all of the mortis gods. You are growing stronger, my son, the father said. Am I father? The son replied. Vanity, however, is getting the better of you. The father responded. How so? The son questioned. You have done what is forbidden. The daughter got up, planning to follow along where the father and the son were going to walk as they do. You have chosen the dark side, and allowed it to feed your anger and your desire for power. By bringing the chosen one here, you have shown me my potential. You've only yourself to blame. The son exclaimed. Do not do this, son. Do not become what you should not. Be strong, I implore you, or else I will be forced to contain you. The father explained. You look frail father, the son said. I am not dead yet. The father replied, thinking that it was strange for his son to say that, but didn't otherwise say anything else. Well perhaps I am tired of waiting. The son then from behind the father, attacked him using red force lightning, making the father become harmed. I hate you. The son seemed to have fully lost himself within the dark side, not having any control whatsoever. 
Anakin was a witness to such an event as the sun then transformed and flew off, leaving Anakin to move forwards. Father, the daughter came rushing out of the monastery. Well things seemed to be going in a similar fashion. Anakin thought to himself as he helped the daughter bring the father inside to heal him. Sometime later, we rejoin Anakin, the daughter and the father as they are. The father is unconscious while the daughter was trying to help the father as he needed rest while Anakin was just sitting there watching. He could probably help as well. But he didn't exactly want to help yet, for that isn't how the Force wants it, of course. He would be going against the Force soon enough by changing the events. But so far nothing too much has changed, and everything is going according to plan. So Anakin began, seeing that the daughter would not start any conversation. My father needs some rest. The daughter said out of nowhere. Sure, whatever you say. Anakin didn't care too much. But he knew that whatever happens here come act as some form of symbolism for what he would be doing. Originally, by having all three of the Mortis Gods die, Anakin would see that this was what he would do to the galaxy. The daughter, representative of the Force shall die first, meaning the Jedi shall die. Then the father shall harm himself to then kill the son, whom is the representative of the dark side, meaning that the Sith shall comes to an end after the Jedi. At least that was how it originally went, but with what Anakin was doing, those things would probably not happen. How can you be so irritating? The daughter all of a sudden said, What? Anakin was confused. You. You are in my thoughts all of the time. This is as unlike me, the daughter said. What do you mean? Anakin was getting a little freaked out here, for this wasn't supposed to be in the script. He most certainly didn't foresee this coming his way. The infatuation of the daughter was most certainly not what he was expecting. The daughter got up and started to walk away, probably signifying that Anakin follow along. You see, I am the ultimate representation of the light side of the Force. My brother is the representation of the dark side of the Force. I am selflessness, while he is selfishness. But, but, of course Anakin would follow along, for he is interested. The daughter turned to him and came incredibly close. I am interested in you much more than what I should be. I, I even allowed you to touch me. She seemed to get a blush on her face as she said this. Hey, I didn't think that this would be my fault. Anakin really had no idea as to what was going on. He didn't even form a diet with her yet, so he didn't think they had any proper compatibility or anything like that. Also, please calm down. Don't you think we should take care of your brother first? Something strange would be happening, and it would happen once the sun dies. But that should come at a later time for now. The daughter is exploring her new feelings. I, I apologize. I know that this isn't what I'm supposed to be like but I can't stop these feelings. I wish to know what they mean. The daughter said as she was right next to Anakin, practically ready to pounce on him. Calm down, calm down. Let's deal with the sun first. Please Anakin had to take a few steps back as she did come uncomfortable close. Right please, follow me. I know of what could help. The daughter started to lead Anakin in another direction, and he was hoping that it wasn't her bedroom, for if it was then he may very well have to run. Come with me, please. The daughter then gestured for Anakin to follow along. At another place on Mortis, Anakin and the daughter find themselves entering a cave, dark and deep and surprisingly moderate in temperature. Within this cave, there was a ledge that allowed Anakin to view everything below. Below being an object that seemed to be housing something while being surrounded by some blue-green fire. The entire cavern was quite large, and also clear enough for Anakin to see pretty far down. But there was a problem so to speak, where the place was covered in a fog. Or at least lower than the object they are here for is covered by a blue-green fog, meaning that Anakin doesn't know what is further down if one is to fall. Walking down the steps, Anakin couldn't help but continue questioning the daughter. So you have an interest in me? Yes. The daughter responded matter-of-fact with no hesitation about what she feels. Do you mind telling me what this feels like? Anakin asked. I can do you one better. I could send you my emotions and allow myself to be open. For this is probably the best way to display my emotions. The daughter replied. Isn't that a bit intimate of an action? While sensing emotions wasn't considered intimate, the very act of opening oneself up to another in that way could be considered intimate. Of course it isn't on the level of being lovers or anything like that, since it could be done with family as well. But in general, one would not do so with complete strangers or even friends. It isn't exactly something public, but instead should be considered private, especially in the way the daughter wanted to do so with him. I am aware. The daughter glanced his way, but seemed hesitant to continue looking at him. Whether that be his physical form or even to just talk and look into his eyes, which caused her and her feelings to fluctuate. But I have a feeling if I do not open up, then I would regret not finding out what this means. She really was trying hard to avoid eye contact. Okay then. Anakin extended himself and allowed himself to be immersed in her feelings, while they came down the steps and stopped. Do you feel it? The daughter asked. Yes. Anakin's brows were furrowed as he was a bit confused as to what this emotion was. It wasn't something that could easily be defined, and it felt similar to what Anakin would only identify as romantic or physical attraction. You. He didn't know what to tell her. Yes. What is it? She got very close to him again, and was very close to his face, given that she was taller than him as well. She looking down on him, not in a negative way, but because she was taller it was only natural. She wasn't too much taller, but enough to where she would have to look down, and for Anakin to look up. I don't know what to tell you. 
You may not like what I suggest. Anakin replied and would have taken a step back, but he would then fall down. I would like to know. The daughter said, disregarding Anakin's warning. All right, but I think that it would be better if I opened up a little myself, so you can compare the feelings. Is that all right with you? Anakin was planning to prove it much better, so she wouldn't just outright deny the feelings, and instead would offer up his own experiences, so she could compare the two. E that sighing, the daughter then continues. Okay, I will do as you say. After a short while, the daughter comes to after Anakin had sent through between each other, like it was some sort of internet connection, that allowed them to pass messages and send files. In a way, that is what the Force is capable of doing. E, but this would suggest the daughter didn't seem to want to agree with the findings. But the truth and proof was all offered up to her. Something that she would have never thought possible, and neither would her father or brother would think possible as well. Yes. Anakin nodded. Getting over this subject for now, the daughter then looks down towards the object contained within some sort of device. I can go no further. When you reach the altar, it will give you what you need. What is done there? Anakin wasn't about to start pushing the previous topic with her, and instead was much more interested in the artifact below. He who wields the blade will be able to control my brother, the daughter said, which then prompted Anakin to start jumping towards the altar. The Altar of Mortis, an altar located in a cave on the ethereal planet Mortis in Wild Space. It held the Dagger of Mortis. It was located in a deep cave at the bottom of a staircase, and it was surrounded by a green aura of fire, which one had to cross in order to retrieve the mystical weapon. It was designed so that certain members of the family of Force Wielders resident on the planet called the Overlords or the Ones could not retrieve the dagger. The altar opened before Anakin as he got closer and it started to shift transform into another object that would allow Anakin to extract the blade held within. Touching the handle and bringing it out, the hilt of the dagger, in a weird manner, starts to exude a weird show of mist as a blade starts to form. It was not too dislike what a lightsaber would be like, and instead of the whole flashy lightsaber show of energy, this thing was more like magic. More like an actual magical artifact rather than anything with real science behind it. If Anakin could put a word to it, it looked more like a short sword rather than a dagger but it could still be classified as such. The Dagger of Mortis, simply referred to as the Mortis Dagger, was a mystical weapon that resided on the altar of the wild space world of Mortis. The weapon was kept hidden on the realm of Mortis by the father, who kept it as a means that could control his children, the daughter and the son. The weapon was capable of controlling the sibling pair of powerful force wielders, and it was also capable of killing them if necessary. When used on the father, however, his death at the hands of the dagger would rob his children of their immortality. That is right. The force wielder's immortality isn't exactly a result of them being living embodiments of the force, nor is it the result of their species, but the result of the force and the father allowing his children to keep their youth. For they did not have true immortality, as once the father died, they would no longer be able to live forever. This can be used on the son, but it could also be used on yourself. Why did you trust in me that I would not abuse this weapon? Anakin asked the daughter as she was above him, still on the steps watching him now with dagger in hand. I trust in the bond we now share. The daughter replied, something that Anakin wasn't really expecting a straight answer on. Bond. I am unaware of what bond you speak of. Anakin has had his fair share of knowing when special bonds between himself and others form, specifically dire bonds. But he had felt no such thing, and the daughter has seemingly identified something like that between the two. I see it now. The reason for you being here and the reason for my change. You may not realize it yet, but we are bonded. If not now, then in the future. The daughter spoke as if she was some sort of prophet. Anakin didn't want to argue anymore, and instead would like to go towards the sun right now. So he flew over to where the daughter was. Let's go then. He questioned unsure of where she suddenly got the confidence to be so close to him. Yes. Let's. She didn't mind touching him now. It would seem as she would constantly take many chances upon chances to try and arouse him. In what way one might ask. Even he didn't know what she was doing, for she was extremely awkward. How am I going to explain this? Anakin thought to himself as no doubt the girls would be suspicious. It was his idea to come here after all, and because of this he would be blamed for whatever happens next. Sister what a pleasant surprise. The son spoke as the daughter, and Anakin didn't exactly make themselves known, but didn't hide as well as they entered. And you brought a friend. The son turned around from his own place, that held a throne of its own. They were within the sun's cathedral. The cathedral was created by the sun as his personal fortress and residence. Made of a light absorbing black rock, the base of the tower was circular and resembled the rib cage of a giant beast. The summit of the tower was crowned by a glowing green orb, while inside, cells and obliates were located at the end of maze-like hallways. Smaller towers were located around the central tower of the cathedral with a courtyard connecting them all. The son maintained a throne room at the midway point of the central tower. What have you done, brother? The daughter asked, given that nothing had really happened. But at the same time, he had the audacity to go after Anakin. If Anakin was not on the ship at the time, the son would have easily breached through Jabitha and taken one of the girls. Most probably Padme or Xana, given it was these two that were the most allured to the dark side. Of course, there was always the possibility that he would have tried to take someone else as well. Since all of them had the seeds of the dark side within them, Anakin hadn't held back his teachings for them simply because they were once Jedi, and had instead allowed them to choose. It was not something he could decide on even as Ahsoka's master, he would be unable to choose what she wanted for herself. It was not his decision, just as it wasn't there for what he wants as well. Done. I have done what is right. 
Or what is wrong, depending on your point of view. The son said, our father is dying. Did you do it? The daughter was outraged for she loved her father, just as she may also be loath to admit it. But she also held familial love for her brother as well. He is just so selfish. Annan was taking too long to die. So, I decided to move things along. The son said before continuing while seated on this throne. Now, why are you here? I won't let you leave this planet. The daughter seemed to think that she would be keeping the son here. You are not strong enough to keep me here. The son said, fully aware that his powers were growing because of the conflict here. Well, if I may. And I can ask, not really caring for permission, but did so anyway because why not? Yes. And what does the Chosen One have to say? Are you going to try and keep me here as well? Along with my sister, the son wanted to antagonize Anakin, but he had no leverage over him, so he would resort to underhanded tactics, which would include verbal abuse. Not that powerful to those with the ability to ignore harmful words, but for those that were sensitive, it could work. I don't really have anything to say in particular. Just that I think it wasn't cool that you did that to your father is all Anakin also wanted to play some mind games with the being, given that he was trying that on him. I knew you were not the chosen one, the son said aloud. What do you mean? The daughter was curious as well? Since she hadn't actually heard why he doesn't think of Anakin as the chosen one, he is a fake. It doesn't matter if I explain myself now. Since I can sense the changes in you sister, you would never believe me, and neither would father. The son said before continuing, he is already balanced within the force. This is not how it was supposed to be, and he is already destroying everything else as well. He is not the chosen one. He is the opposite. The son finished. And what would that be? Anakin was curious. There was some silence for a bit as the son looked at Anakin. You are a pariah. A fake? Calm down. No need to be so angry. It is only not a game. Anakin said in a voice that mocked the sun, enough. The sun gestured with his hand taking the daughter off guard as she was lifted off of the ground and thrown into the air, while Anakin was completely fine. He decided that he would capture her within his arms. The windows broke down behind the sun as one could see into the courtyard below. He thank you. The daughter had a small smile on her features, while also having a blush as well. I think that you should be more on guard next time. Anakin put her down, not feeling the weight of her body at all. She didn't even exclaim and tell him off for touching her this time, meaning that something was definitely up. Please brother, calm down, and don't let the dark side consume you. Remember what Farth dash the daughter was interrupted rudely by the sun. Shut up. Another wave of the force was sent out, and this time the daughter was ready. But she did have a thought at the back of her mind to fake being unprepared yet again, just to have Anakin pull her into his arms again. I will not hear any of it. You my sister are not the same. And you. The son gestured towards Anakin trying to pull him in. You shall be killed, for you are not the chosen one, and are nothing but a pariah. You also mustn't touch my sister. It is forbidden. What are you more considered about? My status as the chosen one, or your sister being touched by me? Anakin questioned the bald man with glowing red eyes completely covered in black clothing. Be quiet. For your insolence, you must be killed. The son said trying but failing to utilize the force to entrap and then throw Anakin through the windows behind him. You wish to fight me? Anakin said as he allowed the son to then pull him and chuck him outside. I will be waiting out here then. He said this just as he had left through the windows and landed safely in the courtyard. What is going on here? The father entered the room as soon as Anakin had gone out the window. The son and daughter were not doing anything but had already gone in at each other because Anakin had flown out the window. The daughter believing that it was her turn to contribute engaged her brother in a fight that lasted a few seconds. Stop this. The father called out, watching his children fight against each other, one using red force lighting, while it was being absorbed by the other through the use of a small energy field concentrated in her hands. The father then made a gesture that easily flung both the daughter and the son out of the windows where Anakin had gone outside. Anakin outside would have dodged these two, but he instead decided that he would once again rescue his ally, the daughter, by once again getting her into his arms. Of course, he put her down after, given that he needs to have some maneuverability for what is going to happen next. E thank you, once again the daughter said while the son clicked his tongue at the display. The father descended upon the small group of three, Anakin, the daughter and the son with his own wings. Where he was hiding them, Anakin would probably never know. So glad of you to make it to a little party father. The son exclaimed getting up from having fallen down, and then started to blast the father with some red lightning. The father would block this blow by utilizing the same technique that the daughter had used. But, you will stop this. The father commanded as he seemed tired. You are too weak for me old man. The son then started to use his other hand as if to back up his statement as some form of truth. You don't mean nothing to me anymore. Of course this statement isn't true, and it was just that the sun was too far gone at this point, having gone to such extremes that there was probably no turning back. So powerful was the sun that he had finally overpowered his father and pushed him back, fully taking the wind out of the father's sails. The sun was about to continue moving forward to continue torturing his father. That was until he was stopped by Anakin. How about you stop right there? While Anakin may not hold anyone here in too high regard, given that they were all isolationists, even the daughter whom had taken a liking to him was not off of his disregard. Oh, and how will you stop me? 
The son was starting to get puffed up on his power, which lead to some degree of arrogance. What about this? Anakin showed the dagger within his hand, fully intending to start using it when he wanted to. So you have brought the dagger to me, the chosen one and the dagger all in one place. This makes it all the more easier for me. The son didn't seem to take Anakin's threat seriously, considering Anakin hadn't shown any of his true power yet, or at least didn't show it in full, and the son was becoming more and more powerful as time passed, it only made sense that he would be so blindsided. Everything is going exactly as I have planned, the son said, while Anakin thought that he didn't actually plan this out, but who knows. You showed them the altar. The father got up from his fall and exclaimed, seeing that Anakin had his hands of the dagger of Mortis. I am sorry father. The chosen one, along with the dagger, would be able to dash the daughter was interrupted however, as the father seemed angry. No, he is not ready the father coughed here, but not blood as it seemed like these didn't exactly have proper physical beings. Despite the amount of physical sensations that Anakin was able to feel from the daughter, join me. The son gestured towards Anakin. Join me, and we shall bring balance to the universe. Is that not what you want? I thought you wanted me dead. Anakin was quick to notice the son's change in attitude. Once he had shown the dagger, and knew that without a moment's hesitation, that he would probably try and strike him down if he could. That is in the past now. I now see that for you to make it this far must mean you are the chosen one. It was all a test. A test that I had set up with the very purpose of wanting to make sure that you are the chosen one. The son explained himself. Don't listen to him. The daughter said as Anakin was in fact hearing the son, but wasn't really listening, as that would imply he was taking head to what was being said. Don't interfere with our business sister. I have my plans for you yet. The son told his sister to back off while turning his attention back towards Anakin. What say you? My friend, I am afraid that I cannot accept your offer for this something better that I could do. Anakin in a symbolic gesture started to do something strange. I did notice that there was a connection between the three of you that linked back up with your father. So, all I would need to do is either kill you, kill your father and then kill you, or I could become the new owner of this dagger here, and the new overlord over the both of you. You wouldn't. The son seemed to not want to come under the control of another. The reason I have come here is not to deal with or mess around with some family squabbling, and I most certainly didn't want to get involved as well. I am no the chosen one you are all seeking, for I am much more than that. Anakin started to generate and unleash his own energy field that was a part of himself. Kept him bundled up for the longest time now. But since this place was a magnet and amplifier of the force, he was going to use it to his advantage. Lightning started to sparkle off of Anakin, and the night and day cycle of the planet was starting to become screwy once again, because Anakin had gotten involved. What what is this? The father was starting to feel that things were going out of his control. Control. You, the son was enraged once again that Anakin would go against whatever he had in mind, and instead would do something on epic proportions like this. What are you doing? The daughter was the one most concerned with what Anakin was doing, for she now had a vested interest in Anakin. I ain't doing anything in particular, Anakin answered as his voice was layered with the voices of many, just as the family here was. I just wanted to make a show to the force that I am the captain now. What are you talking about? What you are doing is as something disastrous to the balance. The father called out having still not gotten over the damage done to him by his son. When I made that small vow all those years ago I had said that I was the force, and that the force is me, Anakin said as he started to float with dagger in hand. What I meant by those words all along was not that I would give myself to the force to become an embodiment of its will. No, what I truly meant was that I would become the force not the other way around, and then I would become the will of the force, not the other way around. When I said I am much more than what the chosen one is or was, I meant it. I am not simply something that can be comprehended through the use of the force normally, for I may be a child born purely of the force, but I am not something that is to be controlled, not to be willed and directed in a certain direction. Flowing through all, there is balance. There is no peace without a passion to create. There is no passion without peace to guide. Knowledge fades without the strength to act. Power blinds without the serenity to see. There is freedom in life. There is purpose in death. The force is all things and I am the force. Many voices overlap with each other, which were in fact the voices of those that were deceased and had gone into Anakin's nascent realm of the dead. His nascent realm of heaven for all that he deemed worthy to live in may stay within and live out the rest of eternity if they wanted the spirits that may watch down upon those of their descendants. Of course they were mostly old people that had reached the end of their ropes, but there were also those unfortunate enough to come across something, an accident or disease that the super serum would be unable to handle. This is wrong. This is all wrong. The father seemed distraught as the planet itself was starting to lose color, for it was turning a bleached white. There was no green representing life, nor the color of the night, black representing death and destruction, and all that was left in Anakin's wake was a planet that wasn't dead, but wasn't alive as well. I am the freer of people. Anakin's voice echoed like a god as what he had done was sever the connection of this planet, and make it a wound in the force, specifically a wound in the normal force, but his energy was still able to access the lands here. I have destroyed your grand prison here, as it shall be no more. Anakin looked around at the white grass, white lands, white trees and grey bark of the trees. There was nothing left to indicate anything, and even the volcano itself seemed as if it was frozen in time. Everything was a white color, in stark contrast to Anakin, who seemed to be an amalgamation of color, ranging from all colors of the rainbow, and even then some, which they would be unable to even visualize. Unfortunately, the greatest prison for you, the sun is life itself. 
What do you mean? The son was in utter chaos, having lost connection to the force with which had empowered him. And you, the father, you are old and dying, with no telling how long you have left to live. Do you wish to stay here and wither away with the place you have come to make your home? Or do you wish to escape this place and see the galaxy one last time? Aye aye. The father had no words at the display of power, while Anakin turned to the daughter. You are the last. Arguably you are also the most intriguing, for I know of how to make you in balance. You have already exhibited signs that your time is near. So Dash Anakin was going to say something more, only to be interrupted by the son. No, I have had enough of this. I will kill you and end this farce once and for all. The son had no power, but he would still try and attack Anakin with all he had, whether that be his fists or his own access to his innate abilities. For while the force is gone, taken from the planet, that didn't mean it doesn't still exist within the son, the daughter or the father. They still had midi-chlorians, or at least one would assume they did. That is a bad idea. Anakin didn't do anything except defend himself as the son lunged at him, intending to try and kill him. The killing intent was clear within his eyes, and without hesitation Anakin struck him down, piercing the son's heart, ending him right then and there. I dash gasping the sun reached out only to fail as he started to feel weak. I Anakin let him go and let him fall, safely as he wasn't about to disrespect the other two, as the sun is their family after all. Brother, son. The two called out as they moved over to the sun, for Anakin had done what was to be done. The father as he arrived coughed, knowing that his time was near, especially now that his lifeline was cut. The force no longer being present started to take a toll on his body. WH what did you do the daughter had tears in her eyes, for she was conflicted. Her family was dying. No, they were all but dead in this state. Gasping and on their last legs, with Anakin floating above them all in a position that was quite high and mighty. Anakin descended and didn't care for the woman's tears, as he knew he needed to do something like this to accomplish setting a tone. Specifically, he was creating a ripple that would forcibly remove the force from the equation of what will happen to the father, the son and to the daughter. The father and the son would still die. It would seem, but Anakin wasn't about to just allow things to go out of balance, because he was being rebellious. Come. The daughter obliged Anakin's command with small tears in her eyes, and he looked into her for a second, trying to see why C had said that they would be bonded, knowing that this was a possible outcome. But she still insisted that they were bound. Tell me, why are we to be bound? He asked her, distracting her from the death of her family members. I, I saw that we. The daughter had seen something. But Anakin didn't want to pry no more, since she was unwilling to say anything. This place will not disappear until every living being leaves. Anakin stated looking out towards the distance, with everything having come to a standstill. That includes you. I must restore the balance now. And you are going to help me do so. What do you mean? She should hate him. But that was not within her nature, especially since she had become infatuated with him. Still clinging on to the hope that Anakin was somehow going to share in her pain. And suffered just as much as her in this moment. What a twisted form of love. Anakin brought her over to the sun, and started to touch both the sun's forehead and the daughter's. He started to bring out the special energies that made the sun a part of the dark side. And using himself, he also brought out the daughter's powers. Which he then created a link and formed something akin to balance. This would be symbolic of Anakin taking the Jedi, the light side, and then extracting the dark side, then forming anew these two things into something new. The Sith would still die, but the Jedi would live on through Anakin and his teaching them balance. Again, another reason why Anakin wanted to come here, for it would alter the course of history. A light started to be emitted from the daughter as Anakin passed back the powers of herself and her brother into herself, making her completely and well balanced within the Force, but by doing this, Anakin had also inadvertently created a dyad between the two. The Force was still messing with him, and it was like he would always have a small connection to the Force, no matter how small. Another symbolic gesture. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.